Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is day three of the ICSA College Sailing Team Race National Championship. I'm Gloria Kevlicu, and I'm joined by Jack Parkin and Dave Perry. Men, do you guys want to say something? Well, first of all, I'm sitting in for Pearson Potts. I forgot my bow tie today. Um, and I think he used up all the one-liners in the universe. So I'm just happy to be here. Uh, I'm a proud bulldog uh, from way back when, and I'm happy to see College Sailing is alive and well, and I'm happy to be in the booth with Gloria and, of course, my buddy Jack Parkin, who I've watched come up through the years and uh, enjoy him tremendously as a sailor, and now today as a commentator. Yeah, welcome to day three of team racing. Uh, I was gladly invited back, so I did, I guess, all right yesterday. But uh, we've got a great day here today, a different direction, but uh, some awesome racing has already occurred. But uh, we're going to get you up to speed with uh, the Zim Pre Show uh, coming up. So uh, here we go. Welcome to the Zim Pre Race Show. Yeah, so we saw some pretty tight racing yesterday. Um, Stanford had finished the day with a undefeated with their all-women's team. Uh, the breeze has definitely picked up today, but we're seeing that some... Uh, it was really tight racing yesterday, and we even had a sail-off to end the day, uh, which s just pinched the Seahawks into the top eight. Yeah, that's right. Your alma mater making it through into the top eight. Um, great for them. It was certainly a very long day of racing. You know, wind delay, racing really kicked off about 12.30, 1 o'clock. Um, but yeah, on the screen here, you guys can see the results. Um, so this is the standings as of the end of yesterday. Stanford undefeated with 15 wins every race in the round robin. And uh, followed by Harvard, you know, 13-2. and two. So right on the tail there, and of course tied with Yale. So top three coming out of yesterday, Stanford, Harvard, Yale. Yeah, Roger Williams closely behind with an 11-4 record. This is definitely one of those teams that we consistently see in the top four. Uh, we'll see how they hold out today in this breeze. But Dartmouth doing a great job with a 10-5 record after yesterday um, and a day yesterday, rather. Brown also 10-5 record. They're holding on there. And Coast Guard and St. Mary's, uh, you, you see a little bit of a flopped record. Coast Guard, eight wins, seven losses. St. Mary's, seven wins, eight losses. Uh, Coast Guard has... It's definitely been one of those underdog teams that we didn't suspect to see in the top eight, but they certainly did a great job of making there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as I noted, these are the results as of the end of yesterday. So racing has been underway here today. But, uh, you know, one thing I think would be great uh, is, you know, talking to you about your alma mater. Yeah, so the Seahawks had uh, had to sail two races in a sail-off between Penn and... Um, and Navy, it was Penn and Navy. Uh, it's been a lot of races, pardon me. But between Penn and Navy, Seahawks won both of those races. And their last race between the Quakers was certainly tight. Had us at the edge of our seats. Like, it was certainly a nail-biter. And uh, I had a great opportunity to, to interview one of their freshmen, Felix Cutler. I'm pretty elated. Um, very, very happy for our team. I think it was very well put together and the boys and the crews and everybody on the team was a were able to get it together and under pressure, a lot of pressure. Um, I had a very uh, hectic Mark three, but we were able to convert and I think we went one, two. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, to our other teammates, I think we were all able to work together and I think that's something that we've been really working on this this whole season is is kind of staying in the mental state. Okay, we're always we're always going for it. We always nonstop, never get give up um, and I think that's something that has helped us especially in this race I'm feeling great actually um, it's it's awesome to be sailing against the other top sailors I mean whether you lose or win you're learning no matter what and I think that's the most important part especially as a first year um, we only have so long in college and uh, I'm trying to learn as much as I can um, and beat who we can and, and we, we earn what we earn is what we get so yeah that was really well said by Felix I mean at the end of the day win or loss the teams that are able to take those races and learn from them are the teams that end up uh, climbing their way to the top. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure Dave knows about some long days on the water, right? Well, yesterday was uh, more of a typical one on a sound day. It light and got lighter and 
Boy, I tell you, I always say it's harder to race when it's light wind, you know, because you have all the emotions and all the physical drain of just sitting out there. But uh, today's a whole new day. It's windy, and uh, it'll be fun to see everybody stretch their legs and go fast. Yeah, and here's a uh, replay of that race between the Quakers and Penn, or I'm sorry, Quakers and St. Mary's. It was definitely going back and forth if you guys were able to watch it, but it started off with the Penn, Penn Quakers. They were leading the race and then St. Mary's was able to clinch it back and I'll tell you what there was a lot of red flags by umpires lots of spinning going on in this race and they certainly kept it tight you see massive ducks hands being raised by boat 15 there I was lucky to get this on the water shot and uh, be able to watch it up close but Jack what were some things you were seeing in that race as well yeah I think one common theme throughout the whole regatta but especially in this race was the number of upwind dial downs where mm. that starboard boat is just points their boat at the poor opposition and uh, makes them react on the spot. And on, I think in this race, that was the, the winning move, second half of the upwind. You can see that the St. Mary's team's pretty elated there. Yeah, congratulations to them on making it to the top eight, and uh, we'll see how they do from here. Well, today's a whole new day. We have the uh, eight top teams, and we caught up with Kyle Assad this morning. He's the PRO to tell us what the format is and what the conditions are for today. All right, well, we're here with Kyle Assad. He's the PRO for the Team Racing Championship here. And uh, Kyle, what's it look like today? Conditions and what's the format? Yeah, format today will be a round robin of the uh, top eight teams from the round of 16. And then following the round robin of eight, we'll enter into a round robin of four to determine the national champion. Uh, forecast today, you can kind of see on the water, we got sheep in the field. So we're anticipating 12 plus uh, currently out of the north, trending west throughout the day. So um, from a PRO perspective, going to be a bit tricky as we continue to shift the full digital end left. Um, but we've had a really great team of midshipmen and uh, professionals. So I feel like, you know, we're going to be able to easily adjust as the breeze shifts. Great. So the round of eight, how long do you think that'll take to complete that round? Yeah, it's about 28 races, I believe. So um, we're looking at uh, probably two to three hours of racing, uh, you know, 10 races an hour thereabouts. Um, and we're going to be really spot on with our timing, 10 minutes a race, three minutes a start. So adds up pretty quick. And uh, goal is to get that done by around 12, 31 o'clock and go into a round of four, which is pretty quick. All things eight races and we'll determine our national champion. All right, well, good luck out there. Thank you, Dave. Looking forward to it. Yeah, we're extremely lucky to have Kyle Assad here. Now, don't be mistaken, I think there was some uh, misleading there yesterday. That is not Justin Assad, head coach of Dartmouth Sailing. That is his brother, Kyle Assad, who is our lovely PRO. We are so lucky to have him. Um, Jack, do you want to talk a little bit more about the formatting of the top eight and final four and sure. what that means for scores? Yeah, so... As of the moment, we are about halfway through the top eight. And what basically happens is, you know, the top eight teams from the first round robin uh, move on to this round. And all the scores from the first round robin carry over. And you might be asking, you know, what are they keeping track of? What exactly are the important scores here? And you can think about it as the number of wins, which is important. So, for example, Stanford went undefeated in the first round robin. They beat every other team, so they racked up 15 wins. So they went on with a record of 15 and 0. And as they go on to the next round, so in the round of 8, each of the teams will sail 7 races. So there are 7 more points up to grab. The final stage of the system is to basically move on to the round of four. So the top four teams from the round of eight will move on and all the scores will continue to carry on. So you keep adding up the wins from the previous two days and the previous morning of sailing. And at the end is the person with the most wins who wins the regatta. Right. And so that kind of means that the final four is not necessarily, you know, a fight to the death or a what is it, knives and shields, as Pearson <laughs> would say. But um, essentially, there is an, an opportunity, there is a slight chance that uh, a, compo a competitor will go into the final four, depending on how they do in these next few races, may already knowing that they are going to win this national championship. So that does make uh, things a little bit spicy, and we'll see how that goes. But, you know, taking a look at some of these morning races, it surely has been, uh, you know, a total whirlwind. It's been a total toss-up. This breeze has kind of thrown some teams off, and so we've been seeing the standings mix around quite a bit. And, you know, the other thing that 
that it is, is it's the top eight teams, right? So the top eight teams in the nation, this is going to be a way harder race. Absolutely. And maybe, Dave, you can give us a touch of an update from the scores this morning if you have those uh, somewhere handy. Well, I tell you, um, Harvard's been doing great. Uh, they're on uh, three wins, and uh, they are closing in on Stanford. Stanford actually dropped a race uh, to Harvard, so uh, Harvard's within one point of uh, Stanford right now. Um, they're actually tied on wins. Uh, Yale uh, dropped a couple races this morning, so they're they're back about two races. So they're on 14 wins, and then it goes on from there. So obviously uh, Stanford and Harvard are the two to watch right now going into the afternoon, and we'll just uh, keep our fingers crossed that uh, the races stay close so we can come right down to the very last race, the game seven, if you will, of the championship. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, folks, is you know while we have the live coverage here looking out and we're going to have the best video, you guys want to defer to TechScore for the latest uh, results online um, as things evolve out here. Uh, as we said, we're about halfway through this round of eight, so lots of racing to go here. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been the Zim Pouye show. Uh, very happy to be with you all. Uh, any closing words as we get ramped up here? Yeah, uh, I'll be heading out on the water to get you that up and close and personal footage. So stay tuned and we'll be we'll take a quick break. Zim and West Coast Sailing are proud to support ICSA with the College Sailing Give Back program. When college programs make purchases through their Zim and West Coast Sailing team accounts, they not only get great equipment, great service, and great discounts, but also 5% of their purchase is donated back to ICSA. With the Zim and West Coast Sailing College Give Back program, your general fleet maintenance and sail purchases help with general maintenance of ICSA and provides direct support to the organization that makes it all happen and increases access to the water for all. And welcome back, everyone. So everyone has just rotated uh, boats. And one thing you guys will notice, compared to yesterday, there are a little bit of breaks in between each set here. You know, there are smaller amount of teams. Obviously, it's the top eight out there. But they are only sailing in three fleets of uh, 420s. Um, so one of the teams gets a buy between each of these uh, races. And uh, it means that we just have the opportunity to have a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a break between uh, some of these races. And uh, I might kick it over to Dave here to just maybe talk about the conditions. Dave, what are you seeing out there? Well, first of all, Long and Sound can give you everything. Um, and today we have a, a beautiful uh, easterly coming right down the Sound. It's very protected down here. So uh, the wind is ahead of the water, as our dear friend Buddy Melgus, may he rest in peace, used to say. So the boats will be, uh, you know, it's going to be a boat speed race. Uh, I see shifts on the water, which is great fun in team racing. So you have to really, you know, it's harder to balance pairs and there's more chance to pass. And I do some, see some waves, Jack. And uh, listen, you sail these boats more recently than I, ha I have. I know Uching's allowed in college. And um, tell me, how do these boats hop up? Can they plane or they just surf? Yeah, I think at the moment we're right at the crossover where you are, you know, planing consistently and... Uh, otherwise, you know, in displacement mode. But yeah, we got some waves coming in, coming all the way down the sound with the easterly here. And uh, these 420s, you can really, really work pretty hard as you're sailing around. You know, you'll see the helms and the, uh, and the crews really ooching together here, um, going upwind and downwind especially. So <coughs> it's gonna be a super physical day out there for sure. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how some of the teams decide to, mm. uh, you know, what kind of weight combinations they go for. Um, Dave, do you think it's you know full hiking conditions out there at the moment, or is it just lightened up a little bit? Well, from where we're sitting, I'd say it's full hiking, and uh, but of course it depends on who you put in the boat as the skipper and crew combination. Um, how how flexible are these teams? Do they have full you know, full light air crew, heavy air crew? Do they change the skippers in the breeze? How uh, how intricate does it get? Yeah, so, you know, I think it kind of depends on each team, but I know in these days of college sailing, each team comes very prepared. You know, they might bring, at a time, there's only six people sailing on each team. 
but uh, they might be double the amount of people for yeah. the relative combinations. So, you know, you might be slotting in some of the stronger crews in this uh, in this weather who are able to, you know, hike a little bit longer and uh, might be able to keep the boat just a little bit flatter. So I'm sure, that, you know, the coaches and the uh, different members of the team are discussing that um, kind of as the days unfolded here. I imagine that most of the teams have opted for some of their bigger crews and skippers. Maybe not the uh, the biggest combination they can go for, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard. Uh, maybe we can uh, talk in with some of the players a little bit later to see uh, how they're thinking about the wind. Uh, one final question on that, Jack. When you were skippering, did you make the call, hey, I want my heavier crew or lighter crew, or did your coach tell you, or was it a combination? Who who, who makes that call? I think it's a combination of all things, uh, actually, Dave. So I think it's coach, um, skipper, and, of course, the crew. I think, you know, it's it's really a good sign and a show of, like, knowledge when you might have, like, a light air crew who specializes in the lighter air actually, like, put their hand up and say, hey, I think it's time to uh, transition because it gives, you know, everyone another chance to, uh, everyone on the team a chance to sail. And that's one thing about this, uh, this regatta so far and the women's regatta is each of these teams have been through uh, all the combinations of different, uh, you know, crews and different weight aspects. But, uh, Quickly tuning into the racing here. Yeah, it looks yeah. like we have uh, St. Mary's in uh, one, two, three, boat number one, two, three in uh, in black, and then Harvard in 16, 17, 18 in, uh, in gray. And uh, looks like uh, things are just getting settled here, but uh, I, hard to call who has an edge at the moment. Well, listen, while they're going upwind, uh, I'd like just to read you the names of the sailors on the team. We don't know exactly who's in the boat right now, who's driving and crewing, but sailing for Harvard, we got Lachlan McGranahan, Justin Callahan, Mitchell Callahan, Christopher Wang, Kennedy Lahili, Marbella Marlowe, and there may be others. And for St. Mary's, uh, we've got uh, Leo Boucher, uh, Felix Cutler, Owen Hennessy, uh, Ellie Sikowski, Madison Bashaw, and Sam Muir. And of course, I like to use the names. Apologize if I don't get it quite right. Yeah, so just looking off the start here, I have to say, little edge to St. Mary's on this right half here, but uh, it looks like Yale is winning the pair on the left. And that that's, would be Harvard. That's Yeah, oh, that's Harvard, yeah, sorry, <laughs> apologies. There uh, is a difference. Yeah, getting a little confused here. But uh, that's one thing we're going to be talking about all day is looking at these pairs, and you can kind of see it on your screen here. You know, there is a right pair which is just sailing off into like you know neverland over here and uh and then you can see the left pair and the middle pair so yeah. that's how we're going to be talking about things here yeah and just if it's easier to see the colors the uh the black sails numbers one two three that's uh, saint mary's and then the light blue colors the higher numbers 16 17 18 that's the uh crimson of harvard a little bit of cat and mouse happening on this side. Uh, I want to point out Boat 18 had a, a lovely dummy tack there and now has uh, gotten to the right of their opponent. Um, so as they come back together, let's see who owns the right. Well, I'm sure it's no different now, but uh, when we were sailing, the crew was so important. Uh, the skipper's really working on keeping the boat go fast. It's usually the crew with their head out of the boat Obviously looking for pressure, that's a big thing here. And then looking for nearby boats, uh, whether they're opponents or, or friendly or uh, what the combinations are. The crews are, I think in team racing, probably even more important than they are in fleet racing. Yeah, look at them working those shoulders. You can see that swell coming down and uh, looks like a one, two at the moment for Harvard. Um, let's see if they can solidify it, but uh, that's the initial call cool one, two on the halfway up the first upwind here. Well, that's never a good sight to look up and see the other team in one, two, but uh, it can happen. The three just has to be the hero, uh, create some sort of a high low on the first reach, try to distract the two, get the two to stay a longer distance to defend, then hopefully the four can get into the mix. So one, two at the top mark isn't as fatal as one, two around mark three. Would you agree with that, Jack? Absolutely. You know the chasing boats here and when i say chasing boats that's uh boat number three and two they have the opportunity to use their sails to cover their opponents on this downwind um to really try and catch up but uh once you kind of turn around that uh that mark four it gets real tricky to yeah. uh really catch up on the opponents but uh harvard looking fast here yeah no, they're jumping off to they're having a great day so far 
And uh, so that's uh, that's what they need. They need a good day, and they need Stanford to stumble just a little bit to make this thing exciting right to the end. Yeah, and one thing I want to point out there is those Harvard boats in the front actually rounded Mark 1, basically bowed astern with their opponents, but they really used mm. that top reach to look yeah. open up the lead, and now they're in a really comfortable position. I think a lot of sailors forget how important those small reaches are to really get the boat uh, up on the plane and take off, and I think... Harvard, you know, jumped out and given themselves a more comfortable lead here. So a little bit of pressure off. Agree or disagree, Jack? Boat speed wins races. I agree. I just have to say boat speed makes races easier. <laughs> um, it, it, you, it's easy to look smart when you're fast. <laughs> and uh, especially when it gets windier, you know, there's less boat on boat interaction. Um, so boat speed becomes even more important. And how is it? These are the t best sailors in the country. This is the national championship. How is it that some sailors are just make their boats go faster? The boats are all identical. They're beautiful uh, Zim boats, and, and uh, they're all, I'm sure, exactly the same equipment-wise. How do some sailors go faster? Yeah, I mean, I and think... And don't tell me that just because they're better. No, it's not just because they're better, actually. In, uh, in team racing, you're juggling a lot of things at once. You know, you're actively looking where your teammates are, where the op opponents are. And if you just have the ability to kind of forget about the other boats and really click into a fleet race mode, uh, there is a, a jump in speed. And it looks like, you know, Harvard just clicked into a bit of a fleet race mode um, at the end of the upwind and, uh, and, this, re and this downwind here. Um, meanwhile, you know, St. Mary's just might have been caught out there th thinking too hard about what their next strategy is and... All of these sailors, you know, they have fantastic speed um, when they're, when they're uh, fleet racing. It's all very equal. It's just being able to kind of switch that mindset um, and being able to focus on the small things. Nice. Well, we're watching uh, St. Mary's and uh, Harvard on the screen, but looking out, we see the next race has started. We've got the U.S. Coast Guard Academy uh, against... Um, uh, Yale, so two teams near each other uh, in proximity. Uh, sailing for the Coast Guard Academy, we've got Daniel Unang Un uh, Angst, uh, Coleman Schofield, Matthew Kickhoffer, Jack Farrell, Lauren O'Neill, and Charles Pohl. And perhaps there's others. Uh, we don't have a complete list, and uh, but that's who's on the list here. And sailing for Yale, uh, Jack Egan, Teddy Nicolosi, Stefan Baker, Catherine Webb, Anisha Arcott, and Meredith Ryan. Uh, out there hiking their brains out, trying to go fast. And it is to note that some of those uh, potential crews and helms have switched around, uh, yeah. but those are the individuals that were, for the most part, on the water yesterday. Um, and uh, turning back to this uh, Harvard race, you know, it, it looks like uh, Harvard's still in the 1 2 here. Um, this is just a matter of, you know, covering your pairs and, uh, you know, protecting the edges. You can see that uh, boat 18, both of those uh, skipper and crew really working the shoulders together. You can see as they go over the wave, shoulders go back and then back forwards, just giving a little boost to speed. So what do we got, Jack, for combinations? What's happening? I'm seeing a, uh, a one, two for Harvard, but they're both three is uh, just out of view here, but uh, they're sneaking up on, uh, on 16 here. So uh, maybe a little opportunity for St. Mary's, but uh, I'm sure that uh, boat 18, who's uh, leading here, is gonna come uh, help their teammates uh, in any way they need at the moment. But uh, I I'm still seeing the one, two for Harvard at the moment, and uh, they're kind of reaching the uh, top third of the second upwind. So getting into desperation mode for St. Mary's, yep. uh, not a lot left to go here. Now, if I understand the scoring correctly, uh, you win the race, you get one point. You lose the race, you get zero. Tiebreakers are based on head-to-head um, -head if you've sailed each other more than twice. So in when you get to the finals, you will have sailed each team three times. So if one team won twice, uh, they would break the tie. They, they don't count points. So winning one, two doesn't help until you get into the deeper tiebreakers. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's right, Dave. Um, it's it's really about winning those important races against those uh, opponents that are close to you in the standings. 
Um, so later on, uh, you know, two teams we've been talking about a lot is uh, Stanford or Harvard. Um, that's going to be an exciting race at the end of the round one. But uh, yeah, win, win goes to Harvard there. One, two, uh, one, two, five finish. Uh, they looked pretty strong all around the course there. Well, nice. Well, I'm sure Stanford's watching that uh, out of the corner of their eye. And um, it just keeps the pressure on, which is fun for us commentators. Absolutely. This is uh, These are the moments early kind of in the day. You, you just got to keep keep going and uh, making sure that you're looking after your body. You know, it is full hiking out there. And uh, I'm sure these teams are going to be coming in and fueling up. Um, that's a big part of the sport, uh, just as important as, uh, you know, executing because there's still a lot more racing to go today. And what's the uh, fuel of choice these days when you come in? Is it water? Is it Gatorade? Is it some secret concoction that every team has? I was a big fan of uh, Gatorade when it came to it, just to keep the electrolytes up. But uh, What color do you like? I, I wasn't too picky. I, I'm an orange guy, though. Yeah, me, yeah. Too, me too. Yeah, hey. yeah. It's like a little yeah. uh, creamsicle, but uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's great. And uh, here's a little flash of some of the replays. You can see the team's really working the boats, but... Uh, Harvard pretty strong all around the course here. Um, yeah, it's it's a it looks like it's cl close to full hiking. Sometimes a little shoulders up out there. There we see some of the teams going downwind. Uh, who who do we have here, Dave? Is it? So this is going to be the the Yale Coast Guard race, and uh, it looks like Coast Guard has jumped out to a one-two. Yeah, that so looks like a, sh a strong one too. There, that's Good. a strong one too. <laughs> Unfortunate for your, your alma mater there, but uh, well, listen, uh, let's get it straight here. I'm up for commentating for everybody, and I couldn't be more of a proud alum of of Yale. So, you know, as you know, you can't win them all. Can't and win them all. That's absolutely right. But I, I think we're going to be covering the Brown Roger Williams race here, uh, which is just in the pre-start. Uh, the boats, you know, before they get going, they're dueling for position. Um, so we have Roger Williams here in blue, 10, 11, 12. And uh, the Brown Bears in, uh, in, in red, 7, 8, 9. Great. Well, listen, let's tell you who's sailing for these two teams. Uh, Roger Williams has Aiden Hoogland, Cameron Wood, Matthew Dale, Carlos DeCastro, Molly Math Matthews, Michaela O'Donnell, uh, Annika, Irene, and Carly Kiss. So a nice, strong team uh, there. And they are sailing um, uh, Brown. And sailing for Brown, we've got uh, Guthrie Braun, Jed Bell, Liam O'Keefe, Connor Nelson, Emily Muller, Savannah Young, Lily Shore, Nora Ong, Izzy Cox, and Helen Horongik. And as Jack pointed out, there's only six sailors at a time, three drivers and three crew. But there's heavy air crew, light air crew, maybe heavy air drivers, light air drivers. So that's why uh, sometimes the team have more than six listed. You can see the teams here jockeying for position, um, you know, opting to either be on the windward side or the leeward side. So looks at the boat here that uh, Brown has got the right-hand side locked up, but... Uh, Let's see as they cross the line here. Jack, how powerful. Oh, a couple boats over early. Yeah, quite a few boats over early. Everyone's going back. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I love it when the race committee does that. You don't see uh, you don't see that very often, well, Dave. No general recalls in team racing. <laughs> so this is going to this is gonna throw everything into, uh, into whack. Uh, well. Seems like seven is in the strongest position because they turn back the fastest. Yes, but I would say Roger Williams survived that skirmish better. Uh, which boats are they? Ten? Yeah, I'd say that they're in the, the black boats, if you will, and uh, Brown are in the orange boats. So. But that was, you know, toss of the salad right after the start. Yeah, absolutely. I was about to ask you, how important is it in a team race to, to win the boat, to be the farthest right boat? Is that a strong position or a medium position? Absolutely. So I was a boat starter myself. Hey, uh, and me too. Yeah, there we go. Put it there. Um, putting the, the match race skills that Dave taught me over the various <laughs> years to use. But uh, by winning the boat, you can end up uh, locking up the right, as I like to say. And uh, that means 
no boats get to the right of you unless you want them to. So that coming into Mark 1, you can set up on the starboard ley line and have right away over everyone coming into the mark. So Seven here has done an excellent job. They, they, they won the boat and they're locking up the right and they're going to be first here. And uh, although their teammates are a little deeper, they're going to be a huge asset here by just being able to control who goes around the mark. Now this is 3v3 team racing, so you just add the points. For instance, if your team is in first, third, and sixth, that's 10 points. The other team would be in second, fourth, and fifth, so that'd be 11 points, and so you'd win. That's how it works. How important is the one card, the ace, in, the, in 3v3? It's, it's incredibly important. I mean, if you think about just how the numbers work, if you're first and not last, you mm. win. So you can be in a 1-4-5 with only one opponent behind you, and it's still a winning combination. So you can see here, Seven definitely wants to hold on to that one at the moment, but also conscious of what uh, is happening behind him. So just staying within touching distance. And from the looks of things, uh, obviously uh, it looks like Brown is opting to go for a 1-4-5 combination, while Roger Williams is trying to make a 2-3-4 happen here. So yeah. you can see that uh, boat number 10 and 11 dropping onto their respective pairs to try and get their teammate out of last. Well, I like the way uh, seven, the one, a lot of people think, you know, in fleet racing, you're in the first, just, you know, get the lead, extend your lead. But in team racing, that's useless because if you're at the first and you zoom away, you've left your opponents three against two in the back. So you want the one, but I remember Carl Ziegler, a great team racer, used to say, no more than about three bolt lengths ahead. So you're in touch and you can do something if you need it. Absolutely. I think that's part of the, uh, the skill of being the one is knowing when to engage and when to uh, go fast to maintain your first position. Um, so you can see here that uh, look, maybe boat 11 has decided to uh, sail forward, sail fast, to mm. try and get into the one position. So you, we may see each team just go to a different combination here. So with Brown, 7, 8, 9, maybe going for play 2. And remind the viewers what play 2 means. So play 2 is basically looking for a two, three, four. So play two is uh, the leading two, stands for your first position. And uh, the other plays include play one, which is a one, two, anything, and a play four, which is a, a one, four, five combination. So each of the teams here, uh, you know, they're going through this upwind and uh, changing through the different plays as different things occur here. So, Dave, what do you what do you think about the decision for Brown to uh, go play two there, rather than holding on to the one? Well, I've been told that play two, two, three, four is the strongest combination. It, it wins the most rate. Well, one, two, of course, is the strongest. But a one, three, that means you have an opponent in the two, and they can they can take care. Yeah, and I think we're going to go to Gloria, who's live out on the water and is, uh, can follow this race in person. Yeah, hey, everyone. I'm seeing a pretty, that was a pretty dicey 2-3-4, and we saw that get broken up. I'll tell you what, the breeze is nice out here. So we're watching Raj break up Brown's 2-3-4. They're 8 plus 6. I think Gloria, you're cutting out just a little bit there, but yeah, looks uh, looks pretty dicey. You know, the race is uh, really slowed down at this mark, and a uh, couple boats doing circles there. So we'll we'll try to keep you uh, up to date as uh, things uh, come out of this mark. But it looks like a two three six for Brown at the moment. So uh, the goal for Brown is to uh, get their teammate out of last, um, and uh, boat ten doing an excellent job in boat eight there, just. Sailing them upwind. They're supposed to be going downwind. Well, listen. As you know, the most fun position for me is when you look up and you see your teammate in first and you're in fifth with an opponent behind you. You've just got one job to do. And, Jack, what is that job? Slow down the boat and last. Basically <laughs> bury that opponent. That's exactly what Boat 10 is here doing. You can see we something we call the 4-5 gap. So the gap between the, the person in fourth and the gap between person in uh, in, uh, in, in, in fifth. And uh, 10 is really trying to open up the gap here. And oh, you, yeah. another, there's a contact there? 
A little bit of contact, but... Oh my gosh. You'll see that 10 uh, make, makes boat 8 spin and immediately stops to yeah. make it happen again. Yeah. So your goal is not to go forward. Your goal is actually to make the 6 never finish, which is we go out to the wrecking ball. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. It's just a match race in the back of the fleet. See that? Like, he's uh, he's moving his tiller all over the place, just slowing the boat on to, to slow himself down to get him back into position to... Uh, to uh, attack on eight. And uh, the reason he's doing this is because ahead of him, uh, his teammate is uh, getting double teamed by uh, the opponent in uh, in second and third position. And uh, he's trying to open up the gap. So do one onto your, the opponent as uh, as they're doing to you further up the course. Go to Gloria. And uh, we're gonna go check in with Gloria, who's out on the water and uh, can maybe get a, uh, a, a closer uh, view here. Yeah, boat 11 from Roger Williams is pretty punched out ahead. We're now just seeing him kind of turn around and come back towards the action. But we're seeing Roger Williams doing an excellent job here, twice, pushing those two round boats. And then boat 10, Roger Williams is doing an excellent job making putting in that with a sick brown boat. Yeah, I mean, Dave, what do you think of the one here? Would, would you like to see the one just a little bit closer, or...? Well, so... <laughs> boy, this poor guy, this poor team in eight, he's in so many circles, it's like... But, uh, you know, he's trying to push the race forward. Um, so, and, and to your point, then you can see the uh, Roger Williams boat just stopping. The one needs to keep the one, but as my friend Carl Ziegler would say, no more than about three boat lengths. You want to be you want to be a solid one. And once you round mark three, Jack, and you're on the reach, it's it's harder for the one to lose the one. In other words, it's easier to stay in the one. So boat number eleven in the one is just keeping about three lengths ahead. Uh, the real work has to be done by the the two um, the two rod the two um, uh, brown boats. Uh, number uh, boat, boat number nine and the boat to windward, they've got to capture, they've got to capture the second place uh, Roger Williams boat and just stop them, and until his t the teammates can catch up. So you can see it's it's sort of two on one right there, two on one against the second place uh, Roger Williams boat. That's where the action is, and this is where team racing is so different from fleet racing. That's why it's so much fun. You never do this in a fleet race, and it's just so much fun. So uh, the, the, the two Roger Williams, uh, two brown boats are trying to slow down the second Roger Williams boat. The last place brown boat, number eight, is trying to push number 10 up into the game, and that's the game that's going on right now. And the one's just hanging out, looking for an opportunity to help. Yeah, I mean, they did an excellent job there, condensing the race. Um, and... Uh, now, boat eight is back in the game. Yeah, so seven and eight, both number seven and... Uh, seven and nine. Seven and nine are doing a double team. It's a classic double team on that blue boat there. And they're trying to slow him down, slow him down, and if he's able to tack, they just double team in the other direction. So it's a classic double team. There's the luffing of the jib. You know, the slower you go, the slower the opponent goes. But meanwhile, look in the back of the pack. There's that match race again. <laughs> where uh, number 10's just got the wrecking ball out, and they're just trying to keep that other, uh, their opponent from going up the course. And number one's just watching, maybe trying to hurt the lead brown boat a little bit. But this, this is a classic team race. Textbook track. right here. Both teams do an excellent job in each of their roles. Yeah. I have to say that uh, the uh, Vulture Williams 10, 11, 12 may be doing a slightly better job at this play at the moment. You know, that well. boat, uh, boat 12 is tr just taking it and that's all he can do but uh his teammate in boat 10 has been just doing a fantastic job in the yeah, wrecking ball there. that is that's where you that's where you want your best match racer you know i will say that it's easier to slow boats down the lighter the wind gets the windier it gets the harder it is to slow a boat down so you can see boat seven now decided it might be time uh to at some point they got to go back and help their teammate and last so nine's got to do a great job of slowing 12 and letting that back pair catch up. And then seven's got to go over there and break his teammate out of last. So that's the game that's going on right now. But, you know, as Jack said, the, the, 
Number 10 for Roger Williams is just doing a heroic oh, job. Oh, 10 is spinning. 10 is spinning. In the back. Oh, uh, can you go to Gloria? I wonder if Gloria can tell us what happened. Yeah, that looked like that was a clipping. That was a pretty typical windward leeward there. Eight just got that little bit of a clip on 10. So now we're looking at 12 from Roger Williams. Is hard down on eight. Excellent job by them. Honestly, a lot of people forget that, hey, I can have a pair still. Uh, I might be behind one of the other brown boats, but hey, my teammate might have lost them, but I still got a piece of them. Well, look at this. This is classic teammates. Now everyone's coming back. This is like, we're coming back. So the one and two are sailing downwind to, to, to engage in the battle. And now it's just a chop, it's just a it's chop meet. You, you know, really it's just pairs and pinning and positioning. And it's, this is so exciting, Jack. Uh, I'm just gonna sit back and watch this. Uh, maybe you can tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so it looks like 12 has become that five, the wrecking ball. Um, oh wow, it's getting tight. I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna get ahead of myself here, but uh, just to confirm, Red, 7, 8, 9 is trying to get into the 2, 3, 4. And uh, Roger Williams is trying to stay in the 1, 4, 5. But uh, we're going to let this unfold. And I'll tell you, they've got about 100 yards to go to the finish. But just like the last 10 seconds of a basketball game, this is going to take a long time. So this is just a race of who can make the conversion happen fastest. Um, this is the, uh, the pair on the right here. Um, I think Roger Williams just solved the solved the code here. I think they may have sailed into the one two. Didn't see how it happened. It happens quick. But I think uh, out of the, oh yeah, Roger Williams is spinning the back. But I don't think that's gonna matter. I don't think it's gonna matter. But let's see. Yeah, I think that was just uh, which side can do the pass back the quickest. And uh, oh, it's gonna come down to the photo finish. Oh, it looked like a one-two for Roger Williams from the booth here on the screen, but only the race, race committee knows for sure. Wow, Dave, that was a great race. Well, that, <laughs> listen, if you're watching and you're not a team racer, I'm glad you saw that. And I'm, I hope we see every race like that. Yeah, it's great to see the, uh, there's been a lot of two, three, sixes versus one, four, fives. Yeah. It always leads to the most team racing, the most action. But, uh. I think we saw a lot of textbook plays there. Um, just maybe to summarize, what, what was going on at the, the Mark IV there with those double team? Just that's well, standard play? Sure, so Roger Williams had the one. They went around the corner, so they got the one. The other Roger Williams, Brown in the back, had the five, six, and that battle was going on. So it leaves three more boats, two from Brown, one from Roger Williams. So it's a two on one. The job of the two Brown boats are just to grab that Roger Williams boat and just Hang on to him. Yeah. Don't let him progress around. And of course, you can use the zone around the mark uh, as a weapon because once you get into the zone, you've got superpowers. So you can delay there, and the other boat's not allowed to go inside of you. So uh, that's what happened. They did a great job, and then there was a penalty at the end where the well, we're here watching the start where everyone it, went back. It looks. It does look like everyone's going back. You know the. Uh, uh, the current might be a factor out there on that, but I think it was just uh, everyone was pushing hard. And we're going to see a little bit of an extended replay here, so he was at home just to just enjoy the race highlights. Yeah, and here comes seven down on the ten to create the try and create a pass back. So here's a two v one there, and on the other side there's a two v one, the two blue against the the orange. So it's which team can execute that two v one? And there's a spin on ten. Didn't see what happened. Eight drew that foul. I tell you, Jackie, you gotta know the rules. The rules are truly the tactical tools of this team racing. Absolutely, and you can see here again. Ooh, there's that collision. That's why he spun on that one. <laughs> yeah. Boat 10 just doing his job at slowing boat 9. So right here, you can see the 7 9 doing the double team on the, the Roger Williams boat there. And then, the, of course, if you're the pig in the middle, if you're the 1, the 2v1, your job is just make it last forever. Just keep it going, keep it going, because you've got teammates around that can help you. And you can see here, boat 12 sailing all the way downwind. Yeah. 
yeah. to make something happen. Yeah. And uh, obviously paid out in the end. Look, they got the, the cover on eight and uh, managed to... The Browns looking strong right here. I don't know where, where did they lose it because they're... Right here, boat 10. Right is right, getting to the strong side of the course. Yeah. Oh, but even if seven had beaten the other, it would still been a one three. So, well, listen, that was fun. That was a great one. <laughs> Let's do that again. We're gonna see plenty more where that came from. <laughs> Let's uh, do that again. That was that was awesome. Um, that's what happens when you get to the top eight, Dave. It's just yeah, constant warfare out there. You know, these races. If you're sailing around the course, they take ten minutes. But uh, you can see that one. People sailing downwind. Uh, making the races last way longer. But uh, here is the current standings. So uh, looks like Stanford at the top with one loss, 17 wins. Uh, Harvard on the same wins, but with one additional loss. So you can see the win percentage on the right side there. Uh, rounding out the top three at the moment, we have uh, Yale, 14 and five. And uh, going down, it looks like there's a four-way tie so this is going to be really important to follow as we go on to the the next stage of the regatta is that that top the top four um it's a tie between roger williams dartmouth and brown we'll have to keep an eye on those races coming up and then rounding out the top eight all still very tight uh coast guard on nine wins and st mary's on eight wins um looks like for the most part Certain teams are on 18 races, while others are on 19. So a little bit of, uh, you know, some catching up to do here for some of the teams. One a race down. So let's see how those uh, those shake out. Yeah. And these scores are, are probably one a couple races to be filled in. So that was pretty close to what it is now. All right. Ready to do another one here? Absolutely. Who right. do we have here, Dave? Well, I think we're looking at your alma mater, the Cardinal, is that a color? Cardinal with the cardinal red. Yeah, it is. It's not an animal. It's not an animal. No, oh, it's not a. It's not something that's not PC. Okay. Yeah. So we have cardinals in uh, in one, two, three. And this looks like the pre-start little replay here. And Dartmouth in 16, 17, 18. And they're the green. It's. A, I think it's a gray, but uh, the big green. Yeah. So you got two colors. But here's the start. Uh, looks pretty square, you know. I think everyone had a pretty good start there. Um, so let's see how things are going at the moment. This is Mark One. Uh, Dartmouth looks like in the one, two, at least initially here. Yeah. So they're going to be in the light blue boats. Sometimes it's easier to see the color. So the uh, Dartmouth's in the light blue boats, and Stanford's in the black boats. So sometimes that's easier to tell. And I agree. Once again, it looks like Dartmouth jumped out to a 1-2. So the work's going to be on. Of course, when you turn mark two and you're going downwind, the advantage, as my friend Tucker Thompson would say, the advantage switches the boat behind because, first of all, you're blocking the wind and you're affecting the boat ahead. So the 3-4 uh, for Stanford have to work together to, to reel in the two from Dartmouth. And you're seeing that right there. You can see in your screen... Uh, Dartmouth's got the solid one, but the 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 second place Dartmouth boat's being attacked by the two uh, Stanford boats. And Gloria, do do we have you out there to uh, follow this race along? Give us any live updates. Awesome. So it looks like Stanford. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's Vanessa Larkamp in boat two. She is making sure that boat 16 from Dartmouth is sweating. I believe that is Dartmouth's William in boat 16. And she is sure, certainly on his tail here. So Dartmouth has a one too, but as we've seen it before in a play one where they're in first and second place, these boats can tend to to sweat a little bit, they get a little nervous, and the moment that an opponent is covering them, they tend to lose the two, the second place, and that's where the other team takes advantage of that, plays back on them, and then pushes their teammates through. And so we're seeing boat two from Stanford doing an excellent job kind of drawing boat 16 back here. Yeah, so you're looking for boat one and two from Stanford, looking to double team boat 16, but uh, is it going to be too little too late? Um, the goal of 16 is just hang on, get to mark three, uh, maintain the one two, but uh, 
Let's see how it works out here. Boat two from Stanford looks like she, for a little bit, had a piece of 16. We'll see how boat one from Stanford is going to be able to push the Dartmouth Big Green around Mark three. We see that the nice thing is for Stanford here is that they're close enough that they can make something happen between marks three and four. And you can hear from dark. Gloria, I think we're losing you there, but uh, let's see how the boat's round here. It looks like Dartmouth is still hanging on to uh, the one, two. Here we are. Yeah. So they managed to get round, just make it to the bottom mark. Yeah, that's that's the big one right there. If you can exit mark three, the one, two, your life gets a lot easier. So the one rounds, the two rounds, then when the uh, the three rounds, they'll tack, and the one tacks and goes with them. And that's the standard choreography. So you'll see when boat two rounds the mark from Stanford, you'll see the first place boat from uh, Dart attack just like that textbook and now you've got zone coverage you've got the one covering the three and the two covering the four and you just you try and keep it somewhat balanced crews are looking up wind it's uh the breeze looks like it's lightened up a little bit jack and uh but there's still some big puffs out here there's big pressure so the uh, crews have to be constantly communicating what's the pressure doing and then what's going on with their teammates so it's, it's uh as I said before, the crew is probably way more important in team racing than fleet racing because there, there's so much more going on. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Dartmouth is locking up those two pairs on the left, but uh, just off the side of our screen, uh, one Stanford boat's extended right, so we'll see if uh, they get back in the picture. Um, still very close racing here. Um, I'm sure Dartmouth would have loved a bit of a bigger gap going around that bottom mark. Well, let's not get greedy. They had the one, two. And here's a good mix up. Stanford boat three has crossed the Dartmouth second place boat 16. They now can make something happen. Boat two is still pushing one out left with boat 18 from Dartmouth. But we now see that Stanford has two pairs. Boat one from Stanford has a grip on boat 16 from Dartmouth. Boat three from Stanford has a decent grip of boat 17 from Dartmouth. So the golden rule in team racing is have two pairs. If you have two pairs, you can get a winning combination and win the race. So what are you guys seeing from up there? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a big one here. 17 coming back on boat one. Um, you know, let's see how this shakes out. Uh, I would love to see boat three really clamp down on 17. And I think Stanford's thinking about a play two here. So a two, three, four. Yeah, I'm seeing boat 17 from Dartmouth now has potential to piggy in the middle. Stanford boat one here, as you can see right in front of me, they're coming down hard boat 17 so long as one still has a piece of boat 16 stanford could potentially still have those two pairs now i'm seeing boat three from stanford potentially just sail themselves into the one if that is the case and they can hold that what we're going to be looking for is a conversion to a play one boat three and boat two if they can execute this well we're looking for a play one for stanford Let's see what happens at the finish here, folks. Here, lots of yelling out there. It looks like Stanford's got the one. <laughs> That's very impressive. And green flag. Green flag. Now, what was the finish there, That was there, a green Gloria? flag by the umpires. Yeah, so the finish honestly was pretty tight. We saw one Dartmouth boat finish right at the pin, almost the same time as the Stanford boat had made it snuck right around the race committee boat. I'm honestly not too sure, but from the way that Stanford is uh, reacting, it looks like they may have lost this race. Yeah, photo finish there. Um, it could have gone either way. I'm not sure if any of the team know. 
Well, certainly what was interesting is that the Dartmouth did the textbook correct thing around Mark IV. They uh, split and they each covered a pair, but it was the fifth place boat yeah. that got out to the, the, the first two pairs went left and the fifth place went to the right. And we've been saying it's a shifty, puffy day. And sometimes you get a little lucky and you get what you want. And the three became the uh, the decider. So, yeah, here's a little replay. Uh, it'd be good to watch what happened to that final upwind. That was the the key turning moment for Stanford to get back in this race. So the one two for Dartmouth around Mark four. Usually you would think you know everything's okay. Yeah. Well, I was giving you a hard time saying they. they you know, you're getting greedy. They had the one two. What more do you want? But. It looks like it uh, might have been Chapman Peterson sailing for Stanford, who got out to the right and became the hero by taking the one. I mean, they've got the one. I think maybe the one three. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, we'll have to we'll keep you posted on the exact results there, but uh, we know it came down to the wire there. I think there was about three or four different plays on that last upwind uh, yeah. going through, but. Uh, you know, there's a as these boats sail back in just here, lots of uh, good conversations uh, about <laughs> what just occurred. Uh, I'm sure there's a fair bit of uh, lively discussion, uh, but uh, we w we will see. Um, we'll have to defer to Tech Score about the exact finish there. Uh, but uh, looks like uh, we might go to maybe Gloria with uh, is there an interview there? Maybe not quite, but uh, yeah, that was a great race. I mean, the last two, Dave, always down to the wire. Last upwind has been extremely important. Well, listen, while we have a little gap here, let's just tell you who's racing for Stanford. We got Hannah Freeman, Mich Michelle Larkamp, Vanessa Larkamp, Patricia Gurley, Ellie Harned, Abigail Tyndall, Chapman Peterson, Gwen Donahue, and Gracie uh, An An Aniston. Is that correct? Aniston. And then for Dartmouth, uh, Robert Bragg, Maddie Hawkins, Christopher Long, William Michaels, James Paul, Yumi Yoshia Yasu, Drew Clutterbuck, yeah, uh, and Ainsley Dave, Sullivan, and I think and we're Bragg. just going to go to a quick interview as they come in here. So uh, we're going to go live in one of the boats here. Uh, guys, wow, what a close race at the end there. Uh, working hard out there. What are you guys seeing conditions-wise? Uh, oh, good. I mean, we'll, we'll catch up with them later, but it looks like they're, you know, huffing and puffing, trying to get some uh, get some air in. It, it looks pretty hardcore out there. Um, these are the days where it's just a, a real test of uh, of endurance, you know, every roll tack. You know, they're, you know, sure, they're getting a couple minutes breaks uh, between uh, each set, but uh, once you're out there, it is full on. Um, and a little shot of the venue there, you can see the basin. So that's where the boats are coming in to rotate. Uh, each time a, a team goes out, it's they're in a different color. So everyone gets to try each boat. All right, Jumpin' Jack, we're switching up to race 141 now. This is the Harvard and Brown to Nisa Stalwarts. And obviously uh, big races for both of them. Brown's hanging in there. You know, we, you want to accumulate points to win, but you also want to make it to the final four. And Brown is right in the running for that. So this is a big race for both teams. They've, of course, seen each other many times uh, over over the years. Uh, but we'll see what happens here. Brown is uh, in the uh, – well, Harvard's in the orange boats, and Brown is in the blue boats, as you're looking at orange and blue. Yeah, so just in the pre-start here, um, I get the sense they've probably got uh, two or three minutes to go here. Uh, and uh, they're just lining up, setting up to the right of the committee boat, um, staying in the safe zone on the uh, starboard advantage. And then you'll see them turn in and uh, kind of pick up their pairs. And uh, this is one of the common themes you'll see is there's going to be three pairs, the, uh, the, the pin, the middle, and the boat. Jack, do they pair up and actually match race each other, or do they try and win... They, they wait for the match race to come to them, if you will. Yeah, it's it's a different strategy for certain different teams. I think what you'll see for the most part is 
around two minutes, they kind of pick out their pair. And often, you know, these teams are teammates against each other so often, they know who their, their, their yeah. person is. Yeah. And then they'll uh, they'll start the match race, basically. And you can see here, 12 and 8, just uh, jockeying for position. So 8 leading in, while 12 is uh, chasing. Well, there's a perfect picture right there. The two, three pairs of two. Yeah, exactly. Boat, middle, pin. And uh, this, uh, you know, allows each uh, each team to kind of focus on uh, one individual. But uh, hey, when it comes down to the end, you got to remember that you, you can match race into the last second, but uh, you really just got to get off the line. So last 10 seconds, last 15 seconds, you got to switch modes. And uh, we'll see if some of the teams do that, you know, in that last little bit and really put the accelerator on. How how important how much of an advantage does a good match racer have in team racing? I mean, it's huge for the start. So, uh, you know, if you're starting at the boat in particular, that's often where some of the really strong match racers uh, start because it's it's just like a match race start. You know, usually there is no pairs, uh, you know, affecting you, and you can do uh, like the typical match race start. So. Uh, I mean, each position is a slightly different skill set, but at the end of the day, you need to be able to uh, do the match race component. Yeah, well, I would say that um, uh, you and I have done quite a bit of match racing, and I know many of the sailors out here are match racers. And, um, you know, I would think the boat's important, but also winning the pin is also a lot of match racing, leading and pushing and, and all that. Like Dave Dellenbaugh, you know, or Tom Kinney, TK, very good match racers are they win the pin yeah and that's uh that's that's also equally hard so and i think folks we just got a little pause in the racing here so i think they uh they cooled off that start um possibly adjusting the course slightly where would one go or how would one what would one do if they want to become a better match racer if they want to raise their match racing skills go to one of your clinics uh <laughs> self plug for you there but uh no there is some uh, some great resources out there you can go to uh us sailing uh, is a dot match racing and there's uh, some great resources out there uh i know that there's like a growing regional presence when it comes to that and that usually occurs in small keel boats uh, is typically the starting place uh for match racing so uh, if you uh, don't like single-handed or you uh, get bored with one other person, it's a, it's a great place to, you know, go with a bunch of friends and uh, do three or four people on a boat. Well, sure. We have a national championship for youth sailors. In, in match racing, You it's uh, under 21. You can't turn 21 in your event, so you can have a couple years in college. Uh, several of the sailors here at this event will be sailing in the, uh, we call it the Rose Cup, the U.S. Uh, youth match race change for the Rose Cup. It's going to be in Sheboygan this year. But uh, uh, sailors apply, and next year, uh, w if people are going to be under 21, they can apply. We're also trying to get more women involved in match racing, and there, there's a women's match racing championship. And to qualify, the, at the qualifiers, the, the skipper has to be female, but the crew can be open. So the crew can be men or women. And there's an event in, in uh, Marblehead, uh, on June 9, 10, 11. There's a clinic on June 9, the racing is 10, 11, and they're looking for teams. So if you're a woman and, and interested in getting involved in match racing of any age, uh, you can just go to the U.S. Sailing website and go to the match racing webpage or uh, get in touch with, uh, uh, if you can find my email and get in touch with me, I'd be glad to show you where, how to get involved with that. But we're looking for women match racing skippers, and you don't need to have an all-women's team to qualify for the U.S. Women's Match Racing Championship. Of course, if you qualify for that, that it's an all-women's team. So, uh, lots of opportunities. Lots of opportunities. A, li a little flash of the latest results here, and we are going to go live back to race 141, which is uh, Harvard in 7.89 in red, and Brown in 10.11.12 in blue. Uh, this is the one that was postponed, but we're, we're back at it. Um, I think that's the first break they've had in two days, the first postponement. Well, you know who the unsung heroes out here? It's the race committee and the umpires because the sailors get to come in and take a break, go get some orange Gatorade, go to the bathroom, what not. The umpires and the race committee, they don't stop. There is no break for them. So huge shout out to those volunteers. We couldn't be doing this without them. Uh, I always try to say thank you, the umpires, no matter how many times they penalize me, because it's still better than the protest room. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they uh, deserve all the thanks here. But uh, approaching the start here, um, you can kind of pick out which of the pairs, a little bit of uh, maybe switching over here, but uh, 
Remember, Brown's in the blue boats and Harvard's in the orange boats. So you can see, uh, so this will be 10, will put their bow down, build speed. I always like to tack back in this situation. I don't like to jive what number 10 just did. I would put my bow down and then tack back. Cause then they could come in, they would have come right in at the boat there. Yeah. I call that a mistake. That They should have tacked back and they would have been uh, in a position to dominate. We'll Dave, the, we're seeing quite a lot of pin bias here. I was going to say. And um, I know that the, uh, the tide is coming in now. It's going from right to left. So the current is moving right to left, which is um, you know, making it even harder to be down there by the pin. It looks like somebody's going back. A couple boats going back. It looks like seven from Harvard going back, but as well as 11. Yeah, there was one of each went back. Still going. Oh, still coming back? Oh, boy. So that, I always call the pin the devil's playground, Jack. <laughs> you know, every now and then it works, and the rest of the time it doesn't. It's the devil just luring you in there. Yeah, that's one recurring theme we've seen today is people were over at the pin. So uh, I'd probably say slight advantage maybe to Harvard here. They, they got yeah. a, a strong 2-3. Um, I think Brown may be leading on the right. But uh, just off screen. But uh, let's see what play they opt for here. Yeah, there is a boat out to windward of boat seven that you can't see right now. See boat 11 there, pinning boat eight, freeing their teammate, which is uh, boat 12 for Brown, getting them to the right. There's a good shot, Jack, from the air. You can see the pressure differences. You can see the lighter water is less wind, and then the darker water is a huge puff coming on the left. And the, the cruise can, drivers can see that, and that becomes part of the strategy. You sail towards the darker water, towards the pressure, and then your boat... How fast do you think these guys are going upwind in knots, Jack? What would you guess? Oh, it's hard to tell. It's an embarrassingly low number. It is, it is. <laughs> and the fact is, I, I'm not sure, six, seven? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks faster when you're in it. But uh, you can see boat 10 bow down, going yeah. back, trying to make something happen here. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to head over to Gloria, see what's happening here. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Honestly, Boat 10, very, very early on, kind of saw that his team would need some help, and he went bow down, I think, arguably a little bit early, because now he's he's lost any leverage he had out here. Um, so that was a really bold move. I, I'm not sure how that's going to pan out for him, and it looks like it's already not panning out too well. But I'll tell you what, a, a lot of these guys, like Seven's doing a really great job. Boat 7, as I should say, from Harvard, uh, is doing a really good job of just slowing here on 10. Like I said, 10 just, the first leg allows for so much opportunity to happen. And it's uh, it's not necessarily the leg you want to really slow down like that. Well, they say once you cut a piece of wood, you can't put it back together again. So when you give up distance and give up leverage, that's distance leverage you'll never get back so you got to make sure it's a, a wise investment and on the screen right now it sure looks like harvard has that strong two three four all right so jack there you are you've got the one you look back and the other team's got the two three four what do you do well i think default play is stay within touching distance so that's uh two or three boat lengths uh of boat eight there who's uh in second place just in case something happens, you're right there to react. But uh, I think for the first half of this downwind, or for the, this downwind at least, you, you got to trust that your teammates are going to be able to catch up to uh, the Harvard boat in fourth, which is boat nine, um, and make something happen. But as the race progresses and this uh, two, three, four doesn't seem to be uh, breaking up at all, that's when you start to turn up the risk a little bit. and. I think the uh, usually the right time to do that is uh, second half, the last upwind. Other people like to do it a little early. Um, I think in this case, since there's a, a pretty decent gap between the four and the five, you, you might need to get involved just a little bit earlier. But uh, we'll see what he decides to do. You, you do you uh, 
you, uh, you th- what do you think of that philosophy, Dave? Yeah, so I think, first of all, you got to keep the one. So at this point, so downwind with those whips behind you, I would never give, I wouldn't give up an inch. You're just racing hard down the run. Try to keep the one because you know the two is going to do what they're doing. They're going to try and go high and get you slow down. Mark three is when you can start to compress the race a little bit. If you can get to the, within the zone, and in team racing, the zone is only two lengths wide. Um, so, but we'll come back to that. Gloria, what do you got? Yeah, I'm happy to add here, boat 10, at first I thought, reached pretty far out left, looking down one left. Uh, now they're doing a good job. They finally caught up to a boat from Harvard. But, you know, when you're behind, you want to find the closest boat to just hard cover on. And I see boat 10's doing a lot of reaching. And when, when, a, when an opponent, boat 9, is straight ahead of them, so you want to be doing a pretty hard cover and I, I saw that Boten had plenty of opportunity, and, and it's moments like that where it's a lot harder to catch boats if you're not sitting on them. Yeah, one thing I'm seeing here is, uh, you know, boat nine gets covered by boat 10, throws in a big jibe, you know, just gets it reaching, tries to clear their air, but also get the... Uh, get the, the nice rock out of the jibe. All, all legal, but uh, it's, a, it's good to be slow jibing at the whole downwind. So back to mark three, we've got this zone. It's two boat lengths wide, two boat length radius. And if you get to that zone ahead of the boat behind you, you can pretty much just stop your boat and keep them from going around. What's happened here is boat 12 has had to give up the one. So now they're gonna try and set a trap and compress the two other boats from Harvard. So. And the first boat from Harvard, once they get to the zone, now they're within two lengths. They're going to stop and try and create a trap. Uh, they're going to try and keep a trap and turn this into a one-two here. Yeah, so I think boat 12 is just desperado there. So 12, there was contact. I think they were clear astern. I think they're going to be spinning. There they go. So you know, that's the power of the zone at Mark three. If you can get there first, you own the zone in team racing. You don't even need to jibe around it like you do in fleet racing. And it becomes really powerful. So good job on Harvard for working the high-low downwind, uh, taking the one away from Brown, and then good job on the one in the zone of creating the trap, causing the foul, and pretty much turning this into a, a walk away here. I wonder if uh, Harvard's going to remember the race when they rounded behind in the 3-4 and the 5 hit hit the corner. So see if they balance any better. But you can see they're well balanced here. I thought uh, maybe boat 7 may have hit the mark there, but it might have gone away with it. Well, Jack, i got to say the umpire's a lot closer to the you and me. So, of course, in, in team racing, just like flea racing, you're not allowed to touch the mark with your body or your boat. So and the umpires are right there to look for it. It's the last thing you want to do though in a one two. <laughs> you know, in the UK, Jack, uh, a place that you know a little bit about, uh, in team racing now, they, they let you hit the marks. Why? Because in team racing, generally it doesn't, you know, you can't have fleet racing boats hit marks because they get hooked on the keel and drags the mark away. But in team racing, generally if you hit it, it's just a glancing blow. The umpires are never in the right position to see every boat round, so it's a little bit inequitable if they happen to be in the right place for one boat and not in the other. And they realize that um, they don't need to zoom all around and use up all that petrol to always be in the right position. They can let the boats go down there, and they don't have to zoom down to watch every boat race and zoom around. So it's, I was just racing there in a couple a couple weeks ago, and they don't they let you touch the mark, and it's it's kind of nice. Yeah, it's like a windsurfing. It's kind of windsurfing, you know. I like it takes that a little pressure off. I like that one. Yeah. For team racing, not fleet racing. <laughs> so Harvard here maintaining the one-two, and uh, this is just a game of balancing pairs. So when yeah. I say that, it's uh, boat seven and eleven here. They're a pair, and uh, what seven is trying to do is make sure that his teammate on the right-hand side of your screen is staying ahead of eleven. Yeah. 
Balancing your pair jack, that's so easy to say, but it's a really tough concept. Can you want to go a little deeper on what it means to balance your pair? Sure. So what it usually means is you're keeping a lever, in this case, in your coverage zone. So you're making them tack more to slow down, or you're using your wind shadow, um, which is which is basically this, uh, this V, which goes behind your sail and uh, throws off turbulent air and... Uh, Makes the opponent slow. So looks like uh, Harvard punched one two there at the finish line. All right, so they go to 18 wins. And they're keeping the pressure on the Cardinal. They absolutely are. They've had a, a really good day. Um, conditions wise, Dave, do, do we think it's got a little lighter? It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, well, definitely in front of us, it's a little lighter. When we look way up to the right, I'm seeing more white caps. Uh, uh, sheep on the pond, as our dear friend Buddy Melges would say, uh, which indicates a little bit more wind. So I think there's, it's coming down in, in, in fields, but it's a beautiful easterly. I mean, this is, if you had to ask for a great breeze to race from the sound, this is what you'd ask for. Straight down the sound, you've got wind, you've got shifts, you've got waves, uh, you've got plenty of breeze, and there's no rain. So this is no a, rain. this is a, put this one in a bottle. Let's. If they can have this for a couple of days, the uh, Dingy Nationals a couple of days, I think they'll be happy. Here's a little replay. Um, I think we're looking at the start here and the first upwind. Well, listen, we both saw a lot of boats over early. That Those are, I call those unforced errors. There's only six boats, the line, and, and two, two of them are your friends, right? So, and the line's plenty long, so fighting for the pin and being over early, that's unforced error at this level. And Harvard came out of that better than Brown did. And, uh, you know, it was pretty much. There was an opportunity there, though, on that downwind. It got pretty close. Um, but uh, they were, you know, Harvard was able to hold on to it. Well, you can see here number 12 has no business to be in there. 12 was behind 7. 7 got to the zone first. 7 owned the zone. So 12 was just, you know, they were in a tough position. They do trying to make something happen, but there was nothing to be done, and you got a lot of boats spinning, but Harvard did a great job there. As much as it pains me to say, but it's true. And here you go, there's the one to mound the Mark IV. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. And uh, I'm just how strong that is. Yeah. And then the one either waits for the three to attack or attacks first, and you got zone coverage, and... Um, should be easy from there, but we've seen some races get broken up. Well, we watched Stanford did in the last race. Yeah, and uh, just in that update, actually Stanford lost that race. That uh, that last one against uh, against Dartmouth. They but did. Yeah, they did on the finish. But uh, here's, here we are against Roger Williams against Stanford. So Stanford, 13, 14, 15 in orange. And uh, Roger Williams, 4, 5, 6 in green. Well, that's huge that Stanford lost that race to... to uh to Dartmouth. Um, it's going to really tighten up the, the scores at the top there. I think it's pretty much, it, you know, Stanford and Harvard race each other in the last race of the round of eight. Yeah, that's going to be a big race. That's going to be a big, big race. So in the pre-start here, I think one thing we've seen is pin bias. But with some yeah. current, Dave. So, how how would you be thinking about that if you're the pin pair? I would I would certainly if I was a pin pair, I would be the windward boat of the pin pair, because the current I think is going right to left. The, the tide's coming in, so I would be the windward of the two boats, because it's a lot more forgiving. If you're the lure of the two, then you have the risk of not making it or hitting the pin, and I would build a lot of margin of error. Listen. As Pearson said yesterday, the day you know you can't win the race at the start, but you can lose it, and you don't want to go off the line on the, on the back foot because you you misjudge the pin lay line. I completely agree here, Dave. I think mean, you know when it is a tricky starting conditions, there's waves, there's a bit of cone factor. There might be you know one end of the line that's certainly biased. I think the goal is just get off square. You know. Don't be on the back foot. You don't need to win the race. You don't need to obliterate the opponents off the start line. You just need to you know, be bow back maybe just a couple extra feet and uh, be ready to uh, at least battle around the course. So we are watching uh, Roger Williams and Stanford. And um, 
I think we're looking at the pin pair here. Yeah, Roger Williams is in green, and Stanford is in orange. And there's a little match race going down there. Uh, you can see a lot of circling around. The, the, 30 seconds there, Dave. The boat handling is spectacular. And the, the crews on these boats, they are wizards, what they can do in a boat. Uh, would you agree, Jack, the crew is very important? Yeah, oh, extremely important. I mean, at the end of the day, they determine when you accelerate off the start line. And uh, it's also hard because you've got to be on the exact same page. Is the crew more important than the skipper, Jack? What do you think? I think it's a it's a team uh, sport, <laughs> but uh, it definitely in certain Spoken situations. Like a true skipper. Yeah, that's that's coming from a skipper here. <laughs> but uh, I I think in key situations it is extremely important for the crew. Um, just off the start here, looks like slight advantage while Roger Williams yeah. off off the off the boat and uh, and off the pin and off the pin and maybe even the middle. I think Roger Williams crushed him off the line here. I think they're winning all, possibly winning all three pairs. Good for them. Look at that, boat five, shoulders down. Can't even see them. Just. I love it. I love it. Crew's definitely high card and skippers. You can't deny that. I will not deny that. There you go. Gloria, do you have any updates for us uh, post start there? Yeah, I'm taking a look here, and it looks like Roger Williams got a decent start, but boat four is struggling a little bit out right here. So Stanford right now, if you were looking at who has how many pairs, I'm looking at Stanford, boat 13 and orange. They have a nice hold on boat five. Boat 14 has that hold on four, if need be, so Looks like Stanford has two pairs off this starting line. Yeah, it looks like Stanford in an early 2-3-6. Uh, you know, Roger Williams in a 1-4-5. That's the combo we keep seeing again here, Dave, huh? Love it, love it, love it. So we'll see if uh, either of these teams try to convert this play uh, or solidify their lead early here. We've seen that uh, happen time and time again, people getting Really active on that first upwind. Well, I think if you've got, if the other team has the one, then you're in play two. And again, my friend Carl Ziegler used to say, don't waste time. If you're, if you don't have the one and you're the two, you're, you're looking to play back. You're looking to, to consolidate that two, three, four really quick. Just like you're seeing it right there. Both 13 has no interest in chasing the six. They are, they are solidly in play two. And I think the sooner you get going, the better. And this is what is fun. So here comes the one across, uh, boat six. I would love to see uh, boat 13 just clamping down a little harder. It's the danger of, you know, Roger Williams possibly going play one here. Maybe boat 13's got a pin out to the right there. I tell you, this is great photography. Kudos to the photography team. Look at this action, Jack. And we are zoomed in. We're, there's the, the drone. I mean, viewers should not take this for granted. This is spectacular footage. So you can see the wakes of the boats. It's like a, a feeding frenzy Ooh, there. Oh, collision there. Oh, my gosh. I think the green boat's going to buy one there. They tacked onto port. I didn't see when the orange boat tacked onto starboard. Yeah, they're they're, uh, they're not spinning, so fascinating. So maybe somebody's got to be spinning. Someone will be spinning. There's a hand up still. So the umpires, of course, there's 14 spinning. The umpires generally have two umpires in the boat, and when they see action, they each one takes one of the boats and they talk it through. You know, I'm on starboard either right away. I'm on port. I have to keep clear. I'm changing course. You're giving me room. You're not giving me room. So they're ready for the action. And the umpires are just waiting for a hand to go up and hear the word protest. And then they will either either um, green flag it, which means no penalty, which not, doesn't necessarily mean no foul. It means either they're not sure or they didn't see it clearly or they're sure nobody broke a rule. Or they'll penalize a boat that was wrong if that boat hasn't already spun. Roger Williams, one, two, three here. Gloria, any updates? Yeah, 
I'm taking a look here. I'm a little surprised there was no red flag from the umpires around Mark 1, but that Mark 1 was definitely chaotic. You got to give credit where it's due, and Roger Williams did a great job double pinning there. A uh, little bit of a tough rounding for Stanford, but we're looking for 13 to get into the action here. Potentially getting some action here with boat four from Roger Williams. And we'll see if they can just get one of those Roger Williams boats and then make something happen. Whereas Roger Williams is just looking to hold Gloria, this not to one, interrupt, two, three. but we got a little replay of Mark 1 here. So uh, we're just going to have a quick look at this. Looks like boat 14 just ran out of space and uh, ran into the back. Mm. Close action. Well, that's why uh, you got to have good sturdy boats, which Zim has provided here. These boats take a beating and uh, they keep on going. So, and you got you know you got college, you got college age kids in them, but the boats are strong and they allow the sailors to have great racing. So Stanford just sailing fast, trying to get themselves back in this race. Yeah, so I'm seeing boat 13, Michelle Larkamp did an excellent job on that downwind. She was cruising on those waves. Got a little bit of a piece of five. And so we'll see if she can make something happen between boat five. She was able to jibe in with overlap, but it looks like there was no foul there by uh, five. Looks like it's lining up out there a little bit. You see Cruz kind of in the middle. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's definitely getting much lighter. So it, it makes me think, it, it was very evident to us that Stanford had put in a new skipper for today, uh, presumably due to heavier winds. And so they've been having a little bit of a harder time in this bigger breeze. I'm curious to see if Stanford's going to switch out their third driver. And, and then I want to see what will happen if that does happen. Well, meanwhile, Roger Williams is just taking it to heart to Stanford here. And uh, the battle in the back, um, Boat Forge is doing a great job of, of gapping it back. The one, two, they've got solid zone coverage. Uh, remember, Stanford's been in this position before, and, it, and the Boat Five was the hero. But in this case, they don't have a Boat Five. <laughs> so they, they, uh, they are really, uh, Roger Williams has just done a textbook job uh, out front, under control. And uh, this is going to sting a little bit to Stanford. Yeah, Definitely this looks strong one, two here. Well, of course, a commentator's dream would be that the race, the regatta is not over after the round of eight. And I don't think it's going to be yeah, this time. I, the way I this think is it's going to be a real shootout until the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, Dave, where are we in this round of eight? Are we about two thirds of the way through? Uh, exactly. We've got uh, after this, uh, we've got uh, two more full flights and one more other race. So three, six, seven, eight more races to go. And uh, there's a lot on the table here for who's going to be in that top four. Maybe after this race, we can get a little update of the scores. Yeah, I know that Roger Williams was uh, just on the t edge of the top four. So it, this win will certainly help them. Yep, and I think I just saw Yale beat Dartmouth, I think. So they're hanging in there for the top four. Coming across the green boats from Roger Williams, they just now they just have to be careful, just to make no big mistakes. Each each uh, wins their their pair. You can see that they've uh, slowed down the tacking, and uh, they're not quite hiking as hard out there. 
Um, it's interesting. One forecast I saw was uh, Dashi to get a little bit more breeze on, but uh, this has kind of uh, gone the other way. You know, Jack, and I mean no disrespect for my colleagues and professionals in the meteorology business, it's tough to predict what the wind's going to do in a micro sense, you know, from 11.30 to 1.30 to say what the wind's going to do. Yeah. It just doesn't work Understood. That way. So 1-2 uh, so there for Roger Williams. Yes. Okay. Big play and mark one to really uh, solidify that win. Yeah. Well, Stanford's got to swallow hard. No, no, nothing's fatal. It's, it's still going to, you know, it, but this last race... Uh, of this round robin between Stanford and Harvard is going to be huge. Yeah, I think, you know, they uh, haven't made it uh, easy on themselves, but uh, they've uh, had such a good previous first two days that, uh, you know, th th they are where they need to be. Um, I think they just need to have a confidence talk. You know, this is when you need some inspiration to come out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a great race there. Um, I think they... Maybe adjusting the course slightly out there at the moment. But. Good. Well, here we go back to the Stanford Roger Williams race. And remember, Roger Williams is green, Stanford's orange. Uh, this like, looks like it could have been up the first beat here. Camera angles, angles are deceptive, aren't they, Jack, when you're watching video? Yeah, it's hard. Have to sort of wait for the mark to, to get to know. But here's uh, both six and Roger Williams. Uh, so now they've All rounded right. mark two. They're going down the run. And now this is exiting mark three, and there's uh, St Roger Williams. I'd love to see a statistic of uh, if you round mark three, one, two, what's the percentage you win the race? I bet it's pretty darn high. Yeah, I imagine it's pretty high up there, especially at this level, you know. Not a lot of mistakes being made in simple one-twos. Yeah, we saw Stanford be the exception to that. Good for them. And we always know that the the teams that win have had some nice come-from-behind moments. You know, usually the team that wins has done a better job when they're losing than the teams that don't win. And Stanford surely did well previously on the day, but um, it's going to be close. We'll wait to get an update on the scores. Uh, you can see here the uh, two respective teams sailing in together, mm. you know, discussing the post-race, getting, discussing it while it's fresh in the mind, um, and you know taking things back in as a team. Um, so it's always easy to know what to talk about when you won. But Jack, what was your style as a team when your team didn't win? Let's say you were Stanford in that situation. You just lost a tough race. How do you communicate? What do you start talking about? Was there a routine or? I think it? it's pretty person uh, dependent. I think for me, depending on how uh, how sore it was, uh, just taking a moment um, to myself before kind of letting it out on anyone else. But uh, you can see here the latest results. Mm -hmm. I think this is just, just a little stale, but uh, looks like Harvard at the top at the moment. And I think seven, uh, Stanford will be down one race win. I, I'm not sure that was too stale. Uh, that's how I had it. I had okay. Harvard with the advantage, and I had uh, Yale and Dartmouth who tied three and four. I I didn't see on the screen who was fifth. Of course, that would be an important thing to know. Uh, but we can get back to that. So, but going back to you. So first of all, you did a little alone time, a little personal time. Exactly. Make sure that you didn't say something you would regret. You that's don't want to say anything too uh, yes. too quickly to somebody else. Exactly. Yes. If it's not going to be self reflection, self reflection and self control. But then are you guys like you talk about it then let it go or did you did you dwell on it? Were you a dweller or were you a, were you a goldfish? You have to you have to let it go. I mean, I bet it always dwells on you slightly, but at the uh, as you said, being a goldfish would be the perfect thing because this is just a regatta of attrition. Keep mm -hmm. going. Next race is worth just as much as the one that has already happened, but you can't control that one. So we're looking at uh, the final seconds here. Brown versus Coast Guard. Brown in uh, 789 in, uh, in red, and Coast Guard in 10, 11, 12 in blue. I bet this is a pretty big race for Brown if they want to stay in the hunt for the top four. Um, I'm not looking at the most updated scores, but uh, informally, I think this is a must win race for, for Brown in orange. <laughs> I think it's. Uh, 
Must be last 30, 20 seconds here. 10 seconds to go. And here's the start gun. A little delay on the screen while we're watching. Clear. 10 over. Looks like Brown with a pretty good start there. Two and off the pin. Yeah, so the pin favored and Brown capitalized on that. Double stacked. Yeah, That's yeah. quite the strategy. Yeah. Well, listen, you... you <laughs> You gotta be aware, you can't let the other team get two boats down to favorite end, you know. I think the way that you want it set up is uh, opponent, yourself, opponent, teammate, and then opponent and your team. Yep. You know, yep. one in between each one. And uh, I think we're going to Gloria here. Great. Hey, everybody. You definitely gotta be athletic out here on the boat, you know, trying to stay stable. Um, but yeah, that was a really great start by the Brown Bears. They definitely need this win. Uh, the, lo the starting line's relatively big, so we're seeing a lot of boats over, which is very interesting. I'm curious how much current is playing a part there, um, or if people are just pulling the trigger early because there's a lot of pressure right now. Um, and by pressure, I mean pressure mentally and on the course. Um, it definitely seems to be lightening up a little bit, I'm curious to see if teams are going to start pulling out heavy crews, putting in back mediums or lights. Um, it's anybody's game out here. This is super, super tight racing, and it's definitely going to keep getting more and more interesting because I don't think anybody's going to be going into the Final Four really solidifying the national championship. I think it's going to be neck and neck and cutthroat out here today. And Gloria, just quick question. Based on the conditions, it looks pretty bumpy, but uh, are people uh, shoulders out out there? W what can you tell about the wind strength? Are we close to 10 knots or close to 15? I would say we're uh, a happy medium between those two, maybe 13 with gusts of 15, uh, with times it being about 10 knots. I mean, right here you see Brown, Brown Bear's boat eight, crew's kind of sitting up. She's hiking just a little bit, but she's kind of sitting up. It's definitely starting to lighten up. I mean, the last race we saw with Stanford, everybody's hiking pretty hard, and their final upwind was looking pretty light. So that means that we're going to want to start taking into account that as the lighter the lighter it gets, you're definitely not going to want to be doing pen penalty turns. Absolutely. And uh, we're seeing uh, 7-9 and nine from Brown here. Just... Uh, uh, getting the one two on the first upwind and I, I imagine they're looking just to extend here put into a fleet race mode and not look back one thing i always like to do if you if you have a uh, what we call a breakaway one two is uh see if you can open up that gap between mm -hmm. the opponent just a little bit because every meter that you have going to onto the downwind yep. allows you to uh Really keep that uh, that that uh, that one two pretty stable. Yeah, yeah, all good. And also, when you have the one two, you just got to make sure you don't relax. You don't say, "Okay, we got this." You know, there's fire in the belly on the three four. You know, they are looking for every wave, and you can see right here the eleven and twelve uh, from Coast Guard are going high on seven. They're trying to draw seven up and sort of ganging up so you, you can't relax in the one two and think we got this uh until you're around mark three of course you never want to relax but the pressure's on right now the two's the two's got company and uh the pressure's on the two you can see a, a textbook high low going on here high low means that the boat nearest the the opponent ahead goes high goes up dragging the opponent up to defend then the next person goes low you can see him winging the jib and you try to create the pass that way. One thing I want to point out, Dave, is uh, Brown has something called an ace here. So they have that opponent, Coast Guard, boat 10, locked up in the six. Um, and that's going to come in handy in case this uh, this one two gets uh, broken up. They can always go back to a one four five. So having that ace is uh, super valuable. Um, and uh, it seems like boat eight is just putting some pressure on the outside here. So. Making it a little harder for uh, 
you know, Coast Guard and 11 and 12 to really focus on this one boat. They've always got to keep in mind that boat on the edge. Yeah, it's out of our screen, isn't it? The, the, the one for the uh, for, for Brown. I always marvel how, how good the crews are going back and forth between trimming to lured, which means they have to extend their body out over the water to lured, reach around the shroud and hold the jib out. And then within seconds, the boat goes to a wing. they got to zip across, you know, jam the wing. Does the skipper hold the jib sheet in the wing still? Yeah, I think that's pretty standard is to uh, the skipper kind of takes ownership of the, uh, the jib and then the crew is kind of in charge of the main. Oh, mm. little play switch up here. Looks like 12 has managed to get themselves into the two. Um, I think uh, Brown's still in control here, but something's changed up. Always a boat you can't see on the screen that you wonder. <laughs> Is Brown getting into, sorry, no, Coast Guard maybe getting into a 2-3? Well, we know that Brown still has the 1. They're in Mark 2. They're in the zone of Mark 3. So they own the zone. But I agree, uh, Coast Guard's whittled into the 2-3. Now they just have to... 2-3-4? Th I see a hand up. Ooh, possibly a two, three, four. Wouldn't that be nice sailing at the end of that run? Oh, are they locked together? Oh, the boats are locked together. Uh, all three oh. teammates locked all up. All three teammates locked up. Oh, Coast Guard, they were looking so nightmare. good that day. That's a nightmare scenario. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not laughing at anybody. We've all been there, but. That's oh a, that's man! A big, that's, a, that's oops. <laughs> that is an oops. That's a big oops. They did everything perfect into that point. Yeah. Oh, um, that's well, a real. It underscores though the power of the one getting to Mark Three zone first. When you get to that zone first, Jack, you can just stop the race, and it's really difficult for the boats behind to 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 navigate their way through there. Uh, so that's the power of the zone at Mark Three. That's the that's the tipping point of most close team races. I think there might be a uh, mm. heated discussion post race about that incident. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, Brown in the, in, comfortably in the one, two, three, coming out of that situation. Um, I'm not going to say they got lucky there because the one, Oof. two got broken up, but uh, turned out all right for them. You're the coach of the Coast Guard Academy, Jack. How do you play that when your sailors get ashore? What's your style? Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. So you can see oh. the 11. The 11 had to jibe to keep clear of the 9, and their teammate 12 was just crowding them there. They just, yeah. They didn't give 11 room to, to wiggle and waggle. And rail locked, you know, teed up and just... Not, not that big of a crunch, but uh, just rail locked. Yeah. All right, so you're the coach of the Coast Guard Academy. Your, your sailors are going to come ashore. How do you play it? What would be your body language? What would be, would you talk first? Talk, talk me through it. I know you're not a coach, uh, but what would you do as a coach? I think, I'm thinking, you know, at this point for Coast Guard, I, I don't know the latest scores. I think they're trying to, not quite making the top four so each race is is, is a learning moment and uh i would say you know guys good good effort you know whoops mark three never do that again in your life uh but lots of good things up until that point so you know a little bit of a uh uh what do they call it a feedback sandwich you know sprinkle <laughs> in the uh the mistake in the middle but uh keep the chin up because you know there's more racing to go here and uh it, you know this might be some of the last racing for some of these seniors yeah. at coast guard so yeah. you know chin up keep going well i was talking to one of the coast guard coaches this morning and they said that um traditionally they've been the coast guard is twice quite strong in fleet racing but it hasn't been as strong the team racing so they're they've been really focusing on that and they were super excited to make the top eight kudos to them that's a program on the rise and as you say uh as we all know you, 
The lessons you learn when things don't go well are the ones you never forget. That yeah, that is something. Uh, and unfortunately, caught on film, <laughs> yeah. uh, that well, may haunt you for a while. So, uh, but we've all been there. Yeah, we've certainly all have. been there. Certainly have. We've all been there. Um, but uh, yeah, you just continue to learn on. Um, it looks like. Honestly, boat 10. He's got a little bit back in this face here. Uh, I yeah. think it's still going to be a... Yeah. It's a 2-3-4. A race win for Brown, but uh, still uh, lots of action at the finish line there. Are you guys good? Going back to what a coach would do in that situation, if I was coaching, I would just be there, ready to catch their boat, I might even have a smile on my face, and I would just let them talk. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing to add there as a coach. Nothing thinks. to add on that one. They know what they did. Let them talk. Let them work it out. You know, if they ever come to you and say, what should we have done different, then I might be ready to say something. But that one is... Let that on them. <laughs> let them. Let them live that one. Let's let forget that one. Uh, so, Dave, w what races we got coming up? Big okay. races coming well, up. Okay. Here we go, and um, we're waiting for our uh, our studio to give us the updated scores. Uh, be, be good to know that we have two full flights of races left. That's three and three six, and then we have a race. The last race, Stanford and Harvard. So seven races to go. In this flight, we got St. Mary's against Dartmouth. My guess is those are big races for the top four, uh, followed by Harvard, Roger Williams. And Roger Williams has certainly been strong today. And then Yale, Stanford. So that's what we got coming up in this flight. Those are some great races going head to head. And uh, the, uh, the Stanford race is going to be important for the winning the regatta. And the other races are going to be important for the, getting the top four. I think we are going to be seeing the start of this replay of race 145. But uh, here's a little recap. Brown versus Coast Guard. Uh, downwind, excellent job from Coast Guard here, getting themselves back in the well, race. Well, let's not forget, Brown rounded Mark 2, 1-2 in this race. Yeah. If I, if I have this correct. Look at the crews working there on their side. So Coast Guard did a great job of prying up the 1-2, of, of getting back into it, and... Yeah, it's got a little messy there at Mark 3. I'm surprised. They got themselves back in on that last upwind. Well, they we sure were, did. We were talking about learning from mistakes. Yep. This is this is the finish line. It looks like 10 almost. Well, I mean, the good news is 10 came through, probably won the race, but it's still a team race. You know, yeah. it's still, you're not interested in first. You're interested in winning the race. So, um, you know, kudos to Coast Guard for not giving up. Yeah. After that, keeping in it. Kudos to them, and they're a program on the rise, and um, can't wait to see what they do in the future. So, we are going to be watching the start of uh, race 145, which is uh, the Seahawks, St. Mary's, in, uh, in 1, 2, 3, uh, in black, and then uh, Dartmouth, 16, 17, 18, in uh, that grayish light blue. Um, I, I think we're coming up about 1.30 here. These races are, are big ones. They're, they're all big ones. They always say in a basketball game, you know, it's not the last shot that wins or loses it. It was the, you know, the 14th shot of the second quarter. But it's the small wins. Every win costs the same. Every win costs. But now these are, now these really matter. Yeah, they so do. <laughs> these are glaring. So, uh, again, I think St. Mary's and Dartmouth might be in a battle for fourth. I think Dartmouth is looking to really... Uh, win this race to try and get through. Yeah, I agree. I, I Without seeing the score, St. Mary's was fairly far back to start the day, so. Yeah, what I'm seeing on the latest on tech score is uh, it's, a, it's a tie for uh, third at the moment. It's 14 and six, Yale, Dartmouth, Roger Williams, and then uh, so we'll see how that shakes out. One of those teams ain't gonna, isn't going to make it. So everyone well, matters was, here. That was 3 4 5. Was Yale, Dartmouth, Roger three, Williams? 3 4 5. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, here we go to the start. Um, right. So there's a must win race for Dartmouth. Yes. Quite stacked up at the pin there. Dartmouth's in the blue, and St. And Mary's is in the black. 
Look again. Lots of boats going back. Yeah. We gotta clean that. Yeah. yeah. And boats spinning as well. Okay, Ooh. so those are those are just things which as a coach you tell your sailors, look, start the race. Don't be spinning. Don't be over, over the line early. Look at that. Both Dartmouth boats getting off the start line now. Oh, boy. That's, That's going to make it difficult. Uh, not Dartmouth impossible, but... Uh, coach's nightmare. Yeah. That's what we were talking about. Get off clean and equal. You can be slightly behind, but you can't be dusted. You know, my friend Gary Jobson used to say he commentated a lot of races. America's Cup and World Cup. And he used to say, you know, I've never lost a race from the coach boat. It's easy for us to be up here and, and say that. Yeah. Uh, and it is easy to say. It bodes, it being over early is, that's something in a team race that you shouldn't be doing, shouldn't be spinning. And it's costly. So It's it's one of those things that you get in a little funk in one of those regattas where mm. even when you tell yourself, don't be over, don't be over, mm. it, it may just make you be over more, you know? Maybe. <laughs> okay, here's the latest and, and greatest. Dave, you want to walk us through here? Oh, here we go. So, current standings, round of eight. So, so Harvard has the one one race lead, but they're racing Stanford in the last race of this round robin. So, uh, if Stanford wins that race, the two will be tied going into the round of four. If Harvard wins it, they'll have a two-point lead going to the final four. That'll be huge. Yale, Dartmouth, and Roger Williams. And Brown's right there, too. So they're ba they're battling to be in the top four. It's going to be a stretch for them to come out and and win, but anything can happen. But a uh, lot to play for here. Five of the eight teams are in contention to be in the top four here. And I think we uh, just need to reference the latest on Tech Score um, as this you know is evolving. Yes. I think defer to what is online. I know that those top two players. That seems correct, and not going to say it yet, but almost a two-horse race. Um, but uh, those those people fighting for third and four, I think it may be just a little closer than we think. But okay. uh, checking in here with the racing, looks like a strong one, two, three for St. Mary's here at the moment. Well, that's... Uh a tough pill for Dartmouth, but, uh, you know, Pearson said it yesterday. I said it earlier, repeating Pearson, you can't win a team race off the starting line, but you can lose it. And I'm afraid to say my friends from the big green. How can you have a color as a mascot? Come on, the Cardinal, what's that? Yeah. The big green, what's that? How about the camels? That's probably the best mascot. Yeah, of all. So, uh, you know, Con College. That's got to be the College. Best. The camels. Oh, we were talking about the love to be the camels. The Purdue Boilermakers. The Boilermakers. Yeah, that's know? a mascot for you. That's you a know? real mascot. You know, it's it's not offending anybody. It's not. Well, I'm not even sure what a Boilermaker is. Do you? What is a Boilermaker? No idea. Uh, <laughs> no idea. But you know, it's, it's like, come on, you got. You go talk to you're a Stanford alum. You 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 got you got you got power. You give it a money. <laughs> See if they can come up with a, a, an animal or something. Seahawks, I love that. Seahawks. That's a real real nautical a great uh, nautical mascot. Great you know, mascot. the monarchs. You know, yeah. Some great ones out there. So it looks like the the Seahawks have got this a little under control at the moment. The uh, boat 17 looks fast, but uh, yeah. I, I think this is going to be a stretch for them to break up. Well, listen, you never give up, first of all. That's step one. You never give up. Anything could happen. You know, Tiller could break. You just don't know what could happen. A, a Seahawk could come out of the ocean and swallow it. Um, you know, boats could capsize. I mean, you know, it's not likely, but things can happen. So you never give up. And if you're the three, you just got to go fast, catch every wave, try to be in the most pressure. You just do everything right. This camera angle shows 17 moving up on two. Of course, it's a bit of an illusion because two is probably lured. But that's what 17 is hoping is they catch a couple waves. Hard to tell until they reach the mark, huh, Dave? And uh, I think we're going to go to Gloria here, who's uh, on the water. Yeah, hey, everybody. everybody. I, I don't know why I couldn't say everybody there, but uh, thanks for having me. Here's what I saw. And here's my big, biggest take 
I am stuttering. Sorry, guys. Here's my biggest takeaway. Rule number one and key to success with team racing, get off the starting line, right? Your race is gonna be a lot harder if you don't. But I'll tell you what, St. Mary's is gonna definitely have a fight here. They've got superstars Maddie Hawkins and Ashling Sullivan and Boyd Bragg and Drew Clutterbuck right behind them and uh, putting pedal to the metal on this downwind. With these waves, it's so easy to just do a real quick pump, pump, right? on a wave or a two, and you can really launch yourself ahead of the opponents. And we see that right now. Yeah, looks like, uh... oh, this is uh, Dartmouth maybe getting back in this race here. They've got a, uh, they've got the two, so not a great combination, but, uh... It's at least something here. Well, like we were talking about, 17 did their job. They had to catch, they had to pass the two. They did that. Box number one checked. Now the their teammates in five, six have to work together to pass the four. Now that's the two V one in the back of the pack there. And they've got to combine, they got you know, downwind on the reach, they go high, low, upwind, they split. Meanwhile, the two has to do their best to delay the three. So that's the good news. Uh, so there's 17 on three doing their job. That's the two against the three. And boat one just making it difficult. Right, for so the boat 16 five. is going to attack. So here comes a split. So the five just has to be annoying and, and make it hard for the four. Maybe do a bunch of attacks, get an attacking duel, drag them the wrong way. If you know the one way is the way to go, go the other way. Meanwhile, up top, the the black two and three are, are in a one three. They're trying to convert play one, so that's the that's that's the drama up there. Is that the um, the the boat in second is going to have you know somebody two t two teammates two opponents trying to get them? So the the black number two three are trying to convert the one two and make that happen. The uh, the, the black one, if you will, the, 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 the third place. Um, it's just getting strong on the right there. You know, that's, this is looking tricky for Dartmouth, not going to lie. Um, we'll see how it shakes out, but uh, it looks like St. Mary's has got that uh, that right locked on. And uh, it looks like 2-3 has also made this conversion happen here. So we will see when they boats come back together, but I say advantage Seahawks. Yeah. attacking jewel here just going back and forth well that's what he has to do he's got to delay the one and hope that his teammate can pass see the one's got to be you know you got to play a dance here you can't just put your head down and go tack for tack though the boat one's teammate is winning the race so boat one's job is just keep the 18. keep keep Yeah, so what I'm seeing here is Leo Boucher and Ellie Sikowski from St. Mary's did a great job there of not panicking in that tacking duel. Oftentimes you'll see boats go tack for tack right off the bat and they'll push themselves back, but they forget that the leading boat, they, they have a relatively larger uh, bat air, you know, range or coverage zone rather. So Leo Boucher did a good job of not getting sucked back into that. But I'll tell you what, Boyd Bragg is super fast from Dartmouth with Drew Clutterbuck. And the two of them are definitely starting to make, make their waves back up to Leo. Uh, this, unfortunately for Dartmouth, looks like St. Mary's is just securing a 1-3 here. And that is confirmed. Yeah, that looked like a uh, little bit of an easy race for St. Mary's post uh, post Mark IV. Um, we see again, it's just hard to break up those one twos. Um, and then uh, the Dartmouth post just uh, 
finishing it across the finish line there. So uh, a couple interesting races on the course right now. I know that uh, Harvard Roger Williams is going on, and then in the pre-start uh, we have Stanford Yale. So end of the round robin when things are getting spicy out here. Uh, some big races, and important races because when it comes head to head, these tiebreakers are going to make a big impact here. Here's a quick glimpse of the uh, Roger Williams Harvard race. Um, looks like. Oh, it's so hard to tell. Looks like Roger Williams has the one. So they'll be thinking about a play four here, but maybe we can uh, see that out of the corner of our eye. So it looks like we're picking up the Harvard Roger Williams race here. And uh, Roger Williams is in the orange boats. Harvard's in the green boats. And they look like they're headed up the final beat. Maybe a one, five, six, four, six for Roger Williams. Tight uh, racing here. Yeah, I'd say it's a, it's a, yeah. It looks like a strong two, three, four put the other way around. Strong two three four for Harvard, which is, I've been told, is the strongest combination. Is this the hardest nut to crack? Is a two three four. One thing we're seeing here, Jack, you can't really see on the screen. We see the four boats going hard left, but there's a pair out here on the right. But again, the Harvard boat, uh, there's a Harvard boat doing a good job of balancing to make sure that the the uh, Roger Williams boat can't get a big righty out here. Yeah, and we'll keep you posted about how that finishes up, but I think we're going to look at the pre-start here. Stanford versus Yale. Uh, two teams looking to be in the top four here. Um, you know, you got uh, Stanford in red in their home color, 7, 8, 9, and Yale in blue in their home go. color, 10, 11, go. 12. There's the start. Wow, good start, the boat there. Yeah, that's called winning the boat. So what you're gonna, you'll see. Uh, um, yeah, look at that. So good balance there. Uh, Stanford is winning the pair going to the right. Uh, Yale's mm. winning the middle pair. The boat that started at the boat, and it's a little tough to see out there on the left how that's going. But it looks like a good team race. It looks like a good start there. You know, everyone off clean. Uh, pairs switching back and forth. You can see that uh, the boat pair picked up the middle person uh, and then a little switching to uh, assert your dominance on, uh, on, uh, on, on the person you're ahead of. I tell you, with Harvard winning their race against Roger Williams, this is a must-win race for Stanford. They can't afford to lose this race as much as I want Yale to win it, but of course I'm a commentator, so I'm absolutely neutral. Yeah, it looks like a 156 in the Roger Williams Harvard race. Yeah, so I think Harvard's going to get that win. So uh, this is it's critical for Stanford to, to not let Harvard, and not it's not a fatal because they're going to see each other in, in a couple races. But I think boat number eight for Stanford on the right looks pretty strong there, Dave. Maybe uh, in a one position, but hard to tell if there's a little right shift coming in. Well, first of all, they're only halfway up the beat, and it is shifty. That's that's one thing for sure. And, and you can even see some some of the camera angles. You'll see darker water. Uh, darker water is more wind, and it usually means it's a change in direction. So uh, it's a great day for team racing, Jack. I mean, this is what you'd want. It's you know? awesome. Yeah. Crews out hiking. The boats are surfing, almost planing. Sometimes it's windy, shifty, puffy, pretty flat water. So. It's going to come down, and the boats are all great, so it's going to come down to the sailors, and that's what you want. So. All right, well, Yale's looking, from this camera angle, like a pretty strong play, too, here. Yeah, I agree. I think if the boat eight, just get to the top mark in the one. I mean, you're most useful for a team in the one here. Um, it looks like Stanford boat eight has a pretty good lead here. Now, 
the right seems to be kind of paying off here, which is why I'm, you know, a little curious. Stanford boat nine is really sending it left here. Uh, Yale has a pretty strong two, three, four, but it looks like we've got potentially Vanessa in the eight. We know she's fast. We know she's talented. So we'll see what she's gonna be able to make happen here while we're just waiting for her teammates to catch up. Once again, I, you know, Dave and Jack, what do you guys think about, Stanford has made quite a big player change going into the top eight today. They're having a little bit of a rough time with their races. Do you think that go, if they go into the final four, we'll see a player change back? It's hard to say. I mean, yeah. it, it's up it's up to the coaches at the end of the day. We're not going to touch that one, Gloria. Yeah, that, is, that could be a touchy one. But, Thank you, uh, Gloria, but we're going to pass they, on that one. They've been uh, <laughs> battling back here, but uh, you're right. They, they haven't had as clean first-up wins, um, but... Uh, you know, there's there's lots of different factors at play, so uh, we will see what happens. I mean, one thing, and you guys, uh, Gloria and, and Jack and Pierce, were talking about yesterday. You were wondering, will any team go undefeated? And you all seem to agree that no team's going to go undefeated. That's just a a big ask in any event. Number one, number two, the conditions are very different today. So who's to say if they had kept the same players in from yesterday, it wouldn't be the same result today? So you can't second guess that. I don't think. I think. The players and the coaches have to make the best decisions uh, for the best personnel at the time, and then those personnel need to rise to the challenge. So that's what makes it a fun sport, and that's why sailing is so much more exciting and fun to play uh, from other sports because in tennis, the net is always the same height. In basketball, the rim's always the same height. and football, the, the sidelines are always the same. But in sailing, it's always different from day to day, race to race, leg to leg. Uh, so it makes it much more complicated to play and to make decision who goes out there. So don't want to second guess any decisions. Yeah, you can see boat seven really working on the boat speed here to just get back in the race. Uh, they're looking to catch up to uh, one of those Yale boats and uh, make a play happen. Yeah, well, we've talked about this. When you're in the two, three, four, you're just trying to keep that solid and... and when you're in the one, when your team's in the five, six, you just gotta keep the one, get down to mark three, and then compress. And you're gonna see that in a minute, boat eight. They'll go out on port tack, and then they'll come in on starboard and just stop the boat and try and, it's called compress the race, to try and slow the two, three, four down, to let the five, six catch up. And then the five, six have to work together to grab one of the boats ahead of them, you know, usually the five. So you can see boat eight setting the trap, once you get within two lengths of that mark, you've got superpowers. You basically own the zone and no boat's allowed to go inside of you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it, there was, leading up to mark three, it definitely got pretty, pretty light here. Um, and in terms of the players, you know, I, I get what you guys are saying. It, it absolutely is a coach's decision. Sailing's all very different, but you know, we're just trying to keep it real on, on, on the air here, you know, let's, Let's make things spicy. Let's uh, let's explore all new options of commentary here. Uh, but I'm taking a look here. Boat eight is doing an excellent job up to mark four. But it looks like Yale still has a pretty strong two, three, four, potentially maybe snaking up a, a one here. And actually, I'm seeing a red flag for boat 10 from Yale. This is definitely going to stir things up here. Oh, that's a big game change. That is a big one there. So, ouch. And another red flag for 11. Oh, wow. For 11? Wow. This is swung in Stanford's direction very quickly here. Oh, boat eight also spinning. Ask Gloria that if she saw anything. That was two unfortunate red flags for Yale. Gloria, what, what happened there? I'll be honest, I think uh, boat 11 kind of took room that they didn't have on boat eight. For boat 10, I'm not even sure. We might have to take a look at a replay for that, but I'll tell you what, 
those two red flags from the umpires for Yale is definitely going to change the standings of this race. Gloria? Oh, I can't, Gloria yep, can't hello? Hear me. Yeah, Jack's, Jack's starting to hit me here. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just happy. I'm happy that was uh, <laughs> two red flags against uh, Yale versus Stanford. I've I've been I'm in. Trying the, to uh, remain. I'm trying to remain professional here, Gloria. Uh, I've been in the opposite <laughs> position quite a few times. I'm uh, trying to remain professional, but <laughs> I want to see a replay. Hey, you know what, what happened? <laughs> you can't. You can't help it sometimes. You know. I mean, Dave, ja Jack's a newly grad, and he's he's. It's it's hard to be unbiased here, you know, and. It's one of those races. It's this race means a lot to Stanford. I mean, this is going to change the game for them. Ooh. Ooh. A nice dial down there from boat seven. I mean, Stanford is now not just trying to hold on to the one, two, three. They're trying to lock that bad boy down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. We, I, I, I hope our, our colleagues in the booth can go back and find the moment when uh, when 10 did something to have to spin, and then 11, and it seemed like 8 was spinning also. So there was a lot of action between Mark 3 and 4 that uh, would be fun to unearth if we could. Double red flag. It's always tough, huh? Oof. I can make or break your game. You know, that that's one tough thing is, like, when you're winning a race, Yale had that 2-3-4. Hold that 2-3-4. And here we might see another protest situation between 12 and 8. Desperation play there, looks like. Yeah. Right. Even then, Bo 9 from Stanford looks like they would have the 2, even if 8 gets flagged. Wow. Who's it on? Green flag. Wow, what a win for the Cardinal. Red flag on 12 to close it out as well. Gloria, can you hear me? Yes. Is there any way for you to go over to the umpires and ask them and interview them and ask them what happened and we could hear it live? Let's go and uh, test it out. One moment, folks. So that was an exciting one. Well, I don't. Uh, what was exciting about it, Jack? Well, what, what do you think of the umpire calls? I mean, uh, you didn't get to see them, but you certainly can't blame it on the umpires. They're just the, the policemen of the game. I'm not blaming it on the umpires at all. When I was in fourth grade, my athletic director said the referees are always right. Always. No, no matter how wrong they are. But I'm not even suggesting the umpires are wrong. No, of course Don't even not. get me started on that. I'd just be curious to know what the calls were. Really yeah. What happened. Absolutely. Um, and it, it, it's what's noticeable is when you get into the top eight, final four, the umpires become even more important because you get less of those blowout races, you know, less of the one, two, threes and races over. It, it becomes these tougher combinations. You know? Well, and I'll, I'll tell you, I know almost all the umpires here, and this is a top drawer group of umpires. This is a national championship level, and there are some very experienced. They've seen a lot of team racing. They, they, they know what's going to happen. They take care of it. And uh, so all kudos to them. And over to the umpires who are going to walk us through what happened there. All right, once we get everybody back in the box here, we'll get this one fired off. Awesome. So I'm here with Rob Overton and Kelsey Wheeler, our umpires from that race. Rob's going to kind of walk us through what went down uh, around Mark 4 there. Rob? The end on the reach, there was, uh, they were coming in fast at the mark, yep. planing away, and the uh, second place boat planed in, got an overlap late, so that the first place boat uh, had mark was entitled to mark room, and then they came in inside of them, and when they when the uh, first place boat went around the mark, the uh, the uh, second place boat didn't give them enough room to turn. Yep. And so they hit right on the corner, the outside, the starboard quarter of the lead boat and the, and the second place boat. And so we, our decision was that the second place boat did not give them mark room and that therefore uh, they should be penalized. And they didn't turn, so we penalized. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for doing the Lord's work out here on the water. 
Um, you Gloria? guys heard it here, folks. Gloria, can you hear me? Yes, Dave. I think there was a second red flag, if you don't mind. Oh, we're seeing a little replay here. This is uh, right. the replay of the full race. Do you guys know what the second red flag was for? Or that might have been the other umpire boat. That was the other umpire The boat. other umpire boat. It was a luff boat. boat. Oh, the leeward boat was... Um, the windward boat was way bow out on the leeward boat. The leeward boat luffed. And there's no opportunity for the windward boat to keep clear, right. so the we uh, so the leeward boat was penalized. It was contact. Incredible! Like I said, thank you guys yep. so much for doing the work out there, and uh, we don't know what we do without you guys. Yep. So thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be sure to point out those two incidents uh, in a little bit. But uh, yeah, wow, uh, coming to the end of here of the top eight. Well, let's just go back for one second. Let's just underscore the importance of having good umpires uh, at a national championship. Uh, before umpiring, those would go to protest hearings. It was just terrible. I'm old enough to remember that in, in team racing and match racing. So um, it's great they're there, uh, and they do make the right calls. They see it. They have a great perspective. Usually one sailor or another sailor makes an error in judgment, and the umpires are there to uh, uh, take care of it. So really strong shout-out to the umpires uh, this is a true national championship because they're out there keeping everybody playing by the rules. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, look at this. Uh, Stanford. <laughs> Stanford, that was a, a breathe out for the Stanford coaching staff. Uh, they kept their, their uh, you know, it's going to come down to the last race between Stanford and Harvard to see who goes in, what the scores are going in the final four. And, of course, the race is not the regatta is not going to be decided at the end of the round of eight, which is something which we we all love. Yeah, um, and we got some great tie breaks here. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure the details behind these, but uh, those three uh, Yale Roger Williams Dartmouth all tied going in uh, to what this is the last uh, rotation of the round of eight. Um, I don't see any of these teams going head to head here, so. Uh, I think it's just going to be a, uh, a game of plugging in some wins and uh, seeing how the tie breaks shake out. Well, listen, this last flight, we got Dartmouth against Brown. So if Brown wins, they go to 14. <laughs> yep. Um, and then we've got Yale against St. Mary's. So it's a, it's a must win for Yale to, to move to 15. Um, and, uh, of course, if Dartmouth wins, they go to 15. And uh, Roger Williams is, uh, they're done. Uh, no, and they're racing the Coast Guard Academy. Yeah. So a lot of big ones. A lot of big ones. So we're looking at uh, Dartmouth in 1, 2, 3 versus Brown in 17, hey, 16, this is a big 17, one. 18. These are all must-win races for these teams. What fun. A little bit of a cleaner start that day, huh? Well, I think they're watching, and I'm sure their coaches have reminded them, look, let's... Stay behind that line yeah. <laughs> when it says it's time to go. Okay, so here we go. So we've got um, Dartmouth in the black boats and Brown in the blue boats. A must-win race for both these teams to have any chance to be top four here. Looking pretty square off the start line here. I think probably 18 is a little bit advanced on that left side, but... Uh, Boat, boat one in a good position. This is uh, just a classic drag race right here. Yeah. You know, everyone's okay in their lane, and they're just focusing on the fleet racing. Jack, these 420s, do they have a traveler? Do they have a bridle? Is it a fixed main sheet system? Yeah, so it's a, it's a fixed main sheet system, but uh, this variant of the 420, this is the E420 from Zim. Um, it's the uh, the boat of choice at the moment for most of the college teams, mm -hmm. and it is similar to your Club 420, but it is uh, it is really streamlined and uh, a little bit more high performance. It's it's got uh, a, the bulkhead sealed off. It's a little lighter in design, and it's a real sporty boat. Um, you can see these get planing and. You know, in combination for obviously being built for speed, as you noted before, they're super durable because incidents do happen in this sport where there's a little bit of a bumper cart. Um, but yeah, fixed main sheet, two uh, two good hiking straps, and uh, you know, obviously the jib 
with some inboard leads. Does the skipper have their hand on the Vang? Is the Vang something you're playing in this kind of condition? Yeah, absolutely. The Vang is uh, led to the side tank, so it's, yeah. it's right there by your by your knees for the skipper. Yep. And uh, it's the crew's role for the rest of the controls, so the outhaul and the Cunningham. But it, it's super convenient to have it right there. So as a helm, you're focusing on steering, the main sheet, and the Vang. And, and the crew is everything else. In the puffs, if you're flat out hike, are you Vang sheeting? Are you are you really pulling the Vang as hard as you can? Or yeah, so it's it's a combination of a couple different things. You know, main sheet trim. Sometimes it makes sense to steer through the puffs. Uh, other times it makes sense to play the main sheet. Yeah. And just depending on the day, you know, if it's slightly flatter, you can maybe do a bit more steering. But we've seen some chop out there, so mm -hmm. I'm sure they're getting pretty active on that main sheet. Yeah. And are the crews, are you windward sheeting in this configuration, in this much breeze? The yeah, jibs? so I like to think the windward sheet as, the, and for those who don't know, your primary jib sheet is your lower sheet. And you have the option to pull on the other one to change the uh, the shape of the, uh, of the jib. And putting on that windward sheet is kind of like hitting a little bit of the boost in mm -hmm. this condition where you need to be going fast and if you just want to get a little bit more height you just put like a little fistful on and it can uh, kind of improve the uh, the shape of the jib yeah subtle little things isn't it all right well here we go we've got uh brown in the uh, gray sails i said light blue before but they're gray but you can't really tell the difference right here and then the black is dartmouth so and remind your viewers, if you just joined us, this is a must-win race for both teams to keep their hopes alive to make it in the top four, the round of four, which will be coming up uh, later on today. So what do we got? We got the black team. We got uh, Dartmouth one, four, in the five. one. Looks like a one four five to me, Dave. Oh, oh, I don't know. It's going to change. Too soon. <laughs> it's going to change. Gloria, what are you seeing out there? From Brown is doing a pretty good job at spacing back the one. William from Dartmouth, and I believe Reese Bragg. Um, but I'll tell you what, Maddie Hawkins and Ashley Sullivan and Boat 2 from Dartmouth are doing an excellent job slowing 18 right up until now, a potential protest situation between 17. So now we're seeing a spin from Maddie Hawkins, which I'm, oh, interesting. So it looks like boat one from Dartmouth is spinning. They're gonna have a deep six now, and it's no regular spin, it's a red flag spin. Mm. Strong th two, three, four there then for Brown, it looks like. So Jack, we're seeing, we're seeing more spins out there than I think you would wanna see at this level. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that uh, a spin really hurts. It does. You know, and a double spin doubly hurts. So now boat three, all the pressure's on the uh, lead boat in uh, Dartmouth. Uh, boat number three has the one. They're being chased by a two, three, four, so broken record. They need to get to the zone of mark three, which is two lengths away from the mark. They need to get there first. They need to slow down and compress the race as much as they can. We saw what happened <laughs> in a previous race when the one compressed so much it caused the other boats to run into each other. Yeah. So that's the job of the one is keep the one at all costs at this point. Um, I'm not sophisticated to know when the one gives up the one. Um, so, Dave, one thing that uh, communication can come in here is in a 2-3-4, we like to verbally, well, we used to, assign roles. So... I'd say 17 is what you would call the pusher here. And their goal is to get the one round the mark, no mm. matter what. Boat 18 is on cleanup duty, where it's their job to uh, make sure that there is potentially a little gap and everything's just spaced out nicely. Yep. And verbally calling out these play, like roles going into the mark, yeah. I think it's something that's super valuable. Yeah, so that's so sophisticated and so important. And it's... Listen, if, if you're a fleet racer or somebody who doesn't know much about team racing, you're really getting some great stuff from Jack Park and, and Gloria on the uh, intricacies of team racing. It's, it's such a subtle game. It looks like the one may have made a mistake here and given up the one. No, they didn't. Okay. Ooh, do they pop that mark? But there's so many subtleties to it. It's such a fun game to play. 
So now the, the boat number three has the one. They just need to keep the one, and they're probably wishing that the boat lured them in a bow out like that. So if they can get bow out on number seven, they'd be stronger. But really, the heroes have to be the five, six. Well, boy, the six is pretty deep. The five has just got to engage the four. To engage the four. See boat 16 here just yeah. doing a little bit of a slow on boat two yeah. at Dartmouth. Just Both. getting their teammate 18 a little stronger. Yeah. Okay, 18's out. See both boats go. Yeah, so boat two's trying to trap 18, but boat 16, the teammates, making that hard by coming down. I'm guessing the pair we're watching here, the lure boat does not have luffing rights. <clears throat> In other words, they came in from clear astern at some point. So Rule 17 requires them to sail no higher than their proper course. That's why you're not seeing them luff. But once you get bow out, then you do what's called high mode, which you just sail a little inside your jib. You can still, that's still your proper course at that point marginally, but the umpires would give it to you if, as long as you didn't luff. And now they finally, so now both three is, you know, so really suddenly um, Dartmouth is in play two, but they don't have a great setup for it. Yeah, Dave, it's it's a tricky one when you are originally going to play two and you take the lead, uh, as uh, Boat 17 did on the right there. It, it, you got to make sure your teammates are on the same page there because the play has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and often you're far enough up the course where you, you don't necessarily know that your teammate's taking the one. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how those two boats, 17 and 3, react here. Yeah. Well, Jack, I think that's a really great point that you made there about a play two and communication between teammates there. You know, boat two earlier on on this leg from Dartmouth probably could have gone back on boat 16 from Brown, right? And boat three could have went down on boat 18 from Brown. And a big thing we see in team racing is people executing the the new plays way too late. And I think this might be one of those instances for Dartmouth where they could have gone to play two, maybe one fourth ways up the leg. And now we're coming up to the finish line here. And since nothing was, no change was made early on enough, Brown has finished in a one, two. Wow. So unofficially, Brown goes to 14 wins. This is all unofficial. Dartmouth's on 14. Yale's on 14. And Roger Williams is on 14. So that's for three, four, five, six. Uh, Stanford and Harvard will be one and two coming out of this round robin. That can't be changed. But the battle for the top four is four boats for two spots. Yeah, it's getting close up there for sure. And I know that uh, kind of on deck here, I think we got that uh, Stanford-Harvard race in the pre-stop. But let's have a look, quick replay here. So here comes... Uh, the Browns got the one there. I guess uh, Dartmouth had the one down the lane. Uh, Dartmouth had the one. Dartmouth held the one all the way to uh, Mark three, but in hindsight, maybe didn't have the most heroic trap they could have had. They kind of get themselves coming in on port. You can see them. They're coming in on port there, so they didn't, they didn't, couldn't really compress uh, as much as they probably would have liked to. Then, uh, yeah, so you can see uh, they held the one around the corner, but they weren't quite bow enough advanced to be able to turn out the lights of number seven. Seven had clear air there. Looks like both three got pretty close to those, uh, that bottom mark, but. <laughs> well, they're pushing it. Yeah, uh, the umpires are right there. Great crew work. Look at that. Yeah. Come out of the boat, tack, boats are upright. The crews know just how much to ease the jib, just when to trim it. They make it look so effortless. Easy. Which is the biggest compliment you can ever give to an athlete. 
You know, Absolutely. Any athlete that's good, they just make it look so easy. When you uh, when I go and try it, it's like. Yeah, and one thing that is really easy, uh, we have to give a quick shout out to Coral Reef Sailing. Uh, they designed the the logo behind us, and uh, they have kitted out uh, much of the uh, team here. I think you know Dave's hat, and they uh, they have uh, you know great T-shirts, uh, tech apparel, and uh, sweatshirts. And they make really high quality stuff, uh, custom logos for this regatta. They have been a huge uh, help for us and a, a really key sponsor here. They have a great website. Go check it out for any of the uh, college sailing, uh, you know, t-shirts and uh, various different uh, items. And uh, you can get that, uh, that, that great uh, uh, New York skyline on your t-shirt. So a uh, huge shout out to them. Make sure to go uh, visit them on their website. But uh, I think we're going to flick over and uh, have a look at, uh, is it the, the Harvard-Stanford race, which is ongoing, or who's just started out here? Uh, it would be Yale-St. Mary's would be the next one. Yale-St. Mary's. It's off screen right now, but I just noticed that the U.S. Coast Guard Academy just defeated Roger Williams. So Roger Williams will stay on 14. They'll stay in that four-way tie wow. for three, four, five, six. And good on the Coast Guard Academy. That's their last race. They're on Robin. They finished strong, which is what any team should do. And uh, Jack, why don't you wrap it up here? Yeah, we're going to go to uh, just a quick break here. Um, before we go back to the coverage, just a quick 30-second break. So everyone at home, feel free to stretch your legs. We are back. We are looking at race 150. It's uh, the Yale Bulldogs in uh, 789. That's in the Red Boats. First is uh, the St. Mary Seahawks in 10, 11, 12. Uh, just quickly catching up here. Looks like uh, St. Mary in either the 146 or s some variant of that combination. Well, St. Mary's could play the spoiler here. Um, I don't think they have enough uh, legs to get into the top four, but uh, Yale needs this win to to uh, take a step above the fray. There are four teams currently on 14 points for places three, four, five, six. Uh, Yale being one of them. If Yale can win this race, they go to 15, which will um, which would give them a little bit of a, a you know, a little more solid chance to get in the top four. Looks like St. Mary's has a 1-4-5 combination here. And I'm seeing something that you don't see very often, but it looks like uh, maybe Yale's going for the chase here. Well, Yale's in the 2-3, correct? The 2-3, but it looks like they're playing forward. So this is a something that you sometimes see is when you have that deep six you play forwards and try and get the one two break up yeah it's a it's a different variant of this play and uh, the team teammates got to be uh, on the same page here but you can see boat nines grab the one and they'll be looking to convert into a uh, into a strong one two and maybe there maybe they just did it well listen uh, i do a lot of the adult team racing in keelboats and i race with my friend dave delenbaugh and one thing we always said is if we're in the two three at mark two about to go on the run if we're in the two three and the one's just ahead of us we'll play forward for the run at least the first part of the run because the two three can gang up on the one just the way you saw yale do there and if you can get the one 
one three turns into a one two, that's pretty good. But if we're getting down near mark three and we still don't have the one, then we'll convert back to playing back, play two. Yeah, so it looks like uh, St. Mary's has gotten back into the race. They had the two three, at least for a moment there. Uh, you'll see boat 11, he's gonna come get seven. Well, this is a great team race, Jack, uh, on the run. There's a lot of, remember, it's called the starboard card. If you're on starboard um, and the other boat's on port, they have to avoid you. So you're always trying to stay to, to the left of your opponent looking downwind so you can use that starboard advantage. Absolutely, Dave. And what I would love to see uh, 10, 11, 12 is just cycling the weak boat out right. So making sure that uh, the uh, the person who's maybe in the four position can get into uh, that uh, that starboard uh, downwind lay line. Well, I'd say right now uh, St. Mary's is looking very strong. They have the uh, the two, three, and I think the three is in charge of the four. So they have the yeah. So this is going to be. Uh, I think you're going to watch Watch boat number nine. is going to set the trap that we've talked about very often. They're going to try and get into the zone of Mark three. They're going to try and get on to starboard tack so they can compress the race. But uh, St. Mary's done a good job of... Here, here comes the moment right here, Jack. How will boat nine handle this? You see boat 12 going wide to try and break the trap. St. Mary's is going to come out of here in a strong 2-3-4. I think they've done a great job here, St. Mary's. Just I do too. And then the ten is going to take a little bite at uh, bite at seven there. Yep. yep. As you, so now it's going to come down to the 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 Yale team in one boat number nine has to keep the one. That's their job. Their life is simple. Keep the one. The five six for Yale have to gang up on the fourth place boat, the boat number ten from St. Mary's. And the way it's going to happen on the beat is the, the five, six are going to split. And, uh, ooh, careful, number nine. I hope you don't lose the one here. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so a, a common move if, if you're leading there in a one, five, six is you, uh, you, uh, you jive back at your opponent. And that's what he was looking to do, but both 12 expertly uh, sailed low to, uh, you know, it's like a game of chess. You do this, I do that. Well, St. Mary's doing great. You're going to see one of those Yale boats tack. There he goes right now. And now 10's, and so now they, there it is. I mean, St. Mary's has done this perfectly. 10 is on eight. And looks like St. Mary's has taken the one there. They've taken the one. I don't see. We always preach, don't take the one. Hold the two, three, four. But this this might no, play to they, their favor. I yeah. think they're poor. They had to duck. I was kind of surprised after boat 11 took the one and he come right back on the Yale guy and try and convert the 1-3 pass back. But St. Mary's looking very strong here. There's no way to sugarcoat that. Yeah, boat 11 just dropping down on that pair, making it uh, solidifying, making sure it's uh, all good. Ooh, that was interesting. So the Yale boat just lee bow the St. Mary's boat. I keep looking at the screen. I remember I can look up and see all the boats. So what are we coming out towards us here, Jack? We've got St. Mary's in strong control over a Yale boat. So they're winning that pair. But in the middle, I'm not so sh And then the St. Mary's is winning that pair going left. So, yeah. Yeah, I think boat 10 has got some uh, balancing to do here. You know, this right side has just got a little forwards on the uh, his other two teammates, so you'll see him clamp down. But uh, still looking pretty stable, I think, for the for St. Mary's here. Yeah. Um, it's, it's easy when things are spread out and you're leading. Yeah. See, they're not hiking as hard, that guy. Uh, no, they're so. in a light spot. You can see on the water, yeah. it's much lighter right there. A little puff coming down from the right here. But it's definitely a lighter spot. And uh, you said this before, Dave, but when it gets lighter, it becomes a little bit more efficient to uh, cover boats. You know, your yeah. wind shadow has just a bit more of a factor. So. Yeah. Boat 10 looking just to 
Yep. And a little bit more work here. Yeah. I think they're okay. Eight has a piece of 12. I don't know. But then look at those St. Mary's both coming to the left. I think St. Mary's is solid as a rock in this one. Yeah. And it almost looks like Tens picked up the lead here. Well, this is going to go to the tiebreak geniuses. If, it's, yeah. if it finishes like this. I think it's uh, we're going to have some uh, potential sale-offs coming up for the final four. Ah, somebody did tell me about that this morning, that the college sailing uses sale-offs to break ties. But uh, hang on, Dave. This race isn't quite over here yet. Yes, it is. I think that uh, 11's pinning 9. I think St. Mary's going to go 1-2 in this. 1-2 at the pin. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Hey, hey, kudos. Kudos to St. Mary's. Um, I'm a very good friend of their longtime coach, Adam Werblow, who does just an amazing, has done an amazing job, will continue to do an amazing job. Um, and uh, that's a great way to end. End strong. You always yeah, want to finish strong. 150, Dave. <laughs> So yeah, look at that. That's, that's a lot of racing. You know, that's a lot Two of racing. Two and a half days. It's a lot of race committee. There's a lot of umpiring. Never forget the volunteers. I have to say, it looks a little lighter out there. You're seeing a little bit less of these bigger puffs. And maybe the wind has gone uh, just a touch uh, to the right on us. So it might be a bit of this land effect, which is... Uh, Allowed the wind to get a little lighter. Yeah, well, absolutely. As it goes right, it's still in the easterly direction, a little more southeast when it comes over the land. But I'm much more fascinated by the scores. Yeah. And how it works. In my informal, okay, here we got a little replay. Little replay here first. This looks like. Uh, Yeah, so uh, this looks uh, looks like a it looks like a pretty simple two three uh, two three four balancing drill. Um, this is something that uh, you know a lot of these teams practice a lot. Go around a uh, imaginary course in a two three four and uh, sail it out. So uh, on deck here, I think we got the old last race of the top eight. And that's going to be. Uh, the Stanford Cardinals in one, two, three, and uh, the Harvard Crimson in uh, seven, uh, 16, 17, 18 in gray. So look at the scores up there at the moment. Um, I think uh, this is going to be an important one here for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, this is going to determine who's going to punch their way into uh, the final four with a slight advantage. I think in this case, Stanford is a race behind and uh, would love to win this one. Um, and if Harvard can uh, can win this race, they're going to be sitting a little easier going into uh, that final four. So both these teams are definitely uh, going to be moving on to the next round. But uh, this one is going to see who sets them up nicely. And folks, I think we're just going into three minutes here. So. Most, you know, they're going to look to start engaging the opponents at uh, the two-minute time. So right now, they're just going through their pre-start routine, thinking about the course. Obviously, some things have changed out there. So they're just uh, making sure they're ready to go. And then you'll see things pick up in the next minute as boats go uh, into match race mode. So yeah, one thing I would be curious to see is uh, how they uh, prioritize the course here. So we've seen a little right shift probably over the last hour, hour and a half. So I'd be keep able to keep an eye on that uh, right hand side of the course, maybe putting a little bit more importance on who can win the boat here. Um, 
Looks a little lighter. So I'm also curious to see uh, which each team has opted for in terms of skipper crew combinations. Hard to tell from uh, from our position in the booth. Well, and to add to that, the uh, current is still coming in, which means it's going right to left. So coming to the right side of the course would, I'm guessing, get you out of be a little less current. Though it's such a short course, it might not be a big factor. But that might add to the decision to go right. Minute 30 to go here. Uh, you can see that uh, the mat tracing has begun. Boat 3 and 17 going back and forth. And then uh, in the middle here, I think that's two, uh, 2 and 18 are the pair. Look at how distinct those three pairs are. Yeah, that's classic textbook team racing. And uh, again, going back to why mat racing is so important. If you're comfortable in pairs racing, mat racing, of course, is just two boats, one against one, then you're going to be much more of an assassin when it comes to executing your your one-on-one. -on -one. Dave, and one thing I want to point out here is that team, uh, one, two, three in black, um, they're all opted to push. So the Stanford teams are in the uh, the pushing role while uh, Harford was initially set up in most of the lead position. Well, of course, if you want to go right, then uh, going pushing would, would give you the right. And just a quick update for everyone. And in the top right of the screen, you can see the latest results uh, going into this race. So certainly a uh, point one here. Uh, approaching the final seconds before the gun. Uh, looking a little lighter out there. Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, Stanford was pushing. They tacked to so their bow out going to the right. But the Harvard boat who started to lure them, tacked to winter them, I think he's in a stronger position. So I'd say Harvard won the boat. And then it looks like two Stanford boats in the middle of the course, while two uh, Harvard boats on the right. So I think uh, whatever shift's going to come in here, it's going to be, uh, that's going to determine who's, who's, who's ahead. bit early to call any sort of play here or any kind of ranking. Um, they all look on very similar ladder runs here. As you'd expect from the top two teams in the regatta. Yeah, I'm taking a look at the teams right now and uh, we've got a Stanford boat leading out to the right hand side. Something that was a little bit dicey is both of those Stanford boats that started off in the middle ended up sending it left and allowed for the for the Harvard Crimson to duck them. So as you know, we say get ducked, get. But uh, right now it looks like they're actually looking pretty good coming out of the left. So this Sanford boat's kind of sailing on their own, sailing fast in their own breeze. And they look like they're getting up close to the way. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that is uh, quite a quite a lot of leverage there for boat one getting out to uh, this right-hand side of the course. I'm curious to see which side really pays off here. Um, it uh, looks like there's going to be some close crosses for boat two coming back across. And let's remind our viewers of the significance of this race. Going into this race, Harvard is on 19 wins and Stanford is on 18. So if Stanford were to win this race, the two teams would be tied going into the final four. If Harvard would win this, they would go in with a two-point advantage with just four more races to go in the regatta. So I would say this is a must-win race for your Cardinal. Yeah, I think uh, to keep fate in your own hands, I think you definitely want to win this one. But it's still pretty early on to call any sort of combination here. Um, I'd probably say uh, Stanford may have the left pair and maybe the middle pair. It's, it's, it's still pretty it's, early to tell. It's close. I can safely say that uh, I think Harvard has the one. Yeah, so Stanford's obviously playing back. So they've conceded the one. 
So now they're in play two, which means they're just trying to get all three black boats in two, three, four. That's what play two is. So here we go. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with uh, number one there. I think they may have made a mistake there, quite frankly. They, they didn't do a good job of teeing up the boat on port. And they end up having to cross them, which meant that they actually rounded the mark one behind. So Stanford's in a 235. Harvard's in a 146. So Stanford's job is to play two. They're trying to consolidate into the 234. Harvard's uh, the one keeps the one. So they just sail and keep the one. Not much for them to do. And the 46 try to combine at the back to turn that into a 4-5. But this race is far from over, Mr. Jack. It is very, very far from over. You can see uh, both uh, both pairs slowing there, so. Well, the one's just a spectator right now. Keep the one. My friend Carl Ziegler, about three lanes, maybe four or five mm -hmm. lanes ahead on the run. It's a little harder to keep the one the one. Basically, it's just to trust your your teammates to do the right thing. Looking lighter out there. Yeah, it's much lighter. So now the umpires are going to be watching for rocking. Uh, you can heal your boat to help it turn up. You can heal it to leeward, you can heal it to windward to help it turn down. But if you go to leeward and to windward <laughs> without changing course, that's rocking. And the umpires will, will flag you for that. So you have to be very, the crews have to be very careful not to over move their bodies. So let's go to Gloria. Yeah, I'm taking a look here and it is most certainly lightened up. Similar to, you know, it's 250. We may see it lighten it up and then come back up again. Uh, boat 17 from Harvard is doing a phenomenal job slowing in Stanford Cardinal here. And as it lightened up, the unfortunate thing is, is as everybody was rounding between marks one and two, there was that little bit of gust that kind of carried the first four boats across. And then, unfortunately, for five and six, fifth and sixth place boats, they kind of got caught behind in the lull. And now there's a way bigger gap between them and the rest of the boats. Yeah, it looks like boat uh, two and three from Stanford are looking to slow 18 here. So it's just so much fun to watch them use the rules, Jack. Uh, that starboard card is the controlling card, the boat on starboard. So you can see boat number 17 staying to the left of their opponent. And then at any time they need to come back, they just jive back onto starboard. So uh, that's the power of the starboard card. Looks like boat 18 has got a little bit, uh, managed to get through here, but those uh, two, three from, uh, from Stanford. Okay, but does Harvard have the one, two here? Could be close. Yeah. I think Harvard has the one two. If you exit mark three in the one two, I bet you it's close to ninety percent of the time you win the race. Boat number eighteen has to be careful. They're a winner boat, they need to keep clear. But they did they did exit in the one two, so Harvard is on their way to notching their 20th win and to going into the final four with a two-race lead over Stanford. Stanford needs to pull a big one out of the hat here. It's, uh, you'll see boat 16 is leading the race. They'll attack first. There they go. They will stay on... 
Boat number three from Stanford. Boat, boat 18 will cover two. There's perfect zone covers there. At any time, boat 18 could drop down on boat two and slow them down more. And, you know, teammates work together. That's the beauty of team racing. It's, it doesn't matter who finishes what, <laughs> as long as the team wins the race. Yeah, it looks like uh, Harvard's in a comfortable one-two here. Um, they'll be looking to just do their balancing and uh, on those two pairs. Jack, do you need a tissue? I'm all right. Plenty more to fight for here. Okay. Meanwhile, we're waiting for our uh, spotters and, and uh, official scores to let us know what's going to happen next. This is the last race of the round of eight. So we've completed 151 races in this regatta. And we started with 16 teams on the first day. We completed a round robin. Kudos to the race committee. They broke it down to eight. There was actually a sail off to get into the top eight, so that was, that was close. And now we've completed the round of eight, so every team has sailed seven races today. And the top four will go through into the final four. And as it stands, there are four teams tied for third place, if you will. There's four teams that are tied, and our tie-breaking gurus are working out what how they will proceed and as soon as we know we'll let you guys yeah, know yeah and the the way that we recently heard we just got updated is if they have time they would like to do a tiebreaker of the four teams but given that it's almost coming up on three o'clock and we still have the final four to do we might not have the time left in the day to do that tiebreaker so there'll be some other method of breaking the tie um, this is going to be decided by uh, the uh, ICSA rep, who's in charge of you know the uh, college sailing organization, as well as the um, the PRO. So that is still being discussed, and we'll keep you posted. It was a pretty close finish right here, but Harvard's going to take one two by only a nose, but they got the one two. So um, that was a big win for the Crimson. They go to uh, 20 points after the second round robin. And uh, Stanford will stay on 18. But you know what, John? There's still four more races to go. Exactly. Four and more races against the best teams Against as well. the best teams. So and we, uh, we don't exactly know how they're going to proceed at this point, Dave. But we know that there will either be a tie break Folks, we're just hearing a bit more if we have anything to share. All right, Jack, well, I just got word from the scoring gurus. They've decided, number one, there is not enough time for a sail-off. So it goes to the next level. There are four teams tied. So they look at those four teams' scores against each other. So that would be uh, Yale, uh, Roger Williams, uh, Dartmouth and Brown. They look at those, how they did against each other, and see if that breaks the tie. Uh, so we're waiting to hear the outcome of that. Yeah, and for everyone back home, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know the decision, and then we're going to take a small break over here. Um, but we'll keep you uh, informed as how they decide things here at the moment. All right, we just got the official word that the final four, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and Dartmouth. The final four, Harvard, Stanford, 
Yale and Dartmouth. Harvard goes in at 20 points. Stanford goes in at 18 points. And Dartmouth and Yale go in at 14 points. Um, so, listen, great sailing by all the teams. A bit of a crusher for uh, Roger Williams and Brown to be so close, but they can take pride in the fact that they were right there. Right there. And, and they uh, had some great wins at the end. You know, Jack, I'm not, I don't know about you, but anytime I leave a regatta not getting as high as I want, all I remember are the moments I want back. Yeah. The race I went back. Exactly. And it stings, but those come up again later on, and it makes you stronger. So don't ever hang your head. And team, for everyone back home, we are going to take a little break here. Um, as you see on your screen, these are your final four, but uh, don't go anywhere. Go stretch your legs, you know, enjoy, uh, maybe step outside just for a brief second, but we're going to be back. <laughs> step away from the screen. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be back uh, with uh, these four going head to head to decide who is going to win Team Race College Nationals. And maybe there'll be a surprise. Who knows? Who knows? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. The U.S. Merchant Marine Academy really is the world's best kept secret. This is the best of both worlds, combining military academies and the maritime academies. Our core values are respect, honor, and service. My academic background is very rigorous. You spend 300 days at sea on commercial ships. You receive a bachelor's of science degree, your third mate's or your third engineer's license, and then a commission into the Naval Reserve. It's challenging, but that's the reason I came here. We are the next generation of leaders for this country.
final four of day three of the Team Race National Championship. It was definitely a very spicy battle to make their way there, and unfortunately, due to time constraints today, as you all know, there's no start after five o'clock. In order for the final four to count for something, they have to completely complete it. So that means that the top four teams that moved on, um, we're looking to finish out all those races. Now keep in mind, the top four teams that had come in, um, there was a four-way tie for third and fourth, and so the third, fourth, fifth, sixth placing team, there was not enough time to sail a, sail a tiebreaker. So in this instance, the tiebreaker had to go based off of what was on tech score, and so we saw that Dartmouth was able to move on as well as Yale, Stanford, and Harvard. Some of the teams definitely had a little bit of a hard time getting into the final four, um, and there was definitely a lot of emotion docked in terms of seeing the teams that did not get to move on. That's always very difficult, especially when you don't have that chance to claw your way back out on the water. But at the end of the day, this is sailing. It's a difficult sport, and uh, those wins really do show that every single win matters. So thank you guys so much for checking out On the Water. Uh, we're excited to show you live coverage of this final four. Right now, Harvard is leading. Harvard is leading. Stanford is trailing right behind with two wins. And then we have Yale and Dartmouth tied. I'm going to send this back over to Jack Parkin and Dave Perry that are going to fill you in on a little bit more. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Um, as you can look out here, you can see that uh, the wind has switched directions on us. Um, we saw this wind over the prior two days. It's now coming out of the south, starting to build a little bit, but it's certainly a little lighter. It looks like it's uh, a little spotty out here, but it's uh, it's it looks sailable, and uh, all the teams are now out on the water, getting ready to go into this final four. Um, Gloria gave you the rundown on who's going to be out here, but uh, Dave and I just wanted to give you a little bit more context about how we think this plays out. Well, we know that the four teams in the final four carry all their wins forward from the beginning of the regatta. In team racing culture, every race counts. For instance, in match racing, uh, after the round robin, all the scores go back to zero and you start again fresh, but not so in team racing. So based on the regatta so far, Harvard enters the final four with 20 points. Stanford has 18 points and Yale and Dartmouth have 14 points. Because there's four teams around Robin, uh, each team will sail three races. So there's three points to be had. So Yale and Dartmouth are fighting for third place. They're fighting for the podium. They can't get better than third. So they're, they're in a battle for the podium. But Stanford and Harvard, uh, either team can win the national championship, depending on how they sail. And we'll just see how it plays out. Uh, Harvard's up two. But uh, if they won uh, one race, but Stanford won all three, uh, they would be tied. And in the final four, it goes to who beat who. If there's two beats tied, at the, two boats tied at the end, it's who beat who in this final four. So it's pretty clean. Yeah, um, absolutely. All teams just need to win races. Yeah, and it's uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different one. Um, I think this is going to have a bit more parallel to the previous uh, two days of racing. Same direction, uh, same current factor here. Um, we saw a little wind this morning, and uh, now we're seeing a bit of light air. So this is going to be a true test of those all-round teams. Um, we're going to have each race is definitely going to be exciting here. Uh, everyone's got something on the line here. Um, and uh, we can see that the competitors are just out there just adjusting some of the marks, and I expect that we're going to get ramped up here probably in the next 10 minutes. Uh, Jack, why don't you take us through uh, who's who's up first? Sure. So, race one, we're going to have the uh, Stanford Cardinal in uh, red in one, two, three, versus the Yale Bulldogs. Oh boy, oh, you, no. you and me, babe. Grudge fight. Uh, they're going to be in 16, 17, 18. Um, I think that uh, they've been uh, have some great battles this week. Yeah. Well, they certainly have, and uh, obviously, 
Uh, right now, you have to let go of any disappointment you might have that you're not going to win the Nationals. Uh, but you have to remember that there's still a, a medal on the line. Absolutely. And you're also thinking long term. The Fowl Trophy uh, looks at all the national championships. And so uh, the Yale Bulldogs are going to be fighting their hardest for third. And, of course, Dartmouth's going to be fighting hard for third also. Yeah. So in the second flight, or well, the second race of the first flight, we have the Harvard Crimson in uh, 7 8 9 in pink versus Dartmouth Big Green in 10 11 12 and that will be definitely another great race uh, two teams that have proven themselves in this light air conditions um, you know each one of these is going to be uh, down to the wire i can see it happening we're going to have yeah. a lot of action here yeah. guys well it's interesting um, if harvard lost all their races they would stay on 20 Stanford would need to win two of their three to get to 20. Yes. So, and then if Stanford won all three, that means they beat Harvard, they would win the championship. Um, so, as I said, anything can happen, and we've all seen it, that uh, as much as the points carry through, it's a, it's a whole new ball game out here. Yeah. And as Jack pointed out, the conditions are completely different. For those of us who were this earlier in the broadcast, I was making the point that in other sports, tennis, basketball, football, the lines are always the same. The, the nets are the same height. There's, uh, they're all the same. Maybe the surfaces change a little bit in tennis. Um, but in sailing, from day to day, the race course is completely different. From race to race, and sometimes from leg to leg. Absolutely. And now it's completely 180 degrees different, isn't it, Jack? Because now it's, it's coming more from the south, southwest. Uh, the breeze has got very light. I mean, we're watching some boats go upwind here, and they're they're hardly moving. I think the tide is still coming in, so I think uh, high tide is until later on this evening. So the uh, current, such as it is, will be affecting the race course. But near shore, Jack, it's not linear. There's back eddies. We're near a wall, so the sailors are going to have to go look at the buoys to see what's going on there. Yeah, that's going to be a, uh, a major factor here, especially as it gets lighter on the start line. The current is going to have a, you know, outstanding effect on some of these starts. So I hope to see some of the uh, the teams doing some practice runs uh, before yep. the start here. Yep. Um, you know, they've mentioned it, it, it is light, but uh, I, I got to say that I think the race committee's got to be um, uh, pretty keen to get things going here. Um, one thing to point out is we do have a final race timeline of five o'clock, so that's an hour and 18 minutes. Mm. Plenty of time to get a final four done. Mm -hmm. I think it takes about an average of probably an hour 10, hour five, but uh, it's close. Well, he was saying 10 minutes a race and three minutes of sequence, and there's six races, so that's uh, hour and 18, so that's yeah, tight. Maybe it's he'll, close. Maybe he'll shorten the course up a little bit, and uh, you know, um, especially you could shorten up you know, to me, you can always start, shorten up Mark 1 and 2 and, uh, you know, and abbreviate there. You know, to me, the, the most important leg is the final leg after Mark 4. So, you know, it would be nice to I, – I don't mind giving up yeah. the distance on the first beat because uh, if, it, if it's yeah, no, not no a 1-2, no the further. race That's company is going to change anyways closer. by the time you get to Mark 3. So, But, yeah. hey, listen, Kyle Assad's out there with his team. They are – uh, veteran PRO, they know the region, they know the area, and uh, um, I got a question for you, young Jedi Jack. Um, do your starting tactics and strategies change in light air versus what I would call this morning more heavy air? Yeah, I think there's there's basically one critical question you want to ask yourself, and it's, do you want to be the person leading back, which is the person who's usually in front? dictating the timing of when you're going to hit the line and uh, basically fending off the person behind? Or do you want to be the person pushing, which yep. is the attacker? Yep. Um, the person who is trying to uh, hook the person in front or push them over early. Yep. And in lighter air, I defer to leading. And yep. that's because the power you have over the sails and the impact of covering a boat behind is a lot stronger so you can do a little bit more harm to them when you're out in front so it'll be interesting to uh, to see what teams uh, decide to go for the lead and push here especially with the current effect yeah 
Now we got some hate sessions with Curran and everything. It's gonna be great. And I think we're gonna go to Gloria, who's out there. Maybe you can give us a live update. Hello, everyone. I'm out here. Just reapplied my Dermatone, making sure I don't get sunburnt. I'll tell you what, Breeze has totally done a nice 180, but it's light. And uh, we're gonna be looking for some powerful roll tax. We're gonna be looking for some light air athleticism from these sailors. Um, and I'll tell you what, a bad tack is gonna do, it's gonna do you dirty. And uh, the name of the game with the final four is Keep doing what you're doing if it's working. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well said, Gloria. Well, we're seeing uh, some big puffs come out of this left-hand side. I, I don't know if you can see that there, but boat nine getting hit by uh, some of this uh, some of this pressure coming off the left. So that might be something that the uh, sailors need to think about as they uh, get set up for the race here. I'm sure they're itching to go. Uh, I think I just saw the orange flag come online. So. Uh, I'm sure we're getting ramped up here soon. Check wave a moment. Let's uh, read off who we think is on, this, on the teams. It's so important to recognize these are people. These are students at uh, wonderful colleges and universities around the country, and they are representing their schools. And um, the, as we talked earlier, the crews are just as important as skippers. So um, in our first race, we have Stanford against Yale. On our roster for Stanford, we've got Hannah Freeman, uh, Michelle Larkamp, Vanessa Larkamp, and apologies if I don't get all the names right, uh, Patricia Gurley, uh, Ellie Harned, Abigail Tyndall, Chapman Peterson, Gwen Donahue, and Grace Austin. So, and if there's other players on the team, we don't have the complete rosters, and we don't really know who's on the water now because the, the, the coaches and the players are adjusting based on the conditions. Uh, for the Yale Bulldogs, We've got Jack Egan, Teddy Nicolosi, Stefan Baker, Catherine Webb, Anisha Arcott, and Meredith Ryan. And then for the Dartmouth, Big Green, we got Robert Bragg, Maddie Hawkins, Christopher Long, William Michaels, James Paul, Yumi Yoshiyasu, Drew Clutterbuck, Aisling Sullivan, and Reese Bragg. And finally, uh, for Harvard, uh, Lachlan McGranahan, Justin Callahan, Mitchell Callahan, Christopher Wang, uh, Kennedy Lee Healy, Marbella Marlowe. And as I said, there may be others out there. That's what we have in front of us. But it gives you a sense that we're not watching boats. We're watching people. Uh, there, are, there are emotions involved. There's pride involved. There's uh, hard work all year to get here. And uh, it's kind of fun to be at a Final Four. First race will be the Stanford University Cardinal versus the Yale University Bulldogs. On deck you know, Jack, as we're waiting for this to go, you know, sports has some college great college. climactic moments. But uh, if you're a sports fan, uh, obviously uh, Game 7 is a big thing in any sport. And the NBA right now, the uh, Eastern Finals, it's, uh, it's going to be a big one tonight. All right, out to Gloria. Hey guys, like I said, the sun is beaming, it's hot, but you should go to Dermatone.com and uh, use the code college 20 to protect yourself like I am out here in this heat, reapplying Dermatone nonstop, you know, skin cancer is very real. Uh, so you should use that and uh, protect yourself just like I'm out here. Finish, finish. This is signal. Thanks, Gloria, for that uh, good reminder out there. It has been a beautiful couple days out here. Um, and, you know, the sun sun never sleeps, except at night. Uh, so, uh, looks like they're just making some fine tuning here. I can see them pulling down the pin at the moment. But uh, I can imagine. Imagine the feelings going through this final four here. You're just waiting. Dave, what do you think they're thinking about out there? So for you guys watching on shore, at home, we just got word that the race committee is going to give it another five minutes to see if the uh, conditions settle down. We're watching a pretty big left shift here as the, the wind is trying to find a new home. Jack, I gave a little tease about the NBA Finals. I don't know if you follow basketball at all. 
but I usually follow just the playoffs. But every now and then, there's a big moment in sports. And we're here. The Boston Celtics are playing for the Eastern Conference Championship. And they're playing the Miami Heat. And the Celtics went down 3 nothing in the series. It's first to four. No team in NBA history has ever come back to win a playoff series when they're down 3 nothing. Wow. Not one team. Dreams happen. They lost the first two games in Boston. They lost the first game in Miami. They won the fourth game, the second game in Miami, 3-1. to one. They went back to Boston and won that, 3-2. to two. And then just the other night, they went to Miami and won at the buzzer. Wow. Two tenths of a second to drive a game seven in Boston tonight at 8.30. No team has ever come back from 3 nothing. So this will be a, a one for the history books. That'll be cool to watch. And, uh, yeah, drawing parallels to here. I mean, who's going to be the Boston? Who's going to be the Heat? Uh, you know? We will see. But uh, you see out there, people are just getting warmed up. Hey, while they're getting warmed up, uh, let's take a quick 30-second break. <laughs> Gear up with Zim and West Coast Sailing. We have the gear you need at a great price, backed by fast shipping and outstanding service. As proud partners of College Sailing, Zim and West Coast Sailing offer 15% discounts to student athletes on all apparel and soft goods. Get all the top brands including Gill, Rooster, Zyke, Ronstan, and more. Go to zimsailing.com slash college sailing or westcoastsailing.net slash scholastic-sailing for details and to apply for your student athlete discount code today. And these next couple... One thing that, uh, that I wanted to flag here um, that could be relevant in these next couple races, it's, it's been uh, pretty light air, is uh, this thing called Rule 42. Uh, rule 32 is the rule that you cannot basically propel your boat unnecessarily and get an advantage. I mean, that is paraphrasing, and I have the absolute rule guru sitting next beside me, but... Dave, maybe you could just give us a high, high level, because I know there's a lot of details that go into it, but how you think about Rule 42 and maybe how it's technically quoted. Yeah, it's a big one here. Uh, rule 42 is propulsion. And, of course, in smaller boats like a dinghy, if there was no wind out at all and you put your sails up and you just rocked your boat back and forth, you would generate wind and the boat would sail just fine. It's artificial wind, apparent wind. And the rules say you're not allowed to propel your boat other than by the natural action of the wind and the water. So fortunately, we have umpires, and they are trained to watch the sailors. Um, you're allowed to ease your main in and out. You're allowed to ease your jib in and out, but you're not allowed to pump your main. So if you repeatedly pull it in and release it, pull it in and release it, that's pumping. That's illegal. You might see that on the reaches when the boats are going down. You're not allowed to rock your boat back and forth. If you repeatedly rock back and forth with no change in course, that's rocking. And the umpires are watching it. It's very easy to see. And they will flag you on the spot. You need to do a turn. So um, in college sailing, you're allowed to ooch. Ooching is sort of scooching your weight forward uh, against the front of the boat. That's the mast. In regular racing, that's not legal. But in, 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 in um, college and high school sailing, it is. And then sculling is the other big one, Jack. You just, you, we all know sculling is. Every sailor does. These 420s have huge rudders, like an opti. You can scull these boats straight up wind. So the, the, uh, the uh, umpires are right behind the boats at the start, watching for any repeated forceful movement of the helm. And as you say, when it's windy, hardly any of that really comes into play. But when it's light, it's a big deal. Absolutely. And uh, Dave, you know, you see out there sometimes these repetitive tacks and that mm -hmm. seems like a like an instance where rule 42 can get involved so w what are the umpires looking for yeah. there because they look so good but uh sometimes see people get flagged well you're right there's actually five actions that you get flagged for and i mentioned four i mentioned pumping mm -hmm. rocking ooching which is legal in college sailing and sculling the fifth is repeated tax or jibes not connected to a tactical reason interesting so if you tack on somebody and you're trying to cover them and they tack away, you're allowed to tack right back to cover them. Mm -hmm. 
and they're allowed to attack right back to get out of your cover. But if you're by yourself and you just start tacking back and forth in light air, which is a form of pumping, yeah. then that's illegal. And it's up to the umpires to read the situation. Are they doing this for tactical reasons or are they doing it just to propel the boat? It's a judgment call. It's a tough one, yeah, and uh, it's tricky, and it's it can make a huge difference. If you have two beautiful jibes connected to each other, yep. it can just really boost you forward. Since sometimes, you know, des desperation moves can really get away with it. Um, well, you're right, and uh, sounds like a man who knows how to do it. <laughs> but I tell you, the umpires, they're very good, and they're particularly watchful as you get near the zones of the mark. Yep. And a boat behind is trying to gain an overlap, or the boat ahead is trying to break one. And they're really watching for a little extra goose right there. Uh, same in the starting line. You'll see that the in the culture, three, two, dip your boat to leeward, one, flatten the boat, they kind of let you do that. Yeah. But if you flatten the boat and then you dip again and flatten again, that double dip, you'll get flecked. Got it. Hey, we're watching uh, the race management here. Is this Larry Kennedy out there? He's doing the famous hooking the mark, the lasso the mark technique. This is a, uh, a technique he has perfected at Oak Cliff Sailing. He just goes by the mark. He just throws a piece of line around the mark. You don't have to reach in. You don't have to grab the line. We've all tried to grab it. We've missed it. He just comes by one time, throws a line around it, drags it, and lets the end go. It's, it's a Really good race management technique, which he has perfected. Larry Kennedy from Oak Cliff Sailing. And you know who's recording this? Rodrigo out there. Okay. This is Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo doesn't take shortcuts. He doesn't compromise. I mean, look at him. Rodrigo does it the hard way. Just like Rodrigo, Coral Reef Sailing Apparel believes in doing it the right way, taking the time, care, and effort to getting it right. Thanks to Coral Reef. Uh, for supporting us out here, and uh, we're going to be back to the coverage and hopefully some starts here soon enough. Amen. Thank you very much. Excellent job. I think we're. Uh, I think we're. So, Dave, they're out there, you know, adjusting the course. What, what do you think they're doing? Well, you know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. They're I'm you. <laughs> <laughs> Every sailor knows. Um, nobody controls the wind. As much as you like to think you do, and a lot of people say, oh, I know what the wind's going to do, they don't. Um, Mother Nature controls it. The wind started from the south, but now it's gone a little, uh, started from the southwest, it's gone a little more southerly, so now it's coming over the land. Anytime the wind blows over the land, it shifts back and forth. The wind is a big obstacle. So what the race committee is trying to do, wind shifts are no problem. And even random wind shifts are part of racing. But they want to make sure when they start the race that there's enough breeze and it's stable enough so you can have a, a, a fair race, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean the wind never shifts, but it means it shifts back and forth for both boats and, and they can take advantage of it. So they're being patient. They know what's on the line. I'm sure they're watching their watches. I'm sure they know uh, how much time they have. I trust them to you know, get the racing going in time to finish it, but they also want to make sure the breeze is stable enough so that the uh, sailors have a good race. Yeah, it's, it's a tough call in the crunch moments like this. But it looks like uh, they're calling out some uh, some starting sequences, and we might be getting up to uh, getting up to go here. So check in the watches. Looks like we have an hour and two minutes till uh, the last race time, um, which I think is, you know, uh, enough time, plenty of time to get this done. But uh, well, I'll say one thing right now. A lot of sailors are quick to criticize the race committee. Hey, what's taking you so long? Hey, how come we didn't do this? I encourage all those sailors to go spend some time running races sometime. And you really begin to realize it is a lot harder than you think, and they really are trying to make yeah, it fair. So better. all I say at the end of the race to the race winning is thanks a lot. No yeah. matter what happened, thanks yeah. a lot. Because plus better them than me. So, you know, it's, it's a, a matter of patience. Trust them to do the right thing. And I bet you within a minute or two they're going to get some signals going and we'll get it. Some final four action. Yeah, it's exciting. And this is the crunch time. Down to the wire, you know, all four races. And uh, this, this is it, final four, and it's just gone four o'clock. Jack, you're Stanford's coach. What do you say to your team? Well, what I would say is, uh, you know, we, uh, you've been sailing great in the light air. It's just light conditions right now. 
don't overthink it. Do what you've been doing previously and uh, go out there and have some fun. I think that's important. I mean, you know, this is the culmination of a whole year of work for a lot of these teams. And you got to remember at the end of the day that uh, it seems like college sailing has become very professionalized. Like, you've got uh, the great Dave Berry here commentating. And uh, this is, you know, a very real moment for a lot of them. But uh, I, I think you've got to remember, at the end of the day, it's, it's you're here to have fun, do a sport that you love. And uh, the uh, adrenaline that you get from this moment is, you know, you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Another thing I try to remind sailors and myself is even the best teams make mistakes. It's so easy to think, oh, we're behind, the team winning will never make a mistake. They will, and they do. So just don't you be that team. You sail well, clean, and let the chips fall where they may. And it looks like we are into sequence here for the first race of the final four. We've got the Stanford Cardinal in red, one, two, three. And uh, Yale in blue in 16, 17, 18. I can imagine that uh, this is just uh, three minutes has just gone, and they're getting ready here. So whoever's in great. charge of the color coding is doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, they're doing a real good job. You know, Jack, just as you spoke up, a big puff came through the booth here. There's a big, there's large puffs coming off the shore here. Not as windy as it was earlier, but, you know, certainly you might even see the crews on the high side in some of these puffs. So uh, it's a good job of the race committee waiting that extra five minutes. There's, there's at least five knots more wind right now than there was five minutes ago. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dave, I I'm going to be keeping an eye on this left. Uh, that's that's mm. my initial gut feeling that... Mm. This, uh, the wind coming slightly off the land mm -hmm. with the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see if that hypothesis is uh, approved. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's fun. I mean, Mark 1 is literally a stone throw away from us here. So um, you, know, you, you, you will get to the ley line before you get to the wall, but not far <laughs> away before. And we're going to look into the play-by-play -play here. We've got about a minute 10 to go. Coming up on one minute here. So uh, you can see here the pairs that we've been talking about. So. so you like to lead, light air lead back. Yep. Though it's a little windier now. Uh, we got again Stanford in red and Yale in blue. So here's some circling around. Looks like the pin is wide open here. I, in my mind's eye, I have the current going right to left if there's much current out there. Dave, I'm seeing a big left shift there. It's going to be shifty. Okay, we heard, we just we just heard from the booth they, they're going to call that off. There was a big shift there. The race committee is, is being very careful here to try and get them a good start. Um, though I will say at some point you just got to let them go. It's the same for all six boats. And if, the, if it's a, not a square line, it's not a square line for all six, and you just got to let them go because we do have a time limit to look after. And we want to settle this thing on the water. And while we wait here for the uh, just a little square up the course, I think we're going to see uh, some race highlights from the, this weekend. Good close action there. Come closer to me, please. Ah. The boats are on their way to mark four. Look at this, just pristine. Perfect. Medium man is, in my in my opinion, the best team racing conditions. Medium air, pretty flat water. Become very tactical. You like the tactical yeah, game, don't you, Jack? Love it. I love it. Are you an ocean racer? I'm not. I've uh, pretty much specialized in the the dinghy right, sport go. since growing Yale. up. But uh, you know, maybe that's something that in life and in time we'll uh, we'll see uh, become a bigger factor. Um, I, I have slowly uh, made my way into the keel boats, and as I get older, and that, that's been great fun. So, what was the last thing you said? Oh. Here we go, three yep. minutes. See that quick adjustment? This is, yeah. you know, shows how good the race committee is. Just yep. a quick correction and they're ready to go. Yep. So to finish that thought, have you ever been in a sailboat race offshore? I have not. Not yet. Not yet. 
All right, so all of you out there who want to have a, a young buck. So we don't know if you'd be seasick or not, do we yet? <laughs> I hope not. Well, you, you it might be mildly embarrassing. You don't know. It's not, embar hey, it's not embarrassing at all. It happens to everyone. But the thing is, you don't know. Yeah, you never know. All right. So here we go, round two. All right, Yale and blue, Stanford and red. Nerves are high. Imagine that, you know, stock cooled off. You got all pumped up, and yeah. now... Uh, got to do it all again it's kind of fun you can sort of see what the tendencies are you confirm whose boat middle pin who your counterpart's going to be They're approaching two minutes two minutes is uh go time time to engage which team has more pressure on it right now stanford or yale Ooh, that's a tricky one. I think it's, it's got to be on Stanford. This is a, a must-win race. For Yale, you know, yes, you want to get on the podium, but uh, it's a little lower stakes. It's a little less to lose, and so maybe just go for it a little harder. Yeah. That sounded like a minute 30 there, folks. Anything from Gloria out there? Gloria, what are you seeing? Yep. Yeah, so what I'm seeing right now is a pretty aggressive pre-start here, but it's quite light, so it looks like they moved the marks around just slightly, but it's definitely going to be a lighter pre-start. So, Jack, just like you were saying earlier, it's interesting which teams are leading and trailing to the line. It looks like most of the Yale boats are, are uh, trailing here. Well, one thing for sure, Jack, the pressure is up and down. Now, right near Mark 1, there's a big light spot. So these are races that are not over till they're over. Never give up. Absolutely. And I'm still saying quite a lot of pin bias here. But uh, as Dave said, oh, okay, we, we've put a pin in this as well. It seems like that left shift is causing issues to get a fair course here. Getting a little knot in my stomach here, Jack. Hmm? Can you say that again, Dave? I'm getting a little knot in my stomach about time. I am too. I think it's, uh, you know, they're doing the best that they can at this point. That's that's all you can ask. And uh, it's got to be the wind's got to cooperate, right? And it's just not within your control. I'm sure the rules are, are well spelled out on this, but I'm not an expert on the Mark, team racing I'm rules if they get a partial... Final four, whether they, uh, in some <coughs> some round robins, you have to get three of the races off, but there's only six races in this thing, so Whatever it is, you don't know like the answer to what if they get halfway through and run out of time. Yeah, don't know the answer to that. Yeah, Let's hope we don't have to find out. I reckon that they'll just keep going, and if it happens, it happens. Uh, yeah. Right now, I wonder if all the teams agree just like to keep going past 5 o'clock. I uh, somehow here. think there may be one or two teams that uh, doesn't uh, agree to that. <laughs> Especially if you're at the top. <laughs> oh, you mean they may be thinking self-interestedly? Yeah. yeah. Not for the, the better of the people. But uh, <laughs> here's a little highlight where we stand. Everyone tuned in. Yeah. It's a battle for the top and a battle for third. Yeah. Um, really just that that's how it comes down to it here and uh, we're, we're crossing our fingers here that uh, we're gonna make this happen I'm, I'm seeing the uh, top mark boat yeah. making the up and shorter yeah, that might uh, that uh, also probably moving nice. slightly to the left but it really might expedite some of these races still a very uh, a decent sized race nothing to be concerned and, uh, around that but obviously uh, in the back of the mind at the PRO definitely you know, it's interesting, I was just noticing the scores. So Dartmouth and Yale are fighting for third. They sail against each other in the second to last race of the round robin. Stanford and Harvard are racing for first. They sail against each other in the last race. So well, the last two races could decide <coughs> Could decide it. I wonder who put the rotations together. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's how it works out. Yeah, it's very clever. Probably Danielle Richards. I think she's very clever. Yeah, yeah. She's been doing this for a long time. Uh, 
helps to run the ICSA and uh, keeps things organized and flowing and fair. Absolutely. People don't appreciate how many different areas of expertise go into this. Mm. You know, we talked about the umpires and the race committee and uh, now ICSA, but there is so many people in the background. I mean, I think we've got to give a shout out to King's Point as well. Oh, huge. Huge shout out. It's They've put on a stellar show. I mean, this is the uh, nicest media box I've ever been in. Well, I mean, just when I drove in the gate this morning, the guy couldn't have been nicer. I'm here for the dinghy champions. Oh, welcome. Have you been here before? You know, they just seem so proud and happy to have it here. Yeah. You know, the Merchant Marine Academy, they do so much for our, our uh, shipping industry and, and uh, keeping our sa water safe. And uh, you know, I've been coming here for a long time. And uh, it looks pristine. And I love to see all the banners. And so, yeah, big shout out to all the people yeah. who made that work. Excellent. And it's been, yeah. Moments of pause in the racing, but otherwise, oh, that's wind. perfect sailing conditions. That's wind. And we're here, guys. We're probably approaching about two minutes in the pre-start here. Yeah. Try number three. And let's just send a shout out to the media team. Oh, yeah. It's a huge operation. The Merchant Marine Academy and many other sponsors have put in quite a bit of money to make this thing happen. And I hope all of you who are watching at home are enjoying it. And I think a lot of people will be watching on the replays and they can experience these great young sailors out here racing for a national championship. So uh, there's a lot of people in the booth, Jack, as you know, not just you, me, and Gloria and yeah. Pearson. But uh, yeah, so here we go. This is the uh, third attempt at this, uh, this, this first race in the final four. I'm thinking look, things are looking better here, Dave. Third, uh, race, third tries to charm. Yeah, exactly. Let's yeah. see how uh, they decide to get here. Yeah, the first beat's much shorter, very appropriate. And the second, the second, the final beat is just still the same length. It's just what I was suggesting is, uh, or not suggesting, but just what I was saying is, who really cares about the first beat? If it's a, if the race is, isn't a runaway, the, the positions are going to change by mark three anyways. So I, I agree with the decision to get yeah, get you to mark three as quickly as possible. That's where the action is. So I think we're around the 50 second mark here. All right. Uh, next thing we'll hear will be 30 seconds. All right. Stanford's in the orange boats. I think that's red, Dave. But uh, well, red boats, close, red close orange. Close enough. Yeah. You know, the not the blue boats. Yale's in the blue boats. Maybe they're in the cardinal boats. Yeah. Here we go, we're lined up. Start. Five seconds here. 16, 1, 18. 16, 1, 18. Ooh. Oh. 16, clear. I'm one thinking clear. I just. 16, 1, and 18. So two, two boats. Two Yale boats. Two Yale boats. Oh, that's just harsh. But, uh, After all that waiting, all that trying, line, all that. You know, sometimes it burns you out, Jack. I, we've all been there. Sometimes you just get a little brain dead. Yeah. You have all that waiting around, but 17 looks good up there on yeah. that uh, that right. I think he's he's looking to lock up the one here. Thought you wanted to go left. Yeah, we'll see what plays out here. <laughs> that wasn't the start the Bulldogs wanted. How important is the start, Jack, in the sailboat race? Well, we've been saying it all week. I think that uh, you can certainly lose it, but you can't win it. Yeah. I think right now I'm pretty happy if I'm uh, Stanford here. And 17's kind of got the, uh, given the uh, the Yale team a little bit of a, uh, a chance here because uh, holding the one is incredibly important. So I think uh, Stanford's looking to possibly go two, three, four here is their combo. Um, you know, if you don't have the one, you go and play two. Yeah. All right, here we go. Harvard Dartmouth, stand by for three minutes. Stand by for three minutes. Stand by for three minutes. Wow, it's it's nice to see Harvard the crews Dartmouth. up on the rail. Harvard Dartmouth. It's so much more fun. It's such, such a much more fun game when you can hike out. There's enough breeze to hike. Uh, absolutely. Dave, I'm thinking that this uh, far left corner might get a little light mm. from uh, 
the land effect here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We'll see. Well, it's certainly going to get lighter as they get near the top here. So Stanford, I think, has stabilized a two-three-four combination, um, at least initially here off the start line. The seventeen's all by themselves in the right corner. I don't know. The two up in here on your left side, Jack. Nice up bow up pressure. Yeah, it's a little, maybe a little lefty. Yeah, I think uh, race lead change here. Well, we saw an earlier race when two of the three boats went back to restart, and it's just it's an uphill battle after that. It is. It makes it tricky. Uh, it looks shifty out there. I mean, yeah. this is when you got to wear two hats. you got to be conscious about combos and uh, what position you're in, but you also got to keep an eye on the shifts um, and uh, make sure that you are fleet racing along as well. Well, that's again going back to the crews. You know, I can't talk enough about how important the crews are in sailboat racing. They they don't get enough airtime. Uh, the skipper, it takes all your concentration to keep the boat going fast. And it's really the crew that's got to be looking around and helping with some of those big picture decisions. You know, do we stay with our opponent? Do we split? How is our team doing? You know, all that kind of stuff. If you can get a good crew, that and you know, often good crews are good skippers. Yeah, absolutely. They, they understand. But this level, I would, you know, if you had a crew race out here, I think it would look just like this. It would look like good team racing. Quick update here. I think Stanford, boat two, may be in the lead. Oh yeah, Stanford's got the one two right now. Yeah, coming from the left. Yeah, coming from your left. My left. I called you, it. You almost, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't <laughs> call the left and then say, oh, no, left's looking pretty bad. You can't have it both ways. You so. just got to hedge your bets, Dave. You should, uh, no, the hedging your bets is no bad at all. You should have stayed with your original because the left did pay out. <laughs> but uh, two looks a bit out of a tricky situation here. Oh. Oh, Yale's got a piece of them. Yeah, they do. 17 had a piece of them. And this is going to be a little. Oh, that's big. A little mix up here at the end here. What happened to both three, Jack? I don't know. A couple bad shifts, maybe? Yeah, well, we said it was lighter up here. There are bigger holes, and that's what's happened. Somehow, boat three just went off the earth. So, and the boats are hardly moving. Yeah, it's this top left. It's just a little killer. It's almost like there's a back end of your current or something, because like, against the land, you see they're barely moving down that leg. But look at that. Yale, after... Having two boats over at the start, and of course Stanford had one. They round in a two-three-five, a winning combination. Mark one, oh, it looks like uh, the lost Yale boat's got a piece of two as well. How about? Do they? Yeah. Almost. 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 Well, this race is far from over, and. Look at what I'm seeing right here. I mean, there is some more pressure coming down, but I think we need our pundits on shore working on what happens if you don't get all the races off in the final four here. Boat 18 is not even making progress. Yeah. So there must be a back eddy or something like that. Yeah, just a little bit of pressure and some, uh, some good tacks. That's where the umpires are going to be watching. But those two tacks were justified. Yeah, like yeah. Making the mark. It's an upwind to that top reach at the moment. Righty. Well, here we go. So let's just play it out. Harvard's got the, uh, Stanford's got the one. And they're just uh, waiting around not to get too far ahead. Yale's in the two, three, five. So they want to convert that to a two, three, four. So the two, three are trying to get a hold of the second Stanford boat and slow them down, which they're using the zone at Mark II for a trap. And then here comes their buddy. Yeah, AT's got a puff here. This is tricky sailing, Jack. It is. Shoots and ladders. Shoots and ladders. Absolutely. Did you ever play the game as a kid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big one. Yeah. So, so Yale's in play two, obviously. Two has got a lane in that middle there, though. Uh, I'm sure 17 is going to come over and balance back. It's, it's streaky. I, I know we can't do it now, 
but I still feel like three and four should be a flip flop. Great shot there of the different fleets. Well, I love the, the the mixture of the drone and the on the surface and really sailing photography has come a long way. And I remember uh, Chris Love, who's helping produce this whole show, and a long time ago out of college, he started to do a lot of the filming for match racing mm -hmm. and other stuff, and really started to help you know, raise the level. Uh, he's done a great job, and he's back here doing this too, and uh, anybody who wants a good sailing videographer production, call Chris. Looks like two's hanging in there. At the moment, at least. Um. Plus that valuable starboard card. If you can get to the left of your opponent looking downwind, you pick up the starboard advantage, called the starboard card. And then you gain control. It's that easy. When you're ahead, you got to defend your left you know, fiercely. Yeah, that's all going to be a game of coming down into this bottom mark. Mark three. Mark three. Two-length zone. It's a magical zone around the mark. If you get there clear ahead, you own the zone. In team racing, you do not need to jive and go around the mark, unlike in fleet racing. So it looks like the Yale uh, sailor is able to push boat two around. Yep. Oh, but do they round? Oh, but Sam round in a. Oh, uh, no, it's still. It's like a slightly weak one, too. Can't tell how high. Is that book? Oh, they are getting rolled. Stanford sailing into a 1 2 right now. Look at that. I think there was a protest, but. Uh, anybody spinning? Yeah, the Yale boat somehow that let the uh, boat behind get the jump on them and get over the top. I just don't know how high they are. Can the yellow boat stay ahead? Uh, 16. Can they round ahead? This is big. No, unfortunately not. All right, so Stanford rounds in a 1 2 out of Mark 4. And uh, Yale in pursuit. In pursuit, yep. This is going to be a tricky one, this upwind. It looks light out there. I've seen the Stanford one coming back. That's the one position one. Boat number two coming down to drop in, and there's a Yaley going out to the right all by themselves. Yeah, that's a little scary. Look at that, all by themselves. So it looks like what Stanford's trying to do is to quickly convert the one two on the left side. So that's what's happening. Yep. Boat two is trying to do a, it's called a speed pass back where they're slowing number 16 down. Um, and you'll see boat two go with boat 16. But the real question is, how yes. is that boat on the right yeah, looking? Yeah, that's the big moment here. That's the big moment. That's the big moment. I don't think two's quite across here. Look at that. The boat on the right has the one now. So listen, sailboat racing is hard. Sailboat racing is hard. When it gets light and shifty like this, it's harder. And but letting that Yaley go by himself, Jack, and it may turn out to have been a big mistake because that look at they came back in the one. Yeah, it's uh, tricky. But now looking at a lefty, I know it's 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 di shifting all over the place. Meanwhile, on the back, there's a split too. I don't know who's. Oh, 17 spinning. Goodness, how many that could be crucial at the end here, depending on who can uh, win this race. First and not last. Well, we're going to have to go to Gloria. In fact, can we go to Gloria now? Gloria, you out there? Do you know what happened there? I don't think we have Gloria. So we'll go with what off we're seeing here. I'm seeing boat two stepping up. I imagine they're going to try and uh, slow boat 18. Yep. Yeah, so Stanford's back in the one. Stanford's quick. Here's a port starboard. Yeah, oh, no. 
Oh, that's a that's you're spinning there. Yeah, you are. You're spinning there. There you go. So does that put Yale in the well? Let's see what happens on the other side of the course. But one Sanford one is going out to the left by themselves. Yeah, this is going to be a close one. One, two, three, four, five, six. So Yale possibly well they're in play one. There's a still a lot of upwind here to go, Dave. I think I just looked up and for the perspective. And oh, my God. Is that them down there? That's them down there. <laughs> Lots to play for here. This race is going to never end. Hey, are we rotating or are we not rotating? Let's take a look out here. Um, right now, this beautiful breeze is just coming down on the left-hand side which we could see as an advantage for boat one starboard, starboard Sanford um, out here on the left-hand side. We're waiting to see how they come across with 16. Um, in that bottom at the Mark IV, we saw Stanford and Yale essentially have a room to duck or a room to tack situation, and that seems to be why Yale ended up getting that red flag um, but right now, this is looking tough. It looks like Yale is doing a pretty good job balancing here. And Stanford's kind of looking for a miracle at this top, top end of this upland. What are you seeing, Jumpin' Jack? Yeah, I mean, this is just a uh, game of Yale just bouncing uh, the opponent and uh, maintaining the one-two. So just doing a bit of coverage on those two players, uh, uh, boat one and boat two from Stanford. And uh, looks like they're extending here in this nice little puff all the way uh, to the finish line. So it looks like a stable one-two for Yale, at least at the moment. I think the key to this race is just avoiding those big holes out there. There's been some big lulls, and uh, I think if you can just connect the dots, um, that's been uh, super important here. So it looks like a coming up on a 1-2 finish here for Yale. How about that? How about that? Well, that was... That was a tough one. That was a long race that day. A long race, and the breeze died in the middle of it, which made it very difficult. And it got really screwy. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just as screwy for both teams, but a little unfortunate in a team race where you're trying to control the action. And uh, there were a few inversions as a result. <coughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was a long one. And I could see that uh, out there, the, uh, the Harvard-Dartmouth race is uh, fully underway. And... There is a massive gap between some of these pairs out there, Dave. Between the four and the five from uh, from Dartmouth, there is a, uh, a leg and a half at the moment, I have to say. Yeah. Well, that happens when the wind dies. Yeah. And it fills Here we in. go. Here's the shot. This is a uh, Harvard in pink, seven, eight, nine, and then Dartmouth in 10, 11, 12. So uh, to fill you in on the off screen, we have uh, looks like Dartmouth is in the five and slowing the six. So Dartmouth in a one, four, five combination here with a massive gap. And uh, the two Harvard boats just doing their job, stopping that uh, Dartmouth boat 11 from going upwind. It's not great, but it, I like, I think this is going to be uh, interesting right. to watch as uh, these two trailing boats converge with that four pack up there. Yeah. That's going to really decide this race yeah, about who three, can get uh, free and fast. Just got pretty windy up here, Jack. It certainly did. It's filling in a little bit. So um, crews head out of the boat. Sail to pressure. Yeah, look at that. I see a uh, boat tent sharing inside just a little bit, a little lefty there. Maybe a little pressure difference. Both um, of the right are kind of just bobbing around, aren't they? Yeah. So if, if I'm Dartmouth, I'm thinking 
Maybe go one, two with both All ten, right. ten Stand and twelve. And yeah, let's get this oh, so I'm not sure. It's it's please. hard for them to make the call. Here comes the harbor boat out to check in. Yeah, we saw it happen. We better get over there. Coaches, coaches, coaches. Competing cast pass backs here now. Awesome. Hello everyone, it's Gloria. I'm on water with the Yale Bulldogs. You guys just came off of a really tight finish there with Stanford. Um, Catherine, do you want to tell me what worked for you guys? I think getting off the line was a good, <laughs> a good uh, change. Awesome. Jack, how are you feeling right now in the final four? Feeling good. Um, it's been a tough day, but uh, hoping to close it out strong here. Um, so that was a good start. Incredible. Good luck, Bulldogs. Thank you. Cheers. And guys, we can see back on uh, the Dartmouth race, it looks like, oh, it's light. It's hard to tell, but. Yeah, I don't think uh, boat 10 can get across boat 8 right now. Not quite yet. And, and, and 10's getting no help from their teammate, who's arguably too far out in front to be, not be helping. Yeah, he's uh, taking a step back. He wants to make sure he doesn't lose those two boats on the vine, uh, as we just saw in the Stanford race. But I think Ten's looking better and better now. Yeah, there I go. think it's going to be a close one here. Yeah, that was but, a big uh, lefty right there. Nice little lefty. Yeah, that is. Uh, that's going to be important. That but, helped. Uh, there's a lot of leverage on those right boats, Dave. So I know that the the farthest boat in the corner, I think, is a Dartmouth boat. But I'm not positive of that. Maybe not. Too far away to tell. This is tricky team racing here, you know. Yeah, you do one play on one side, and yeah. then just yeah. other side comes in. You know, this is where uh, you have to balance more towards probably fleet racing. Absolutely. So it looks like uh, has Harvard got the one there? I think it's going to be down to the last shift. Oh, those are both Harvard boats that coming on starboard. Oh, look at that. So how did they get so unbalanced there, Jack? Look I don't at know. That. I think it was the righty. I mean, yeah. The teammate needs help getting pinned on the left. Yeah. And you, you drop and try to make the move happen. And uh, the other two boats just leverage out, you know. It's, just, it's a hard one. That isn't necessarily a major mistake there. That's the thing. It is hard. It is hard, but it's a... To have two opponents have leverage to one side or the other yep. is not how Ken Legler would have drawn it up on the whiteboard. No, not, not exactly. But, you know, still more to go here. We're not sure how the that left could come in still, you know. But uh, yeah, it is, it's looking light out there. Patience is key here, keeping a cool head. These are these are long upwinds. Thing, uh, boat nine, step back up on the left-hand side of your screen to uh, go uh, cover the opponent out there. Look, the last beat is lasting a lot longer than the earlier today. <laughs> yeah. Bit of adverse current. What do you think, Dave? Just holding them up? Yeah. Must be. It looks like Harvard in the one-two here, I think, uh, playing that right shift like early in the upwind, and uh, now just playing the tax and maintaining the lead. Well, it's tricky right about now because they're sailing at us in the sun. Yeah. So it's a little tricky. If people are wondering why aren't we talking so much, it's a little tricky to see. We see black silhouetted boats out there when they're on starboard tack. Now they're on port tack. Now we can see more. It looks like more red up the front than black. 
Yeah, I think uh, Harvard's going to get the one-two here on the finish line. Yeah. Well, it's those two boats that came out of right field there. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something the sailors need to keep in mind as they continue to race here is uh, that uh, that variety exists, but I don't think it's necessarily one side paying advantage here. I think it's uh, head out of the boat, look for the puffs, and uh, it should be a puff is a shift generally. So. Well, Harvard kept their cool. Dartmouth yep. had uh, had chances to win that one. Yep. Uh, they got a lot, a lot more separation on the last beat than I think that, uh, in hindsight, they would have wanted to give. And uh, it's a tough one for Dartmouth, I think. Um, yeah. So that's with Stanford losing the first race and Harvard winning their first race. That extends Harvard's lead to, to three points now. So they are looking strong. Those of you at home who are wondering how the time works, it's 4.35 here on the East Coast. They can't start a race after 5 o'clock, which is in 25 minutes. And they need to finish five races out of the six for this round robin to count. So they just finished two. So they need to get three more races in for any of these races to count. Otherwise, the results will be as they were at the end of the round of eight, which, of course, was... Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and then Dartmouth. So our fingers are crossed. Time is not our friend right now, Jack. Yeah, it is not. This is uh, when you would love to uh, just have a little, another half hour on the back end. Well, the thing is, Dartmouth is in the next race, so. They got to get down there. They got to wait for them to get down there. You know, Stanford's down there somewhere standing by, but. It's going to be down to the wire here, Dave. Well, we will see. All right, Gloria, what do you got? Hello, everyone. I'm here joined by the Harvard team. They're quite elated after that win against Dartmouth. As you know, Stanford had lost their race, and um, so Harvard seems to be already celebrating. So stay tuned with the scores. Dave and Jack will keep you up to date with that. They still have two races technically in this final four, but um, I believe that they may have just clinched the win. Yeah, is that right, Dave? Are we uh, Maybe we'll get a, uh, a live report, but uh, with Stanford losing that race and uh, Harvard winning. Yeah, because Harvard goes, Harvard was up by two. They just got a win, so now they're up by three. So Stanford would have to win all their races to tie them, but of course Stanford lost their first race. So there's uh, no mathematics. So Harvard has won the championship. I think they've won it. And if the uh, round robin doesn't get completed, you go back to the results at the end of the round of eight and Harvard was still leading it yeah so um, oh, a strong race at the end there to uh, to close it out right, so it's uh, so now the big question mark is Dartmouth Yale um, Yale just won their race so they go to 15 Dartmouth stays on 14 so if it ended now, it would go, go back to, to Gloria. Gloria. Actually, he's out there right now. All right, interview. Gloria, what do you got? So we were just going to interview them, but they're trying to crank out the rotation. So uh, they're rotating on the water. That way they don't have to go back and forth to the docks, and we can finish out this final four. But if I'm not mistaken, as you guys were saying, whether or not they finish the rotation, um, that means that Harvard has still clinched the win. And per my research I was just doing, Harvard has not won a team race national championship since 2003. I'm seeing Byrne on a, on a boat right now, Coach Byrne from Harvard. He's celebrating. He's quite elated, um, especially with two freshmen on the team. Do you guys want to talk about that some more? Yeah, I mean, you know, a Harvard team absolutely crushed it. Yeah, they, I think they turned it on today, especially Dave, didn't they? They uh, they they really crushed it, and uh, you know, young team as well, which is uh, which is absolute achievement. You know, they've got lots of years ahead of them um, to uh, you know keep going and winning these championships. But uh, that is a real, real accomplishment. No, absolutely. Um, 
I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not really involved in college sailing so much anymore, so I don't know the sailors, but I'm very involved in the youth match racing program in the country. And so on the Harvard team, I know Marbella Marlow. She's an outstanding match racer. She's come up uh, through the youth match racing program. She's raced for the U.S. Women's Match Racing Championship, and she was on the team. And then you've got uh, Justin and Mitchell Callahan, who have been uh, joined at the hip, if you will, from the very beginning. Two uh, freshmen as well. Yeah, absolutely. And they've uh, come up through the Opti program. Their dad, Paul, used to run that and uh, did a great job. And then they came through all the high school sailing, and uh, they got involved in uh, international sailing, the 420, and then uh, did the match racing. They're falling in love with that, uh, Justin in particular. And so here they are in college sailing. So uh, the future is bright for the Crimson. And as it should be, I, I know Byrne very well. He's actually a Yaley and has been coaching there for a long, long time. And I just I just uh, wish him all the best. He's done a great job uh, assisting Mike as the coach there. But as we all know, often the assistant coach does more of the actual coaching and the, the head coach does more of the administrative, you know, hard stuff. So uh, I'm very happy for Byrne, who is, by the way, an outstanding team racer himself. Yeah, that's a big accomplishment um, out there. And uh, we're going to see if uh, we get any more racing in today. Um, no updates there, but uh, you can see that uh, that's uh, that you can see all three teams celebrating there, which is awesome. Harvard, Dartmouth, yeah, all lined up. Well, I think they're just rotating boats, actually. But. Oh, rotating boats. <laughs> well, I'm sure a bit of a celebration going on as well there. Um, way, to, way to ruin the moment, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just keeping it real, Jack. Just keeping it real. Hey, it's been fun hanging out with you up here. Oh, yeah. I it's really, been a pleasure. It's been a highlight. This, is, uh, this has been great. And, you know, hopefully we get a couple more races here, bring a little bit more action. Um, hopefully nothing too anticlimactic now that we know the, uh, the win has been sealed. Still battling for third there. So we think uh, Yale, slight edge at the moment if we can finish out the round robin because yeah, they, they got, got that first win. Yep. Dartmouth is racing Stanford next. But keep in mind, according to Danielle, they need to finish five of the six races, 80%. So for any of these races to count, um, you know, I'm not... 100% sure. Sometimes they use partial round robins to break ties, so I don't want to sound like I'm the authority on the tie break here. That's that. I'll leave that to the people of the higher pay grade. But uh, I'm getting the thumbs up from the president who's about to go out. Hey, Mitch, come join us up here. We're bringing uh, Mitch Brindley up into the booth here. Mitch has been the the godfather, the grandfather. Uh, Jack, why don't you give me your headset? Sure thing. Here we go. Mitch has been a dear friend of, of mine for a long time, and um, we've coached together, we've worked hard together. We have. Mitch, I heard a rumor that maybe, maybe it's your time you slide now. Yeah, I am in my, I, I'm done. I uh, get to retire from college sailing administration uh, the um, end of June. How about A new about president that? elect coming on board. Do we know who that is? Yes, Greg Wilkinson. Oh, Greg Wilkinson. He's awesome. He's, he's been doing a long time. And are you, how many years have you been the president of the ICSA? I think it's like 23. Oh, it's a long time. It's yeah. 22, 23. So. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to remain coaching? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. I got kids to get through college. That's Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I like coaching. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, no, that's the fun part. Well, yeah. listen, yeah. congratulations. All right. You've done a great job. This is a great testament to thanks. all your work. And Thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Well, you guys are doing awesome. I yeah. appreciate the work you're doing. It's fun. Sounds good. All right. Back at it. Okay. All right. Well, they're hustling to get the next race off. This will be the big green of Dartmouth against the Cardinal of Stanford. I'm still just not feeling warm and cozy about colors as a mascot. You know, I just think no. I think we just got to do something about that. So I think this is a, a pride race. You know, I don't think it necessarily impacts anything for Stanford, but this is big for, for Dartmouth here. Um, you know, they, they want to get on the podium, that's for sure. So uh, Good way to put it. And also to beat Stanford is quite a feather in your cap. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, 
Absolutely. So yeah. I, I expect to see Dartmouth comes out guns blazing here. There you go. Yeah. Well, they've certainly sailed well the whole regatta. I mean, listen, we had a four-way tie for third place at the end of it. Out of eight yeah. teams, uh, there were six teams that could have been in the top eight. Now, that's fantastic. And even the other teams weren't that far behind, you know. Um, so the, the level is very high here. I'm very impressed with the team racing at the collegiate level. And it's still looking light out there, Dave. But uh, I think boat handling is going to be key here. Boy, I sure have mixed feelings about a drop-dead deadline. <laughs> I really do. You know, I can, I can understand it if teams are flying in. You have to make flights to fly home. and uh, Maybe that's the case here, but I don't think so. I think a lot of teams are probably sticking around for the next few days. I know that the Stanford women are. Now you got daylight till eight o'clock. So, but anyways, not not my job. Yeah, not my job. So here they are. This looks like the final stretch and the start here. Um, everyone kind of vibing for positioning. Um, Start missing the red boat. Stanford in the blue boats this time. So both three leading down. That's probably the pin person from Dartmouth. 18 pushing, probably the pin person for Stanford. Jack, what are you liking, left or right? You know what? I, I'm gonna go with left again, and okay. if I'm not right, I was. Uh, you can you can hold me to that. But uh, well, wow, look at your right start half, line. You're right half the time that last two, race. That's not oh, bad. yeah, 16 and two going back. Clear. Um, Who came out of that better? Yeah, slight, slight advantage. There's, a, there's an art to going back, isn't that, Dave? Yeah. Unfortunately, I uh, listen. My friend Gary Jobson, you know, he's never lost a race in the, in the, in the coach boat, so it's easy to criticize from up here. But uh, it's not how you drew it up on the board to be over really at the start. At least both boats have somebody over. So. All both right, teams. here we go. All right, so going left, we've got uh, Stanford uh, uh, probably losing their pair on the left, but with a strong one. Yeah. Strong one, the, the ace, as you guys call it. Yeah, yeah strong one, so Stanford's looking very, uh, Dartmouth is looking strong head. Uh, Dartmouth in red, My, I'm sorry, very good. Dartmouth is strong. Great, thank you. I was thinking Stanford Red. Card. Right. Uh, yeah. Six getting a little, uh, 16 getting a little leverage out. This is just, uh, I think uh, Stanford's looking for something here. Producer just whispered in my ear, Jack, that a cardinal's a tree, not a color. Ah, that's actually a mistake in there. The, uh, the unofficial mascot of the band is the tree. The cardinal is still the color. Um, Take that, producer. Yeah, got him. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's it's almost looking like a one, two, three here at for Dartmouth, for oh the Stanford boy. team. But, uh, that's a strong first up win for That's Dartmouth. That's a strong first up win to be one, two, three. And the two is putting the nail in the coffin down at 17 there. But you know what? The boats are still close. And we've seen it's, it's you know, shifty and puffy out there, though the breeze definitely looks more filled in. Boy, leg one's even shorter, isn't it? Look how short leg one is. Yeah, boat one just causing chaos. As they should. The wrecking ball. Yeah. You know, people always say, well, you know, Stanford knows they weren't going to win, so they just, they aren't trying. That's not right. Competitive athletes try every race. They try their hardest. Every, we're hardwired to try our hardest. And so there's no giving up. There's no not trying hard. It's just sometimes one team gets it better than the other. 
Yeah. It's a, a nice gap there for Dartmouth after the one two. Yeah. I call that a one two breakaway. Yeah. All right. Well, down the leg, we've got uh, Yale lining up against Harvard. Um, we're staying with the uh, Dartmouth Stanford race right now. Oh, here we got we the shot at the start. There it is. Yeah. So I think if uh, Gale's looking to win this one as well, and that uh, I think will consolidate him, them, as uh, in a good place for getting third here. But the good news is this will be race four, but the bad news is it's 10 of five. <laughs> so I don't think any way they get the fifth here. Okay. So here we go. Let's watch the race, though. Yale, Harvard. That's a storied, a storied um, rivalry from back in the 1800s when they oh, 12 spinning played the first football game. Quite a lot of uh, you know action here. Boats over, others spinning um, as they get going here. This is what you would call a victory lap for Harvard if they can uh, they can win this one. Well, I can tell you the Bulldogs would love to win this one. Yeah. The Bulldogs are in the, uh, the Harvard's in the darker colors, the black, if you will. And the Bulldogs are in, I think it might be pink. Whoa. Whoa, playing through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a team race and a fleet race broke out. <laughs> you see how the, the two fleets just nicely go their separate ways. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, well, it looks like uh, Harvard's jumped out to the one. But Yale's in play two, we've talked about all day. There's the boat number seven dropping down on 11 to try and convert play two. Look at number eight going through very quickly and well done. Yep. Yale looking for the play two for sure here. Absolutely. And uh, it makes it easy when there's a deep 12. Oh, big dial down from 10. Ooh. He's spinning. He's spinning. Ay, 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 ay. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Getting dizzy on the first upwind. Looks like there's a, uh, a series of whistles going on here, folks. Well, listen, we're in the booth. We're getting uh, messages. There's a possibility that they're going to call the racing off and maybe send Yale and Dartmouth into a sail off for a third place. That's a rumor. But I figured, well, if that happens, you heard it here first. Yeah. Let's go to Gloria here. Maybe she can give us a little explanation. Yeah, so it looks like the umpires are whistling their putting a pause in this Harvard-Yale race right now. So we can only assume that they're calling it a day in terms of the final four races, and we should be looking forward to a Yale-Dartmouth race sail off for third place. Okay. All right. That All right. is, uh, well, Dave, you know, we didn't quite get the final four in, but we are going to get a battle for third. Which is... Hey, Chris. Was the battle. It's the battle, yeah. That was the what battle. We saw. Listen, every Do you want us to go to the dock? Would rather yeah. settle on the water. Yeah. Every I agree. sailor, with any pride at all, would rather just settle it on the water. I think this works out quite nicely in the end, Dave, because, you know, Harvard came in with the lead. They won the first race. So even if we had finished the round robin, they would have mathematically won. Right. So they won. So they Fair won. Fair and square. Fair and square. And now we get to decide third and fourth. Fair and square. Fair and square. On the water. And, uh, you know, people might say, well, Yale was winning that first race, but Dartmouth was winning that second race. So 
fair and square. So that's exciting. We're going to bring you guys a petite final. Um, great that it's a head-to-head, -head and they uh, they uh, you know called it in time to get this done. Um, and uh, that's going to be a good one, Dave. Well, so what do we got for conditions, Jack? It's sort of the same. Yeah, I think much of the same here. I mean, it's uh, it's spotty out there. It's uh, head out of boat looking for the pressure. Um, I think that's going to be big. And uh, it's it's all about the balancing act of uh, going from, you know, team race mode into fleet race mode. Yeah. Yeah. So they got five minutes to get the start off. They got plenty of time and... Uh, this is this is going to be good. This is going to be lay it all out on the court kind of conditions. So Jack, when's the next sailboat race you're going to be in? Oh, I don't know, Dave. Um, I, I, I'm enjoying the uh, the keelboat variant of the team racing out yep. there. And uh, it's great fun. You get, you know, four people, four friends on the boat, and uh, you don't have to hike. You don't have to hike, <laughs> and it's great teamwork. Um, and you don't have to hike. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about you know sailing in the U.S. is there is a great post-college circuit. I mean, there's dinghies, uh, which you can do. I think a little plug to the Hinman Trophy, which happens every year, which is the dinghy. Um, team race nationals and uh, we got I think it's in San Diego next year yeah. and it's gonna be I think it's even gonna be 36 teams invited which is phenomenal and there's always that's a sort of a 20 somethings event pretty much right yeah exactly so post-college uh, very fun Perfect. and Perfect. Uh, I know uh, you know there's other regattas and keel boats all along the Long Island Sound which is awesome you know all around the country all around the country as well we were down in Texas this spring sailing and New Orleans earlier this year San Francisco has it going, San Diego, Newport Beach. Yeah. Of course, New York. And some great sailing hubs. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Dave? What's up next? Well, uh, I still love sailboat racing. I'm not ready to stop, so I always try to put a few team races and match races on the schedule. I enjoy that kind of short course stuff. You know, I don't really want to own a boat. <laughs> I don't really want to sail upwind for... 45 minutes looking for the winter mark two miles away. So I love the team racing. I love the match racing. And I always try to sail with some 20 somethings. I always try and sail with some women sailors when I can. You know, I love uh, you know, sharing the wealth. Absolutely. Match racing, team racing is great for that because you can do that. Yeah. And if uh, for all the people listening, if, if you've never been to a Dave Perry <laughs> match racing clinic, it is. Uh, what do you call them? Clinagatas. Yeah. Where it's uh, two days of match race coaching yeah. from the best, right, yeah. followed by usually three days of racing. Yeah. So you can go from zero to hero in uh, you know, just a long weekend. Uh, I've sat through a uh, dozen, maybe, of those. Uh, and Heard all the uh, jokes. Yeah, all the same jokes. All the same jokes. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great one. would recommend. But uh, looks like the teams are getting uh, getting ready down there. Uh, well, it was fun while I get warmed up. You mentioned that I'm doing a webinar right now with about 20 coaches who are, you know, looking to do more match racing coach clinics and team racing clinics and whatnot. So trying to pass that along and uh, keep the clinics going because it's a sport where if you train well, you get better quickly. It's hard to get better on your own. Yeah, I'm a big believer in clinics. Still looking light out there, Dave. I think it's yeah. uh, it's it's enough, but it's uh, not quite ideal. I would say um, this is going to be uh, a a nerve-wracking last one to decide who is going to be at the last place on the podium here. Well, what a day, though. What a day. What a day. What a yeah. long day. What well, a long day. But that's sailing. I mean, do you know? I've heard a statistic that a football player. The game, the game, there's 60 minutes in the game, right? But the game takes like three hours. But a player, each player only plays six or seven minutes. They're actually active six or seven minutes of the time. Yeah. Wow. Versus, what is this? What have they been putting in the last days? Six, seven hour days? You know? It's incredible. Yeah. And, and maybe some crew subs here and there, maybe some skipper, but not many, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely the, 
It's the greatest sport. It's the most challenging sport. It's uh, it's a sport for a lifetime. And uh, I think we're in sequence here. I Fantastic. see them. I think them. I see them uh, buying for positions there. Well, if they're if they're uh, it looks like they we we can't use our rotation sheet, Jack, to tell who's in what team. Okay, I think. Yeah, so Dartmouth in red, one, two, three. Yale in pink, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Um, two, two colors, really easy to tell apart. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and totally, totally unrelated to the school colors. That's okay. <laughs> so right. make sure to follow those numbers. Dartmouth, one, two, three. And uh, Yale, seven, eight, nine. Under a minute to go here. All right, so we got the Yale team number eight. Trying to win the pin. Right, two Dartmouth people in the middle here. Yale's only number two down there. And it looks like Yale's up at the boat also. There's another boat out to winner to seven here. Then here comes that college dip we talked about. Yeah, there's one more winner. Ooh, I hope eight wasn't over early. Nice start from boat one there. Dartmouth at the boat. And I, I'm seeing a little maybe right shift here at the beginning. You know, boat number eight from Yale had a half a length lead off the line there at the pin. And they weren't over really good for them. That's a good line sight. It looks like Yale won the boat. It looks like Yale's winning this pair coming right. And not sure about the pair going left. Gloria, you're out there. What do you see off the starting line? Great. Just heard that uh, Gloria is standing by for the Harvard celebration, so we'll get to her later. So uh, I stuck with me and Dave. There you go. From the booth, looking out into the sunshine. Yeah. But uh, this is the sail off a third, and it's, it's still pretty early to tell who's in what position, but... I remember that the, uh, each team had one good starter at each end, so... Looks like most of the boats on the left now flopped over the port tack, and uh, I think this is going to be a drag race for this upwind, you know? Well, drag race at one and a half miles an hour. Yeah, that's the best kind of drag race. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're losing your mind. I mean, the boats in the middle are slatting. The, the, there's a boat in the middle of the race course that is just has no wind. Yeah, this is looking tricky here, Dave. I think no we wind. need a good puff to roll down to get them up to this mark, especially with uh, the uh, the bit of adverse current holding them back. This could be quite the long upwind. And this is the short one. Oh, here, here we go. Let's cut to uh, maybe Gloria's there to... Uh, Anyway, that's the Harvard sneak, team. Sneak peek. Sneak peek. There we go. There are some happy campers. All right, so we're going back and forth between the action on the water. Remember, Dartmouth is in the red boats, one, two, three. Yale's in the pink boat, seven, eight, nine. So you can see going right, Dartmouth is winning that pair, the two, nine pair. Ooh, As we all know, Dartmouth if you out win, field you here, swim. Jack, number three. Yeah, I see them too. Left hand side. <laughs> That's your left, the parking left corner. Oh, look at that. Celebratory swim. Woo! Look at that. That's a good feeling. Just take your wallets and cell phones out of your pocket. Make sure you get the coaches. Don't forget the coaches. Boom. Just random people just jumping in. I'll hold the camera. You got to go for a swim. No, that's their swim. There's his life jacket. Hey, everybody, give us the number one. Give me this. Give me this, everybody. Give up the one, baby. Come on, now. HSKA, baby. Yeah. Hey, Harvard, yeah. how you feeling right now? 
Lacey Harvey win something every now and then. I guess you have to pass a swimming test to still cause you know, right? Yeah, for sure. Right. They all have their life jackets on. So. Well, congrats to Harvard. They are uh, expertly handled today. Yeah, and they kept their poise, and you know, Stanford went out of the blocks. They ran the ran the table in the first round robin, 15 sure and 0. It would have been easy to sort of say, oh well, but they didn't. Made some hey guys, adjustments. I've got an interview with Harvard here. A lot of golf in these regattas. A lot of, yeah. Play a lot of holes. Meanwhile, Dartmouth is off to a 1 2 out there. After all that. Yale chasing in a 3 4. Team counting heads, make sure. All right, we're going to get out of Glory on the dock. She's with the Harvard team. Welcome to the West Coast Sailing Post Game Show. In the sport of sailing. Some just good question. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell me how electric this feels right now? Uh, I'm Justin. Uh, it's an unreal feeling, but I mean, our motto, you know, we were two races behind today, and you know, our motto all day has been next race, next race, next race, and so uh, that's why I told you next race. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it wouldn't be possible without you know everyone here, our two coaches. Look at these lovely people back here. We wouldn't be able to do it without this team, and we're so happy to be a part of it. So thank you guys so much. Amazing. You guys haven't won a team race championship since 2003. So, um, yeah, there you go. I was born in 2003, so uh, that's got to feel good. There you go. I was born for this. Amazing. And we're here to actually directly reward you guys your first place prize for the oh, Walter C. Wood Trophy. Uh, well, congratulations, Harvard. Well deserved, Would you like to say anything? Yeah. That's our fearless leader. I love this team so much. <laughs> They're awesome. We have some great sailors, everyone on the team. I mean, Justin already said it, but Lachlan, Mitchell, Marbella, Kennedy, Chris, everyone that sailed, Tyler. Amazing regatta, and we've, we've had so many practice sessions. We were just talking about how in Miami we've practiced that, that 2 3 6 wall so many times. So many times. I don't want to say too much, but I just I love this team, and it's, it's so well deserved. Congratulations, Harvard. I'm going to let you continue your cel celebrations, but you heard it here, folks. Harvard, congrats. Thank you. Get anybody in for a photo with the trophy. All right, we're enjoying the celebration down the dock. Look at that win ratio there. 20 and 2, Dave. That's a great score. 90% or more. It's a good run. Yeah. Um, just uh, to give you a quick update, looking through the binos. Looking like a... Uh, ooh, a 1 for 5 for Dartmouth. And the bottom mark in the battle for third. You know, just going back to the Harvard scoreline, I think they were 13-2 and two after the first round, Robin. 
Which means they ran the table in the final eight and wow. the final round robin. That's the way to do it. That's, that's making a statement. Well, Dartmouth rounded Mark two in the one two. And they sailed out into the sun, so we weren't quite sure what happened. They both have reddish, pinkish sails. But uh, Jack is reporting that maybe Yale broke up the one two. And now we got ourselves a, a battle up the final beat here. Uh, we're seeing the celebration on the dock, but we're watching the racing on the water, and as soon as we can see anything conclusive, we'll let you know. Yale and Dartmouth are out there racing for the bronze medal, if you will, third place in the regatta. Looks like we got the aerial view of the fleet. Um, we're gonna get you uh, some uh, closer up imagery in a second. Um, I think this is gonna come down to the, to the second half, the last upwind. Well, of course, when they're on starboard tack, they're sailing right at us. So we just have no idea which boat is which. So when they tack on a port, we can start to see something. I think uh, I'm seeing a Dartmouth boat strung on the right there in the one. And uh, the rest of it, hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> that boat three in the middle looks pretty fast there. See, uh, okay. The image becomes clearer, I think. Uh, Yale has got the one, and everyone else is pretty much equal at this moment. Oh, big dial down there. This is it. This is the finish line here. The Yale's in the 789 boats. One, one, 145, I think, is what they're trying to pay here. Seven, nine. So it's a battle. Uh, Yale's got the one. And they, they look strong on the right there. And they look like they're going to get the one, two, or the one, three. Let's just see how it plays out here. So, yeah, so Yale got the, I'm guessing they got the one, two. I agree. Uh, what a race. Uh, sorry we couldn't tell you more about the race, but it was pretty far away downwind. Uh, we're watching the, the Crimson celebration, but uh, Dartmouth led around Mark II in a 1-2. But down the run, the Yale uh, first two boats did a job to break up the 1-2. And then the, up the last beat, it's just it's, it's shifty and puffy out here, and there's some separation. And at any rate, Yale came out on top of that one. So uh, kudos to all the teams here. Harvard winning the 2023 ICSA Team Racing Championship. Uh, Stanford in second, Yale in third, uh, Dartmouth in fourth. I'm sure at some point we'll put all the finishing uh, positions up there. But, uh, Jack, what are your thoughts on uh, the team racing you saw today? You've done a lot of it. Is it a good level, a great level? What do you think? Yeah, it was a fantastic weekend. I mean, how many races did they end up getting through? Maybe uh, 155 or something? That is incredible. Two, three, of yeah. the span of yeah. about three, uh, yeah. three days. Yeah. And... Uh, I mean, we had you know, pristine conditions all day. I've certainly worked on my tan while sitting in this box here. Um, my retinas may not be the same, but uh, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can't ask for everything. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the standard, I think each year just gets slightly better. Yeah. You know, uh, the young guys bring something to the game and it changes it. So I think, you know, a couple really interesting things that happened today. Oh, look, here's the final highlights. Uh, Harvard at the top. Um, congrats to Harvard. Stanford following up, runner-up, second place, and Yale clinching the last place on the podium. Look, a, a four-way tie for third place, though. That should be underscored. 
Yeah. Broken Yale, Dartmouth, Roger Williams, and Brown, but all teams earn the same number of points. So. Absolutely. And, and St. Mary's and Coast Guard, not far behind. Yeah, St. Mary's battled yesterday yeah. to get it into their yeah. top eight, yeah. and they managed to snatch another place off Coast yeah. Guard. So uh, congrats to all those who made it to uh, the second and third round. Um, just uh, what a great weekend of, uh, of the sailing. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think some would argue team racing is the most fun thing you can do. Yeah. I know college sailing values it. They spend most of the spring doing it. There's a, a new women's team race championship this year for the first time, which is fantastic. First or second time? Second time now, Dave. Which yep. is fantastic. And uh, um, so I think team racing is alive and well. I encourage all our listeners, if you haven't tried it, give it a try. Uh, there's a lot of yacht clubs now doing it with their adults. It's a great way to go out and spend time on the water with uh, you don't need to be great. You have a wide range of ability. Yeah, you just need a fleet of usually keelboats for the adults, but you could have 420s or maybe Melges 15s yep. or some of these other boats coming along. And uh, what a great sport. And uh, today was uh, team racing on well showcased. Yeah, and it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, come date with you today, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I think we've had a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's, it's a part of the sport that didn't really get to experience before but it's it's been awesome i have to say like to those out there who want to learn more about team racing this is the best way to do it see you know basically the pros do it um on live so uh thank you to everyone involved for organizing this all the uh, media team all the support of king's point icsa you know i'm, I'm sure i'm missing people but this has been a uh, phenomenal well one thing to point out people always say Gosh, I wish I could watch more sailing on television because you can watch golf, you can watch tennis. But if you go to YouTube, just go to YouTube and type in College National Team Racing Championship or National Team Racing Championship. Or if you remember, Hinman Team Racing Championship. On YouTube, there is so much video yeah. of, of, of team racing and all kinds of sailboat racing there. But that would be a great place to go if you wanted to watch more of it. Excellent. And, uh, you know, Dave... I have to say, like, on to the co-ed sailing tomorrow. Mm. Some people aren't going to even have a break. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think the coverage is going to keep running. And uh, we've got the semifinals coming up. So we only had 16 teams here. We're going to have another full 36 teams here tomorrow wow. battling to uh, make their place into the final of the co-eds. Oh, it's fantastic how many teams are included in the national championship now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible. Are um, you sticking around doing some commentary? Or? No more. This is me. All you have done. to go back to work. Got to go back to work. Real yeah, world awaits. Me too. Yeah. Um, but uh, for everyone back home, it's been an absolute treat. Um, I think uh, we're going to have a bit more coverage of the awards. But uh, for now, um, I think that is uh, all from us. Good. And I think we're going to go to Gloria to uh, put a bow on it. So, Gloria, what do you got? Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to Jack and Dave and Pearson, all that were great co-commentators and, and jumped in with me. And you still got me for another four days, folks. So I just wanted to say thank you for coming to the West Coast Sailing Post Show. Congratulations to Harvard, and we'll be back shortly for the awards ceremony.
Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back to Kings Point. Congratulations to the four finalists and to Harvard, of course. No clapping, no nothing. Wow, that's a tough one. I want to take a minute just to thank our principal race officer, Kyle Assad, ICSA rep, Danielle Richards. She's somewhere behind me. And the entire umpire team that uh, has been here throughout the event. And uh, last but not least, but go ahead. I shut that off. I shut that off. And last but not least, the, my entire staff who really made this event hopefully as special for you guys as it was for us. And I uh, hope you guys really enjoyed all the hard work that went into uh, all the days you were here. So thank you. So I'd like to take a, introduce to my right, Vice Admiral Noonan. Admiral. Thanks, Rich. It was uh, a great honor to host all of you here at Kings Point uh, this week. Uh, the, I would just say the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy never looked better than having all of you sailing out here, the best of the best uh, collegiate sailors. So congratulations to all of you. And I want to say thank you to Rich Kane. He has been uh, tirelessly working on putting this together over the past year with the whole team. So thank you. Thank you for being great guests. And uh, hopefully we can host it again. Right, Rich? <laughs> And I want to pass this over to Gloria. And I have to tell you, even though you, you were the stars of the show, behind the scenes, Gloria was the star of the show with her sidekicks uh, telling the story of racing, which made it really great for those of us who are not experts in what you were doing. She really made it come to life. So thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much, Admiral. Oh, you guys get giving me too much credit, please, please. There's a huge team behind the scenes that you guys don't even see that uh, we owe a huge thank you to. Uh, but for starters, let's thank our sponsors, the lovely Zim Sailing, West Coast Sailing, Dermatone, that kept me uh, from getting sunburnt today, you know? Um, Quantum, Marlowe, and of course, the team behind the scenes that you guys don't see, but I've been working with every single day, uh, Chris Love Productions and the entire media team. Um, and with that, yeah, please, 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 like a huge round of applause because they make me look good, I swear on it. So, um, and now uh, let's go ahead and move forward um, with the top three teams. Um, in third place, and as I call your name, feel free to walk forward and everybody rejoice. In third place with a 14-8 record, the Yale Bulldogs, Catherine Egan, Catherine Webb, Teddy Nicolosi, Anisha Arcott, Stefan Baker, Meredith Ryan, Nathan C., Zemena Escobar, Benjamin Markert, Carmen Cowles, Emma Cowles, and Helena Ware. Well done, Yale Bulldogs. Put it together for the Yale Bulldogs. Lovely. Um, in second place, with an 18-4 record, the Stanford Cardinal put it together. We have Hannah Freeman, Patricia Gurley, Michelle Larkamp, Vanessa Larkamp, Ellie Harned, Abigail Tyndall, Chapman Peterson, Gwendolyn Donahue, Grace Austin, Jack Baldwin, Justin Lim, and so.
Congratulations, Stanford Cardinal. And must I just quickly say, definitely go. All right, sorry, I had to use my big, big girl voice there. So, um, and lastly, without a doubt, the biggest congratulations to first place team of the Walter Cromwell Wood Bowl 22 record, Harvard Crimson. We have Lachlan McGranahan, Christopher. Justin, Justin Callahan, Kennedy Lehley, Mitchell Callahan, Marbella Marlowe, Tyler Masuyama, Eric Hansen. Hello, hello, hello. That's a that's a good boy. Congratulations, Stanford Cardinal or St Harvard sailing Harvard Crimson. Congratulations on first place. Well done, and thank you for joining us. And that concludes the award ceremony. Congratulations, Harvard.